2022 Intelligent Money British GT Championship races towards its halfway point as the teams and drivers arrive at Donington Park for the first of two visits to the East Midlands circuit this year. For the second time in as many weeks, a three-hour race beckons, and if it's anything like our most recent round, the Silverstone 500, we're in for a real treat. British GT's Blue Ribbon event lived up to all the hype as Adam Ballon led an all-Lamborghini front row to the start of the three-hour race. It was Stella Motorsports Audi which led from pole in GT4, but it wasn't long before the first major drama unfolded. Richard Neary tangled with James Cottingham as they fought for third place, Ian Loggy was collected as well, and all three of the Mercedes AMGs suffered damage. Another Mercedes was soon pointing the wrong way, Chris Froggart looping his car at the loop, and it wasn't just the Mercedes hitting early trouble, Mia Fluitz McLaren also suffering early damage and dropping down the order. As Loggy brought his Ram racing car back to the pits for repairs, it was then the turn of the GT4 leader to have a spin, with Richard Williams going around at Village. Multiple places were lost, but thankfully no damage done. Back in GT3, Ballon was under fire from Alex Maliakin and the pair touched as the red line racing driver snatched the lead, a robust pass for which Maliakin was later penalised. One of the best battles of the opening hour was between Tom Rawlings and Jordan Collard, with the latter moving his Toyota into third place with a lovely move at the loop. The battle continued to rage on until Collard suffered a right rear puncture, from which he was lucky to escape without spinning. Into the middle part of the race, and Enduro Motorsport were making good progress, here passing the Garage 59 McLaren, which was also a threat for the win all day. Sadly, though, the Balfe Motorsport Audi, which had been one of the stars of the show at Alton Park, slowed with an apparent puncture, taking it out of contention. The variety on show in GT4 this year is immense, and it was a BMW, Aston Martin, Ford Mustang scrap for third place, which attracted much of the attention as the race approached half distance. Matt Cowley pulling off some impressive moves to get to the front of that group. Enduro Motorsport clashed with the Rocket RJN McLaren at farm, with both cars looking to avoid damage. Enduro would later lose more time in the pits when the fire extinguisher went off. At the front, though, Adam Ballon and Sandy Mitchell claimed the narrowest of victories over Garage 59, while Newbridge Motorsport came out on top in a very competitive GT4 class. So, the RAC trophy belongs to Barbell Motorsport this season. Darren Turner and Matt Topham, meanwhile, celebrated another GT4 win and left Silverstone second in the points. Last time we raced at Donington, it was Enduro Motorsport who claimed their first ever British GT race win, marking a significant season-long improvement for both Morgan Tilbrook and Marcus Clutton. It was a real story last year where, you know, unfortunately at the first round we didn't even make the first lap to come into the last round and, you know, having a real good performance um, as a team, you know, both drivers did well, the team performed well, it was faultless and, um, yeah, we got, we got a mega win and it was quite magical for us as a team, but for me to run the team as well, I never thought I'd be running a British GT team and winning overall. It's, it's great for me, I'm, I'm, I'm only young in, in team manager world, but, you know, we did it. I've got great guys behind me, supporting me and doing that, um, so, you know, I couldn't have done it without any of them, but, yeah, mega, mega, mega year last year, learning, doing our homework, and, and coming back this year to try and improve on that. Also victorious at the Donington Decider last year were Academy Motorsport. Matt Cowley is looking to repeat that this year, now alongside Canadian Marco Signoretti. Uh, it's great. Competition's really good, and uh, going to tracks like this, I learn a ton. So, I'm looking forward to every time I hit the track. And uh, Mustang's obviously a bit bigger than a Nissan Micra, but I do have a fair amount of seat time in, in the GT4 itself. So, pretty comfortable with the cars. It's more or less just learning uh, the Pirelli, which is new for me, and uh, the circuits we go to. Yeah, it's not been the best season so far. We've had a bit of bad luck and just struggled a bit in the opening rounds, but. Um, usually do pretty well here so looking to turn it around and it's looking good so far it's just a good track for us it works with the bop that we get and uh with the mustang especially means we can take a lot of curb around here stuff like that that helps us out around here and just means that we usually have a good running
So it is time nearly for the fourth round of the Intelligent Money British GT Championship to get underway here at Donington Park for the second race in a row. It's a three hour encounter that awaits the teams and drivers. Always enjoy these races. They're a little bit longer, but they are certainly never dull. And with the strategic element thrown in there with these three mandatory pit stop and driver changes, it's always the kind of race that keeps us guessing to the very end. It's quite a lovely day here at Donington Park, actually. The sun is shining, the ambient temperatures creeping into the high teens, the track temperature quite a bit warmer, and the fans here are very much looking forward to three hours of non-stop action around the Donington Park circuit. Many of them are heading down onto the grid now to get a closer look uh, at the cars. Uh, Andy McEwen up here in the commentary box, down amongst all of the action will be Bryn Lucas, our roving reporter, and I'm secretly quite jealous of him because uh, in amongst these GT cars is a fantastic place to be, and I think that Bryn has already found a very special guest here at Donington to have a chat with Bryn. Good afternoon. Look, don't worry, Andy, don't be jealous of me. There's many other people that are far, far better placed than me. But I am here right now in the pits with Julian Penniston Hill from Intelligent Money, the CEO of Intelligent Money, our kind of our title sponsor. And it's great to see you here and a great grid as well. You've been here before, Donington last year for the Don uh, Donington Decider. Yeah, the Decider, it was a fantastic day, absolutely fantastic. But coming here for this one here, July last year threw up quite a lot of excitement out there. Are you hoping for a clean race or a lot of excitement? I'm hoping to see more cars finish than last time. Yeah, last July was a bit... It was exciting. Yeah, very exciting. But 30 grid line start today, fantastic. Well, as you say, a huge grid, 30 car grid, 17 on GT3, 13 GT4, including the one behind you, that uh, Team Brick car, which I know you've got your eyes on. I do. I'm uh, very uh, pleased to see Team Brick here, very... Uh, much behind what they're doing, um, bringing uh, dis people with disabilities into racing. Uh, it's, it's, it's fantastic. It's, uh, it's really great to see. And for you, the, the involvement of Intelligent Money, you've uh, got another few years left on this deal, haven't you? We do. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're here. Um, well, it seems like we've always been here, to be quite honest. Uh, it's third year now, so uh, it, it's great, but there's a lot more to come. Great stuff. That's what we want to hear. Julian, thank you so much. Uh, you. Andy, there you go. There's Julian. Back up to you. Yeah, thanks very much, Bryn. Uh, Bryn Lucas going to be uh, digging out all of the uh, the breaking news up and down the pit lane. Uh, now, as I said, uh, I'm up here in the uh, commentary box and I'll be joined when the race gets underway uh, by Joe Osborne, who is a, a factory McLaren driver. He was on the podium, actually, at the Silverstone 500 in the GT3 class just a couple of weeks ago. So he knows his stuff. He knows what it takes to be a GT driver. And Joe, uh, you found yourself back in your natural habitat now down in the uh, pit lane. And uh, you can maybe talk us through exactly what's going through the driver's heads as we uh, head into the final preparations for the race. Yeah, thank you, Andy, for the kind words. I feel like a, an animal here in my uh, in my nice habitat. And we see the pole sitting enduro McLaren here. We're in the final throws of getting the car ready. Some new Pirelli tyres going on. They're a bit 100 degrees out of the oven, so they'll already be hot. And if you come in here with me, you'll get a see inside the cockpit of the McLaren. Really claustrophobic. We have a safety net here, the radio system, so you can talk to the driver, to the team, and then all in here, the cockpit. Morgan, one word, what are you saying? <laughs> one word, I want to deliver a result for the team. They've given us a great car all season and just need to try and convert this pole position to a win. That'd be a great, a great uh, day, obviously. Awesome, more than one word, but I'll let them off. But you can really see inside these cockpits how claustrophobic these cars can be. You'll see the car now will drop onto the floor from its air jacks. The car control in front with the lollipop will raise that when it's clear. The pit lane is a busy place here at Donington Park. It's a full grid, so in the race, it's going to be very interesting to see if there's a safety car, for example, how busy it gets. Pull away nice and smooth on the wheel spin and lose any of that new tyre grip. And then he has to stay on the pit limiter all the way to that green light where he will release the car and make his way to the grid. Exciting times. <laughs> really is and uh, I, uh, the reason I say I'm jealous in a way not to be down there is that when you're in and around the pit lane uh, at the start or at any point really during a race like this it, it is just an incredible atmosphere it's this really strange mix of nerves anticipation excitement the drivers going through all of the emotions as they get ready to go racing over what I said is a three hour race but uh, uh, don't be put off by the length of the race because these three hour races as we saw at Silverstone last time out um, they're always exciting as I said you've got this strategic element 180 minutes then three mandatory driver changes which is one more pit stop really than the 
teams would like to make. They'd ideally pit at the end of the first hour and at the end of the second hour, but instead they have to throw an extra pit stop in there somewhere. Now, there are no pit windows. You can pit whenever you like within the three hours. However, neither of your drivers can do more than 100 minutes of the 180 combined. So you have to factor that in. You want to maximize your quicker driver, get them out there for as much of that 100 minute stint as they can. Uh, the minimum pit stop times for GT3 and GT4 vary slightly. 110 seconds for GT3. That is between pit entry line and pit exit line, including the stop as well. 140 seconds for GT4 and the GT4 class, the Silver Cup cars have an extra 14 seconds to serve at the stops as well. And there are, for the first time this season, success penalties to be served in the race. And those will be served at the third and final pit stop. So the three teams that were classified uh, as the top three point scoring finishers at Silverstone last out within both GT3 and GT4 have extra time to serve. So in GT3, it's the Barwell Motorsport car of Adam Ballon and Sandy Mitchell. They won last time at their third and final pit stop. They spend 20 seconds longer in the pits than anybody else. The red line racing in Lamborghini of Alex Maliakin and James Dorlin have a 15 second success penalty and Assetto Motorsport getting themselves a podium finish last time at Silverstone and their reward 10 seconds extra in the stops. It's the same story then uh, for those top three in GT4. Now last summer when we raced here at Donington Park it was Team Abba racing on the top step of the podium. Bryn, uh, what do you reckon? Can they do it again today? Yeah, Andy, behind me, Rich has just pulled into position. Sam Neer is here as well. Now, this was a happy hunting ground for you two last year. What can you do from this position on the grid? Yeah, we're definitely moving forward. Uh, you know, we had, a, we think, an average quality, uh, P5. So, you know, it's, it's in the mix. Uh, but on the inside, turn one, we've got nothing to lose in the championship. You know, we're 12th in the championship, so uh, we need to make a few points. So we won't finish fifth. We'll probably finish a lot higher. Starting on the right-hand side, the inside, does mean you've got to drift over to the left-hand side. What's the message to, to Richard for the start of this race? Uh, try, and, try and keep out of trouble. No damage is obviously the key. We know Redgate tightens on at the midpoint, so it always causes a collision. Uh, and there's a few feisty boys up at the front, so hope to stay out of trouble, but you know, if there's a gap, go for it. Yeah, got to be in it to win it. Look, good luck. Exactly. Thank you very much. I like that. A few feisty boys at the front of the grid, including your father, Richard, who I think I've referred to as feisty on more than one occasion. But do you know what? It paid off for him here last year, Richard Neary, when he went from the very back of the GT3 grid and led the race halfway around the first lap. Granted, he was helped a little bit by an unfortunate shunt at turn one. But Richard, we know, uh, is never backwards in coming forwards uh, in the opening stints of the race. That car will start... Uh, from fifth place on the grid. Pole position is taken by the car that Joe was taking a closer look at in the pit lane, the Enduro Motorsport car. They were our other Donington Park winners in 2021 because, as we have this year, there were two visits to Donington last season. The first one in the summer, it was Team Abba on top, and then the Donington decider, the last round of the championship, was won uh, by Enduro Motorsport. They weren't contending for the championship that day, uh, but they were able to get themselves onto the top step of the podium, and they were fastest in both of the GT3 qualifying sessions yesterday. So they've got good pace Morgan Tilbrook will start from uh, pole position in GT4 it's Stella Motorsport on pole position Richard Williams will start from pole Senan Fielding his co-driver they've had a great start to the season haven't they Bren? Hi guys so now at the uh, slight back of the grid but nothing offensive <laughs> to you Senan and your teammate Richard pole position in the GT4 class beautiful car beautiful driver what's the expectations for the race today? Obviously, it's a three-hour race. Anything can happen. We're obviously in the prime position here, but um, I think we can only focus on our job. Um, there's so many other things going on, especially when the GT3 start coming back through and lapping us. Um, we've just got to get our heads down, try and keep a clean race, and our aim for today is just get some points for the championship. We're in a very good position now, so as long as we keep with the consistency, that's our number one goal. I'm sold on it, so I believe in you. What's the strongest point of the Audi and then what's its weakest compared to the other GT4 competitors? So, so far, I think we've seen in the last sector is probably one of our weakest points, but this car in a race run is unbelievable. It just is so consistent and especially for me and Richard driving, the team have done such a good job getting it in the window where we can just do the like an hour stint and it's just nice for the driver. And you know what you've got underneath you, so we can kind of push on or just need to be consistent and keep edging our way. Perfect. Thank you, mate. You Cheers, didn't tell mate. me your weakness, but that's fine. From one beautiful man to another, Bryn, who have you got, mate? Ian, you're sitting in quite a good position here, aren't you, on the left-hand side, but you've got your work cut out ahead of you, and you're equal as well, leading in the championship, but a lot of dust has now settled after what's been going on. How do you keep your, your eyes on the prize and yourself focused? Yeah, uh, as you say, we're sitting in a good position here. We're, we're on the second row. Uh, it's always a little bit more difficult than uh, the outside, but uh, we've just got to be focused, make sure that we get no damage, 
and uh, get the first, second lap out of the way. Things will start to thin out and then really press on with the race. It's a three hour race, so um, I think our car's uh, in the window this weekend. We're in good shape, so as long as we, uh, we stay out of trouble, we'll be in the mix, I'm sure. And you've got to your right-hand side, Alan Ballon, behind you, you've got Balfe, and over to your shoulder on the right-hand side as well, you've got Richard Neary. So there's a lot of people around you that are going to be vying for this first corner. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure that's going to be the, the case. And uh, let's just hope everyone's uh, sensible. Certainly, the, um, the Adam and the right uh, and uh, two guys in front are the, uh, very sensible, and uh, they'll do the right thing, I'm sure. So I, I'll do the same. Well, best of luck. Now, there you go. That's Ian Loggy. Now, Joe's uh, further up the grid there. Joe, who are you with? Five seconds. No, this car was mighty quick. In so, Rob Bell, we had a theme of beautiful men, and now we've got yourself. Excited about the race. Obviously, a one-off appearance for you in British GT. It's a championship you know well. If we were going for expectations, what are they for you? Well, coming into the race, obviously, you've got high expectations, and it's brilliant to be here. You know, it's a great championship. I love Donington and obviously you've got a fantastic car. Um, unfortunately, we haven't quite performed as we want to yet. Uh, just struggling to get the car in the right window of opportunity for the tyre. And uh, we're just working on some set of changes and, and maybe even in the race, we've changed some stuff for the race, so it might, it might suit us for the longer stint. So yeah, we're, we're kind of coming come in with big expectations and we've maybe tempered them off a little bit. But look, it's a long race, so we'll see how we go. Perfect, mate. Best of luck for you. I think we've got good things. I think outside podium is my uh, shout for this car. I'm going to give it back to you, Andy, in the box. What do you know, mate? Uh, well, uh, let's see, shall we? What I know is that we have got an entertaining afternoon ahead of us, that's for sure, and fantastic variety uh, out on track. We've seen Porsches going well uh, within the GT3 category, and early in the season, the Balfe Motorsport Audi, which actually uh, is the joint championship leader leading car in GT3. They won uh, the first race at Alton Park, but didn't have a brilliant result last time out at Silverstone. And uh, Bryn Lucas, I think, has found the Balfe team down on the grid. Uh, Bryn, what can you tell us? Well, I can tell you that I was talking to Ian Loggy a few moments ago, the championship leader. Well, another guy that's also a championship leader is Sean Balfe, and you're directly behind him, aren't you? Yeah, we can, we've got eyes on him, should I say. Yeah, um, prefer it to be the other way around, of course, but... Um, yeah, it's a long race, as I'm sure everybody's saying. Um, navigate lap one, hopefully, and, uh, and then see how the race pans out. It's really, really hard race, Donington, because of the GT4 traffic. Those guys are scrapping so hard. They don't want to lose time. Um, so it's about passing the traffic safely, getting the pit stops done efficiently, and... Uh, a bit of driving in the middle, I suppose. <laughs> it's staying cool, calm and collected, isn't it? And also, it's a three-hour race, and so you do have to get all the way through it. Up to that first corner, that drag to the first corner, over your shoulder to your right-hand side there is Richard Neary. So are you going to try and get ahead of him or just see what happens? Yeah, it's really difficult to try and predict. You've just got to be sp spontaneous and, and able to react quickly. So, um, I mean, you always need a bit of luck in these situations. So... Uh, We'll see what the racing gods have got in store for us. Yeah, let's see how Lady Luck is, is performing this afternoon. Good luck. Cheers, thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Bryn. Uh, well, as you probably heard in the background, they're starting to clear the grid now. We're only a few minutes away uh, from getting this fourth round of the championship underway. Drivers who are not starting the cars heading back to the pit lane. Uh, this is the car that starts on the outside of the front row, by the way. The Two Seas Motorsports uh, Mercedes of... Uh, James Cottingham, he will start the car and started the car at Silverstone a couple of weeks ago too, but tangled, uh, unfortunately, with uh, Richard Neary, Andy and Loggy halfway around the opening lap. So uh, it's not been the start of the season that two C's would have hoped or arguably expected. Uh, one top five finish and two non-points finishes for them so far, but they start second. Certainly looked as though the Mercedes AMGs were quick. We've got three of them inside the top five on the grid, but interestingly, they're sort of surrounding the two mid-engine cars, the McLaren of Enduro Motorsport and the Lamborghini Barwell Motorsport, first and third, respectively. So Donington, uh, as we were talking about in qualifying yesterday, does seem to be one of those circuits which almost suits the different uh, cars fairly equally. The front-engine cars go well through the high-speed stuff, the mid-engine cars through some of the tighter stuff, and then you factor in that rear-engine Porsche for Team Parker Racing as well, which was quick in practice, but only qualified 11th, uh, and you've got all the ingredients for quite a mixed-up race. And that's just in GT3. GT4, uh, oftentimes, has been even more eventful than GT3 uh, in a few races this season. Certainly at Silverstone, we saw some tremendous fighting uh, in the GT4 ranks. Yes, uh, the Stella Motorsport team 
are uh, leading the championship at the moment. And yes, they've won two of the first three races of the season. And yes, they're on pole today, but I don't think they're going to have it all their own way. They've got that extra time to spend in the pit lane because they're a silver cup car and they're carrying a success penalty for the last stop. But uh, yeah, it's going to be a fascinating race either way. Uh, stay tuned for the next three hours of action here at Doddington Park. The last chance to have a look at the um, cars on the grid. The grid starting to clear. The uh, environment around the drivers starts to get quieter and quieter before all of the noise of the race start takes over. And uh, what a breathtaking view it is. And uh, uh, I was saying uh, just now, Charles Bourne, who joins me back up here in the uh, commentary box, that uh, I get jealous sometimes that I can't be down there because on the grid, the moments before the race, surrounded by these beautiful cars uh, and these hugely talented drivers it's quite the atmosphere 100 percent. the tension is palpable you can feel it it's not just the drivers it's the mechanics there's team owners the sponsors you've got all of these cars and fundamentally all of them want the f the first bit of track at turn number one where possible yeah, absolutely. It's a fantastic atmosphere down there and a great sight of the grid and a little behind the scenes footage there of how we get that shot. Uh, a braver man than me. I don't think you'd get me on that segue, uh, even if you paid me. But uh, yeah, fantastic view of the uh, British GT lineup. What a lineup we've got this year. We've such a cracking grid of cars. We've got 30 of them set to uh, do battle here around the Grand Prix layout at Donington, a circuit that the teams and drivers know well and a circuit that we know always does produce good racing. It's not the easiest of circuits to overtake at, Joe, but I kind of like that. It shouldn't be too easy. You should have to fight for your trap position. Yeah, definitely. The flowing nature of Donington is beautiful in driving and to view, but the overtaking then becomes difficult. Sector three, it becomes tight and twisty. So we have the back straight into turn nine, 10 chicane. Nine is a good overtaking point, not the best. It then follows into 11. It's a 180 degree hairpin and it's fifth gear down to first. So that's a large braking zone. So it's possible to send one down the inside. And it's a similar story at the last corner. So you have three great opportunities to overtake. All of them are at the end of the lap. And I think what I like about that is that if you're stuck behind a slower car, you have to be patient. The first nine corners are hard to overtake. And then suddenly you get given three opportunities in one go, essentially. So it's hard to get right. It is, uh, certainly. This is how they will line up then for round number four of the Intelligent Money British GT Championship. Morgan Tilbrook on pole in his McLaren with James Cottingham's 2C's Mercedes alongside. Round number two for Adam Ballon of Barwell Motorsport and Ram Racing, uh, Ian Loggy, the joint championship leader. Row number three then is where we find Richard Neary and Sean Balfe in the other joint championship leading car, the Audi. We're for row four where we find John Ferguson, new teammate for him this weekend, and Michael Igo for WPI Motorsport. Back end of the top 10, Mark Sansom's Assetto uh, Bentley with Alex Maliakin alongside. Both of those cars will have success penalties to serve later on. Nick Jones, former race winner here at Donington with Team Park Racing is 11th alongside Nick Holstead's Fox Motorsport McLaren. Then it's Mia Fluitt, another McLaren, Stuart Proctor in the Greystone GT McLaren. They think they found something uh, on the car in warm-up that hopefully will make them a bit quicker. Calvin Fletcher had issues in warm-up earlier on for Paddock Motorsport. He starts 15th alongside Simon Watts. Towards the back then of the GT3 field, we have Betty Chen, the Taiwanese driver for Century Motorsport. And then we're into the GT4 category where Stella Motorsport were dominant in qualifying. And their Audi, started by Richard Williams, has the pole position with Matt Topham alongside. Top two cars in the championship, top two places on the grid. Jamie Day was fast yesterday. In fact, both drivers for our racing were. Their Aston starts third alongside Marco Signoretti, the Canadian driver for Academy Motorsport in the Mustang. Tom Edgar's Toyota is fifth within GT4, followed by Ross Wiley, who's been impressive all season long. Row four within the GT4 ranks then. It's Will Burns' BMW and Tom Rawlings' BMW, the two Century Motorsport beamers there sharing a row off the grid. Then it's Joe Wheeler in the Assetto Ginetta, Ashley Marshall's Paddock Motorsport, McLaren, and then right at the back of the field on the back row, Aaron Morgan for Team Brit and Ed McDermott in the Motors One Racing McLaren uh, will not quite round out the grid because Jamie Orton, who had issues in qualifying yesterday for Team Park Racing, will be on the back row of the grid all by himself. So, 30 cars, three hours, three pit stops. No driver can do more than 100 minutes, so you've got to time those pit stops well. There are a few clouds looming overhead. There are a couple of whispers of a shower or two along the way. 
One thing I can tell you for sure, though, is that round number four of the Intelligent Money British GT Championship is not to be missed. We're racing towards the halfway point of what is a hugely competitive championship. And what happens over the next three hours will no doubt shape the end conclusion of our 2022 season. Two by two to the line then. The green lights go on. We're away and racing here at Donington Park. And Morgan Tilbrook holds the inside line. James Cottingham on the outside has his nose ahead, but isn't quite as late on the brakes. Yes, he is. Goes right round the outside of the McLaren. There's almost contact. And still they are wheel to wheel off the corner. Looks like Cottingham has done it though. He carried the momentum around the outside at Redgate and gets the two C's Motorsport Mercedes into the race lead. Tilbrook second, Loggy third, Ballon there in fourth and Richard Neary hot on his heels as they drop down through the old hairpin for the first time. A clean run through the first corner. A Joe, what a start from Cottingham. Amazing, the outside line isn't the preferred one, hence why it's second, not pole position, but the momentum that you mentioned was key. It was a wider line, but then that flow he had all the way down the crane is just, you could see the car creeping pass from that rear view camera and it's given him an amazingly clean start there are three wide further back in the gt3 field and the gt4s are all sensible as well so so far i haven't seen any incidents change for second in gt4 by the looks of it in fact second and third because uh, matt topham has lost a couple of positions one to uh, josh day and then the other one was i think signoretti in the mustang going through so two places lost uh, for newbridge still stella motorsports audi though that will lead the gt4 field towards the end of lap number one everyone cleaning through the chicane adam ballon defending from richard Neary. michael Igo goes diving up the inside of mark sansom's bentley gets the inside line at the melbourne hairpin and will move through nicely done that's seven Seventh place for Igo and Alex Malik in trying to follow him through as well in the red line car. Yeah, definitely was well, one of the best overtaking spots I was talking about earlier and has executed perfectly there. Now at the end of the first lap, we start to see who's got pace. The front two look like they're pretty much clear of the others in terms of that overall pace at the moment. Neary looks racy, that fifth car there that we're just picking up to the right shot, the green and black Mercedes AMG. We go on board with him. Let's see how that car rides through the crane of curves. We dive down the hill here. The road really falls away. This left's actually blind. It's that much of a dip. A little bit wide. He's too far to the right now. So this should give Ballon a chance to get a good exit and give us a bit of a gap. Track limits are hard on the exit. There's actually a sensor that if the car runs over, automatically takes a picture and race control get them. Too many of them drive through penalty. Uh, over the curb there at the old hair. We've got to be careful. James Cottingham had a spin there uh, in warmer, but it's funny, Joe, because we both... Oh, and never mind. Off goes the Paddock GT4 McLaren, I think that is, isn't it? Down the crane of curves, and it will rejoin the circuit, but uh, having damaged the car... Oh, no, and uh, round goes Joe Wheeler as well in the Ginetta. So contact there, perhaps, as they were avoiding the McLaren. Joe Wheeler, who uh, did no pre-event testing because he was taking his A-levels, uh, wasn't even able to go out in the free practice sessions yesterday, got here in time for qualifying, and sadly, his race already unravelling. Yeah, well, that's the first world problem, right? Too much intelligence, <laughs> you've got to do A-levels, and then enough skill to be racing in British GT. The Paddock GT4 McLaren was missing its headlight front right, so yeah. you're going to say it's front to rear contact that way, but both these cars should be flat through cranes, so closing speed shouldn't be a thing, and Ooh. looks like it's gone down the inside, then had a wobble, and unfortunately the wobble's just drifted him into the Ginetta. It's really a pure racing incident. There's no malice there, and it's just an unfortunate... Oh, the timing of that is so unfortunate. Potentially cold tyres. Wheeler was fully innocent. There's a car gap on that inside, but unfortunately, that moment that we had on the apex just sent him into it. That was super unfortunate. The McLaren, for me, is 50-50, whether that's damage they need to fix or they might be able to get to the end. Missing a headlight isn't ideal. It'll create more drag, but it's not going to be a mechanical issue, I hope, for them. That was so unfortunate. A combination of cold tyres and also lifting just as it went over the crest. The back goes light and around he went. And poor old Joe Wheeler, completely innocent in all of that. That is already being investigated uh, by the clerk of the course, I can tell you. So we'll let you know as and when they make some decisions. Now, Michael Igo looks one of the raciest drivers on the grid. We saw him make that brilliant move on Mark Sansom at the Melbourne hairpin. He has since gapped him as off goes Richard Williams. The second race in a row that Williams has been off the track in the early part of his stint. They started on pole, remember, at Silverstone. He got tapped into a spin at Village, and here at Donington, the Audi's slow, heading up the hill. Yeah, it's not happy. As we first cut to it, the headlights were off, and then they came on, yeah. and I've just seen him go off again. So, bottom of the old hairpin. Looks like it's by himself, a little bit wide, and it's so it's grippy on the tarmac, grippy on the kerb, and then suddenly it goes to that dust, essentially. Now it's dry, and it's just spanning round. And these cars are very complex, so even running backwards for a split second will confuse the system yeah. into thinking it's got an issue wheel speed-wise. And I think it looks like he's trying to power cycle the car, so basically turn it off and on again. It sounded good on that fire-up, and it looked like it had some pace, so fingers crossed they can go. That car is so fast, I'm not going to yes. write that off yet. We've got two hours, 55 minutes remaining, but they've got pace to burn, so it'll be interesting 
to see how they go. Well, as I said, he had a spin in his uh, first couple of laps at Silverstone, still came back to finish on the podium. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Another three-hour race, all the strategy you can play. Certainly not counting them out just yet. Right, what that means is that this is now the fight for the lead in the GT4 category, because it is going to be Jamie Day uh, in the R Racing Aston Martin. First season of racing in the championship for him and the team, indeed, with Marco Signoretti behind again in his first season in British GT. The Canadian driver getting used to this Mustang, and this is a circuit where both the Aston and the Mustang have had prior success. Yeah, definitely. And again, <laughs> following on board, you see the dust getting kicked up in the face. That's one because that's the fastest way round, but it's a nice thing to do to the guy behind to not let him see where he's going a little bit. And we see the BMW tucked up as well. So we've got three cars here. They might look quite similar, but they will feel so different. And we've seen the BMW looking particularly racy. And when you, when you think about what these cars are doing to generate their lap time, it's amazing that you can make three cars so similar at a pace around such a varied lap here at Donington. Yeah, and uh, we saw much the same thing actually at Silverstone. In fact, these three cars uh, got themselves together in a very good battle at Silverstone last time out. Now, Signoretti under pressure here because he's got the Century BMW of Will Burns right behind him. And Will Burns, we know how strong he oh. is. And he gets a good exit there from the chicane. Will Burns, the reigning GT4 champion for Century Motorsport and he's up the inside now for second place, dropping down into the Melbourne hairpin. Superior exit from the chicane, inside line into the hairpin. Job done. Yeah, interesting one, and I'm not trying to grass on anyone here, <laughs> but Will Burns really cut turn 10, the right part of the chicane, to a point where he was definitely a legal track limit, but he gained an advantage overtaking. It's a really difficult one, because you get a warning for track limit, but if you gain an advantage, you really shouldn't take a place from it. That one is really on the cusp of was it just a track limit or was it gaining an unfair advantage? So Peter Daly, our race director, seven minutes in, has already got quite a big decision to make for me up there. Uh, yes, and quite a few things to keep an eye on as well. We said that instant being investigated team manager of Paddock Motorsport has now been summoned to race, race control to discuss uh, that contact between the 26 car and the number 56 Ginetta. So Will Burns then up into second place in the uh, BMW, drops his way uh, down through the uh, old hairpin. Signoretti trying to come back at him here, though, on board with the Ford Mustang. Stang the V8 rumble as he carries the speed up the hill. That thing really does have some ponies in a straight line, doesn't it? Forces Will Burns to defend into McLean, but then it handles like a dream as well. Good mid-corner speed for the Mustang. Can't get the overlap into Coppice, but a good opportunity here again, Joe, for a switch back down the back straight. Yeah, definitely. It's obviously rolls reverse from the previous lap where the BMW was behind him. Now we're on board. We're so tight to that car in front. You'll be getting the fumes off the exhaust, the heat off the engine and the brakes. So suddenly an already hot race car is becoming like a carbon monoxide sauna and it is hard work and if you've got an hour stint ahead of you some of these guys will be having to pace themselves and again we see the BMW using the advantage of cutting the corner a little bit I will mention track limits a lot so let me explain a little bit you get four warnings per hour on the fifth offence you get a drive-through penalty which here at Donington Park is around 18 seconds of driving through the pit lane at 50 kilometers an hour so it is a real hard how hard do I push risk versus reward in its purest as we cut back to the GT3 leaders, and it looks like they've got their own bit of track. The gap all the way back to Loggy now at 4.7 seconds, which these guys are really in a bit of a class of their own at this moment in time of their stints. Uh, yes, however, looming on the horizon is the GT4 pack, and as soon as they catch the traffic, that's when things can really start to change. Still Loggy third there, Ballon fourth in the green Lamborghini, uh, then it's Richard Neary, and then Michael Igo. So Igo got himself ahead uh, of Sean Balfe's Audi. Igo the one on the move, and Richard Neary actually um, seems to be biding his time a bit here, doesn't he? I don't know whether maybe the uh, the car isn't quite underneath him, but Richard, we're used to seeing him sort of firing it up the inside at every opportunity. Takes a very tight line coming off the Melbourne hairpin there, and actually he's going to have to turn from attack to defence very soon. Yeah, and that, when you get that sandwich effect, sometimes you lose a bit of pace because the car in front of you holds you up, and then suddenly the guy behind has the run. And in these circumstances, you really need to be positive and on the front foot. If you're the guy moving forward, not only are you going to lose, not lose position, sorry, but you're also not going to get any contact from the rear potential bunching. So you really need to knuckle down and see what you got. It looks like Tilbrook's maybe found a little bit of pace. He's just done a purple sector one on this lap. So that means it's the fastest sector one we've had 
of the race so far. And it's going to be interesting now to see as the cars change, not only tyre pressures as the fuel burns off, but we don't know what fuel any of these cars have. They might be fully fueled, so they could do in the region of 65 minutes, or they might have short fueled the car, so they're faster, but obviously their window becomes smaller for their strategy. That's a good point, actually, and that's, again, is one of the joys of not having set pit windows. You can be a lot more free uh, on what you do to the car. Right, Matt Topham here, uh, fourth in GT4 in the number 27 Aston Martin, but he's got quite the traffic jam behind him. Now, bear in mind that Matt is a bronze-graded driver, a full-on AM driver, surrounded here by silver-graded drivers. He's got uh, behind him Tom Edgar and Tom Rawlings and then Ross Wiley and Will Orton as well. Four very quick drivers behind him, and they just can't find a way through. Now, granted, the Aston Martin is strong here at Donington, we know, but that's still an impressive job by Matt Topham to hang on to that fourth position. The GT3, meanwhile, race leaders of Goddard, and I agree with you, uh, Joe, this is going to be a good lap. It could be a new fastest lap of the race for Morgan Tilbrook. He comes through, and yes, goes purple, a 127.8, three tenths quicker than the leader, four tenths behind into Redgate Corner. Now, he's catching, yes, he's quicker. Where is the McLaren strong on the circuit compared to the Mercedes, though? Can he use that to make a move? I, for me, the Mercedes is strong in Sector 2, so just the sector we're coming into now. Pretty even in Sector 1, what we could see there. And then Sector 3, it really depends on the grip of the car. The Mercedes front engine has a better entry to the corner of where the weight distribution is, and the McLaren being mid-engine, coupled with a carbon fibre chassis, means the traction is really strong. So this final sector that we're going to get into after the next right-hander of coppice should be where the McLaren can start to excel. And what I would be saying to Morgan now is on that top right button of the steering wheel we looked at earlier is get your headlights on, be in the mirrors of Cottingham. Don't need to be flushing, don't need to be a, an angry Audi driver in the fast lane of the M1, but you just need to be showing yourself, just showing intent. It's all about that. We see the closing up on the brake, so maybe the, the, the Mercedes is a bit heavier on fuel and that brake zone is elongated because of some extra weight purely speculation. You can see him actually going to the inside. I thought he was defending, but then the Audi GT4 pops into view and gives you a great insight to what we love about multi-class racing in British GT. Absolutely, and it's about to get even more entertaining because as these cars head into Goddard's, I can tell you the rest of the GT4 pack have just gone through Redgate, so another couple of laps and they will be right onto the tail of that, uh, what was it, fourth place battle in GT4. Just had a change for second in GT4 as well, actually. Marco Signoretti back ahead of Will Burns, as in fact, they are already into the back of the GT4 traffic. And this is where it gets interesting. Look, Cottingham takes the tight line into Redgate Corner, anticipating he might have got up the inside of the team Brick McLaren. He didn't, and that means he's slow on the exit. Tilbrook closing in. And if you're Tilbrook, you know this is a good opportunity to overtake. But you've also got to bear in mind, we're not even 15 minutes into this race. Going for a 50-50 lunge now is not really advisable. Definitely, it's so hard being the leader. The first guy past all of these GT4 cars. Once they're in a battle, those GT4 guys, the drivers will naturally be looking forwards, not in their mirrors. So if the teams haven't given them a heads up and we see him getting held up by the uh, McLaren GT4 on the exit, that's given the GT3 McLaren a chance. Cottingham looks pretty positive. We see the McLaren have a big old slide out of there. It's, uh, yeah. Cotton looks positive with his defence. It looks like he's being told to defend the position. Even if it loses him time, it looks like track position is more critical to that two-seas Mercedes right now. Yeah, because it is not the widest of circuits. So as long as you cover the inside going into the corner and don't run too wide on the exit, it's not going to be easy for Tilbrook to get alongside at any point. Certainly not on the inside line into any given corner. Slightly different lines there out of the Melbourne hairpin. Tighter line for Tilbrook. Now, you see, I was waiting for this. The headlight flashing has begun. We all know that guaranteed to do nothing other than aggravate the driver in front. I've very rarely seen drivers make mistakes uh, when they start getting the headlights flashed at them. If anything, just sort of spurs Cottingham on, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, uh, flashing is always a dangerous activity, and on track it's a little bit hard as well. We're really starting to get some track limits as war, well, and the, the worst one being near is already on his third warning in 15 minutes, so he's got two more, and then he's going to be on for a drive-through it's going to be really hard for him not to do it. We're seeing that really tight, and that is Neri I'm talking about. That one doesn't count as a track limit, just for reference. That's just the nature of multi-class racing. The Ginetta wants to pass the McLaren, and then the Mercedes, that is a late lunge, and that's going to then hold up the GT4 McLaren, which lets the Ginetta go, which lets the Lambo go three wide on a piece of track that is literally three cars wide. This is getting tight and nasty already. We both subconsciously stepped back from the monitor then when we saw what was going on there. That was almost certain contact avoided actually through some very good driving uh, by all involved. But uh, yeah, good point there. The GT4 cars are fighting for position, especially this early in the race. And if they see a chance
chance to overtake someone they're racing for position. Even if that means getting in the way of the GT3s, they're very much going to do it. Now, down at the hairpin, Century Motorsport versus the Speedworks from Toyota here, side by side heading up the hill. That's number nine, uh, Tom Rawlings and Tom Edgar in the Toyota. This has been a, a brilliant battle between the uh, two of them, and uh, they've been close to contact on at least one occasion, we believe, already. Here they come down the hill, a late move to defend, wow. and bodywork off, I think, the back of the Toyota was that. Yeah, to me, that looks like probably the diffuser shroud. The GT4s are that much more road car. It's probably just like a plastic trim part, almost around the top of the diffuser to the bottom of the bumper. It didn't look particularly structural with how no. light it flew in the air. I don't imagine much performance loss. I'd actually, as a, gr a driver, be greedy and think I might have just lost four <laughs> kilos of weight out of the car. And for reference, that can be added to the car at the end of the race if it was underweight. And the thing you shed in the race is added to the weight. You can't have doors falling off on purpose, but it's just one of the rules of motorsport. Right, OK, so it uh, looks like you might have got away with that, certainly through the high-speed uh, first sector there. The Toyota was strong, but everyone's wider. McLean's and Will Alton also getting sideways there in his Team Park Racing Porsche. He's stuck behind Ross Wiley uh, in the Veluga Porsche, and uh, they are fighting for seventh place in GT4. Off has gone the Team Brick McLaren. That's down the Craner curves as well. Uh, that car being driven by Aaron Morgan in the opening stint, whilst the race leaders have now caught this battle back in GT4. This is another opportunity for Morgan Tilbrook, Cottingham will be delayed here through the chicane. Tilbrook didn't get off the chicane well enough though, did he? And Cottingham should be safe down to Melbourne. Yeah, Cottingham again was clever in his defence. He didn't want to overtake, but he blocked the middle. So Toyota looked like it hadn't seen him for a split second, then turned in. And again, Cottingham's just got the better run out of that. Tilbrook really needs to try and plan his route. So he needs to be looking ahead at the potential hazards that Cottingham is facing. And he can maybe even open up a corner more than he would, exaggerate the line, and then get a better drive, thus exit speed. And that's his opportunity. But that it typifies British GT for me, that headshot down the pit straight. It is carnage, but somehow <laughs> controlled. <laughs> there have often been calls for separate GT3 and GT4 races. That's the worst idea in the world, as far as I'm concerned. It is this multi-class element of uh, British GT racing that adds so much interest. Now, look at the way that that gap has uh, shot out as Tilbrook was delayed a lot more in that lot of traffic uh, than Cottingham. You kind of have to hope as a driver that this evens out over the race, but certainly on that lap, Tilbrook losing out. He was three quarters of a second back at the line, and even more so now as they head up the hill. Ian Loggy perhaps doesn't realise how lucky he was there not to have contact with the uh, number nine BMW there of Tom Rawlings. That was very close as Tom uh, bounced over the kerbs, but Ian Loggy was coming through regardless. He remembers in third place and having a strong stint so far. Sometimes it almost looks like you're trying to thread the needle with a blindfold on wearing oven gloves. There's so much going on. The gaps are always disappearing and evolving in that regard. And it's just so hard to not lose time, like you said. I mean, uh, Tilbrook lost double the gap to Cotton just in sector one alone on that lap because of traffic. He'll be on the radio pleading his innocence to the team that he's not doing a bad job and it's just un unlucky. But the ebb and the flow of this race is going to really start to get interesting as they come back round again. They've nearly cleared all the GT4 cars for the first time yes. today. <laughs> yes, and we're not even 20 minutes in yet, so they'll be doing an awful lot more of this. In fact, uh, the amount of clear laps, traffic-free laps that they have from now to the end of the race can probably be counted on the fingers uh, of one hand. Richard Neary here up behind Tom Rawlings. Uh, Meanwhile, uh, not Tom Rawlings, sorry, Tom Edgar, Tom Rawlings is uh, being investigated for an incident that he's had with car 40. Now, that's the GT3 McLaren of Nick Holstead. So, presumably, that was uh, Holstead coming through to lap him and Rawlings uh, making a bit of contact with the McLaren. That's being investigated for the time being. I think that could be a typo. I reckon that's meant to be the 48 car Did of wonder. the Toyota. Um, I think it was a small contact that we saw with the bodywork coming off. Probably no further investigation, but interesting that Toyota has now got past the BMW and has really got some pace. You can see that gap there as I go on the grass turning in there. The cars do 125, 130 miles an hour there, and the confidence to turn that in off the grass. There's some uh, yeah, big space hoppers sat in that seat. And, and these are, I remind you, the AM drivers in GT3. We don't really like calling them AMs, but we sort of have to. That is the terminology. But some of them are, are really, really good. All of them are really good, actually. And with some tuition from their pro drivers uh, and their teams, they get better and better with every race. And they get more confident. That's the big thing with an AM driver, isn't it? You can make them fast. Yeah, OK, you can teach them what to do in the car to go quick around the track. But that confidence, that racing nows, that 
that's something that can only be learned over time. Yeah, definitely. And the last round at Silverstone that I was racing with an man that you talk about, Nick Moss, a guy I work with a lot. And my job is to extract the performance from him any way I can. So you very much feel like a school teacher and primary school teacher a lot of the time that you have to teach them the basics and build that confidence. And you're really trying to find anything you can use. We have live onboard video so we can watch and try and guide them through, like definitely overtake the GT4 car here or hold on, just wait, bide your time. So the pros will all be on the pit car radios talking to their amps, trying to help them through here because any time they find is that the time the pro is going to be further up the field too. Uh, yes, indeed. Oh, Richard Neary again thought about going for a slightly dicey move there on Will Burns. Now goes to the inside of the BMW uh, into the old head. In that BMW still running third in GT4. Jamie Day is romping away with it in GT4 now. 4.1 seconds up the road from that car that we've just overtaken, uh, the Academy Ford Mustang of Marco Signoretti. So big old lead that for Jamie Day. Could have benefited slightly from the GT3 cars coming through, but uh, his pace is fairly impressive at the moment. 1 minute 36.3. There, the Signoretti matched him on the previous lap. He won't this time, though, because he runs wide there as Michael Igo nips through, and Igo is catching Neary. Now, that is a, a fight you'd buy a ticket for, isn't it? That would be for fifth place if you can get there. Yeah, between Igo and Neary, I only see three losers out of that one. It's that going to be that aggressive. Fireworks will be strong there. Neary, we've seen this season, really seems to have upped his aggression level, and it's on the borderline of being acceptable. We've seen a few penalties given to him. I've spoken to Richard, and he's pleaded his innocence to me, and I, I get it, but there's a, there's a bit of hostility out there, potentially, if I don't want to be a little gossip. Interesting stuff. OK, racing drivers having a disagreement. Surely not. Uh, into uh, Goddard's comes the second place GT4 battle and Signoretti is late on the brakes, a bit too late on the brakes there. Just about manages to wriggle out of the corner ahead of Will Burns. But this terrific battle for second place rages on. Will Burns, uh, three times a winner on... Oh, Richard Neary is in. Oh, no, never mind. We're not going to get that fight. Now, this looks like it is a scheduled stop. I didn't see any obvious issue with the car. Richard in to hand over to Sam Neary. They're putting the fuel in. This looks planned. I hope he didn't hear what I said and he's running up to the commentary <laughs> box. But yeah, it looks planned. No damage on the visible damage on the car. Looked like the team were ready. The fueler was helmeted up straight on with the fuel. So the process of the pit stop in British DT, car stop, engine off, driver out, close the door, fuel on. When the fuel is finished, then the driver change resumes and you change tires at the same time. There is a minimum pit stop, so if the pit stop is clean, you're most probably going to have 20 to 25 seconds still to go at the end before the car will release down pit lane. The interesting bit with that strategy is I would say Neary was short fueled then, so potentially 40 to 60 kilos lighter on cars that if they were full of fuel, he was racing again. So maybe the pace of that other car wasn't quite as strong as we see the stellar car coming in as well. Looks planned as well. I get their logic, they're on pole position, so they could run light and maybe get into the distance and get a bit of a gap. That plan unraveled, unfortunately, early on as they had their spin. So. All of these strategists that have been working hard all week to get the perfect strategy, unfortunately, an idiot driver like myself gets in and that all suddenly flies out the window. Uh, as we see, we have fluid going round the outside of the GT4 car, not losing too much time. Uh, so right. stop go for the number nine. Interesting. I called it as a racing incident. Yeah, well, I mean... Wow. I, I'm sticking with racing incident. I'm, I'm happy to be contentious on that. He, for me, the Troy just defended aggressively but cleanly. The BMW has then gone back to the racing line and has just caught the back. So, yes, the, the contact has happened, but, I mean, it's a, it's a strong penalty this early in the race. And the thing with a penalty in motorsport, there's no VAR. You can't check it. So that's done. That's black and white. He's going to serve in, and that's going to be a long day for the BMW. Indeed it is. That is a real shame. Oh, blimey. This is uh, Mia Fluid and Sam Neary uh, not making the best of friends there. Sam Neary fresh out of the pits, of course, and knows that he's quicker now than a lot of the uh, pro drivers uh, out on track. So Sam Neary then uh, getting stuck in. Hadn't even been on the track 10 seconds there, and he was banging doors uh, with the McLaren. Interesting to watch his pace then. So they have sacrificed their track position. Uh, they're going to have to give Richard a longer stint later on, but they clearly feel that by getting their quicker driver in early, they pitted uh, only uh, some 21 minutes into the race, they clearly think that that is going to be the strategy that will then send them to the front, because if he's in, in the car now for 20 minutes maybe before the others start pitting, he could easily come out of this first round of pit stops as the race leader. Yeah, definitely. The, the big thing for strategy for me and studying this race is 
if you pit early and a safety car comes out, it means you've definitely done a pit stop under green flag conditions. If you can do a pit stop under safety car, you don't lose a lap. You lose track position, but not a lap. Every time, it, if there's a safety car and you can pit, you've won. So they've committed to a strategy which will not work if there's a safety car because they won't be able to use it because we need to get Richard Neary back in for the car for that much more time than his other AMs he's racing against. Yeah, remember, neither driver can do more than 100 minutes. So Sam Neary, uh, they'll try and get as close to that 100, but that still leaves 80 minutes for Richard Neary. He's only done 20 of those minutes, so he needs another hour in the car, basically, uh, before the end of the race. There goes Alex Maliakin, seventh place then for the red line car. <laughs> it, what's going on here? This is Marco Signoretti, and look at the mess on the track from that uh, uh, early shunt between the Paddock McLaren and the uh, Ginetta. Lots of polystyrene all over the road. Won't do any damage to the car, but it's got to be a distraction now. Huh? Yeah, it definitely can get stuck in the cooling brakes or yep. radiators, and it goes there. So we've got a replay up here. So the Nick Jones Porsche down on Nick Halstead. Interesting. I actually don't think there was contact there. It looks like it. Let's have a look. This is the perfect camera view. In we go. Oh, the slightest of contacts. I'm not very good at calling this today, am I? So <laughs> that one, again, looks like a racing incident to me, purely on the fact that Nick Jones didn't gain an advantage. There was a legitimate gap there to start with. He's put the nose of that Porsche down there. Nick Halstead has to turn in at some point, and there was contact. Nick did a great job to just create a slide, not a spin, and Nick Jones doesn't look like he's got any legacy damage from that either, in my opinion. He's actually lost a position there to Mia Fluitt in, uh, in the following lap. Yeah, Fluitt driving well, and they're both being caught by Stuart Proctor there as well. So this is uh, 12th, 13th, 14th. Mia Fluitt having just taken that 12th place away from the Team Park Racing Porsche. Team Parker, of course, got their most recent race victory in British GT here at Donington a couple of years ago. That was with the Bentley Continental, but Nick Jones and Scott Mulver winning uh, in a sort of wet, dry race here at Donington. A uh, race you were in, I seem to recall, Joe, and they, what a race it was. And uh, Team Parker looking to try and recreate some of that form again in much more pleasant conditions here today. Almost half an hour then into round number four of the Intelligent Money British GT Championship. James Cottingham uh, maintains a one-second cushion over Morgan Tilbrook at the head of the field. The number four Mercedes ahead of the number 77 McLaren with Ian Loggy in third. Whilst in GT4, it is still the R Racing Aston Martin of J uh, Jamie Day. Uh, who leads the way, 17th overall for that car. Second is the car you're on board with now, Marco Signoretti's Ford Mustang, and he, for the time being, at least seems to have sort of shaken off Will Burns' BMW. They're still pretty close on track, but Signoretti not under as much pressure now as he was a few minutes ago. Yeah, I think you've seen there's no GT3 cars in shot there, so that shows they've had a couple of clear laps just to see what their pure pace is again. And again, that's that ebb and flow I talk about, and you've just got to try and create the space while you can, because you will get held up again by traffic as we cut to a shot of the uh, DK car actually getting held up by the M4 GT3. So the same class, but just different pace. And the problem is when you catch a slower same class car, they've got the same power, so it's harder to get around. And I think that's why we saw such a big hold up there for the Mercedes. And before we know it again, Tilbrook's on the rear bumper of the leader. Yeah, it's never been more than about a second and a half this gap, but it regularly comes down to about half a second or so in traffic. Tilbrook closing in, but again, frustratingly for him, just can't quite find a way through. Getting a drive through penalty, by the way, now for the Toyota, so Tom Edgar being given a drive through uh, for not respecting track limits, we're hearing. Now that's within the first half hour of the race. It's the chicane where he's been doing it. That's where most people have been uh, pinged for track limits this weekend. And uh, well, Tom Edgar, the first to be handed a drive through penalty for it. Yeah, it's, it's difficult. You, I'm going to say, on, like I'm stating obvious things here, it's just not acceptable this early on into the race. You have to sail close to the wind, but you can't capsize your boat this early on. And he's now got a mountain to climb, 18 seconds. And when you're cutting the corner there at turn 10 at the chicane, maximum you're finding two tenths of a second. So if he's done five of them, he's found a second, and now he's just lost 18. I'm not very good at math, but that is a poor investment in, on your return anyway. And I just think we've got to be careful here. I think there's potentially going to be a plethora of drive-throughs, especially towards the end of the hour, just before those limits get reset. Yes, exactly. We'll keep an eye on that. Certainly that is early, as you say, for uh, people to be uh, getting those sort of penalties. Lead gap back out again momentarily, but as we've said, it keeps on ebbing and flowing as they catch the traffic at different parts of the circuit. Impressed with uh, James Cottingham here, though. He's not put a foot wrong so far, nor has Morgan Tilbrook, actually, in two of the less experienced of the AM, uh, drivers we've got in the championship. They're putting on a good show at the front, and they've checked out. They're 10 seconds ahead of Ian Logging in third place. And Ian's been doing this for a while now, and uh, these two really are uh, showing 
showing them how it is done at the moment. You can't even see Ian Loggy in that shot. He in turn is four seconds ahead of Adam Ballon, who still has Igo, Balf and Maliakin uh, in pretty close company behind him. But uh, yeah, whatever Two Cs and uh, Enduro are doing, it's working. Yeah, and to touch on the point you raised earlier about these amateur drivers, it sounds derogatory, it's not, it's what they are, they've got real jobs day to day, they don't get to sit in a race car like me, trying to practice every day of the week, but just interestingly, we've only got one pro in at the moment in Sam Neary, Sam's quick, the car's quick, Richard was quick, his fastest lap time is still slower than those two leading cars with amateurs in, yes he might be in a bit of traffic, might not have new tyres for example, Big Ooh. lunge there from Igo and Ballon. Ah, oh, that was the most clumsy instant. Oh, this is like Monaco awkward, isn't it? At the Lowe's hairpin. That Ballon was completely innocent there. Igo didn't look like he wanted to be there right at the last second. So headlight flashing, potentially unsighted by the McLaren a little bit. Like I said, at that point where he's on the first apex there, he tried to back out of it and then yeah. just couldn't make his car evaporate quick enough, essentially. The best thing he could do is actually wait for Bannon and yeah. give the place back. I don't know if that's going to be longer than a drive through, but unfortunately, I think that will attract a penalty. Unfortunately, even if he gives Ballon a place back, several others came through as well. In fact, Ballon hasn't yet got to the line, so he's going to be perhaps out of the top 10, maybe even with damage. So even if you do give the place back, Ballon's still lost out, so there's still likely to be a penalty given there. 11th place for Ballon, and that lap was some 30 seconds slower, so I guess he struggled to get the thing fired back up again and lost a huge, huge chunk of time. And 30 seconds, even in a three-hour race, uh, is not going to be easy to bounce back from. Yeah, and I know they weren't in the lead at the at the time or even in the leading pack but they were our race winners at silverstone yeah. and i saw them a long way in the distance ahead of me so they were very competitive there so that's potentially one of our winners yeah. out of the mix you see the dust getting kicked up by that only fans car nice and dirty it's going to go for it i think he's getting racier and racier i'm going to say in the next couple of laps we're going to see a potential change of leader i think so the mclaren looks a little bit stronger maybe looking after its tires a bit better perhaps we are half an hour into the race now uh, of course both of these cars running uh, well ahead of the rest of the field so i can't imagine they're in any great rush to pit so yeah morgan may have to try and do this out on track he comes through half a second again between them but now they're back in clean air and Cottingham could try and stretch his legs. Yeah, you see actually a bit of polystyrene on the front of Cottingham's splitter. Yeah. So the front right of the car, you hear that noise as it goes over the kerbs. A bit of everything, that's the car bottoming out. And we've seen a safety car being called. We've not seen anything quite yet on the cameras. Sometimes it can also be in the pit lane. They will stay full throttle until we get a yellow flag. And depending on where the incident is, it actually been quite late in the lap. The safety car will pick them up on the pit straight, but they're still about 45 seconds away from there. If you're leading the race now, Joe, do you pit? Because you want to try and get one of these stops done under safety car, right? You do, but you need to make sure the safety car is there. Sounds obvious, right. the safety car is cool, but it happens rarely, but I've seen it a few times where the safety car doesn't pick the leader up. And if you were to pit, you wouldn't benefit from that safety car being there. We've seen a lot of guys pit early. And like I've just said, if you're not on the back of the train, the safety car win is not as large. So for me, those guys have pitted a little bit early. And we've still seen them racing, flashing the headlights. If the yellow flags are out, they are allowed to still be racing. The safety car there at turn one is ready to pick them up. There are a few cars in between the leader and them, so it's going to be a little bit of sorting out. There are definitely yellow flags. They've driven past three uh, that I've seen, so uh, I think Morgan Tilbrook, so fixated is he on the back of the Mercedes, he's perhaps not spotted them. Uh, James Cottingham has neither, and they both dive for the pit lane, so this is big. Top two cars in the race diving for the pits. We've already had Paddock's McLaren in, the Fox Motorsport McLaren in as well, Rocket RJN. I can see the uh, GT4 front runners have all pitted as well. In fact, all of the top four GT4 cars are in. It does make perfect sense to pit now because you lose so much less track position from pitting behind the safety car so gt3s 110 seconds minimum pit stop time gt4 is 140 and if you're a silver cup car in gt4 there are an extra 14 seconds to be added on to that so again that's slightly less time being lost by doing that uh, under the safety car than under green flag conditions no success penalties yet though they only get added, added on uh, to the third and final pit stop i haven't seen a single car come past <laughs> us on the pit straight so everybody has box like i said i think someone should roll the dice and actually go and catch the safety car up and see where they get in the food chain 
We've seen here a lot of lot of debris on the track, and they might sometimes seem small, those pieces, but they're carbon fiber, and they are razor sharp. So if you were to run over that with your tire, there's a good chance of puncture. Interesting, I've just seen Sam Neary box again, so he's going to get Richard back in. So that's a bit of a left-field strategy, that one. They're going to now have to do two hours, 26 minutes, with only one fuel stop. The Mercedes frugal, but that is really tight to be able to do on one extra fuel stop. That is interesting, yes, because that, that was my next question. Would they now choose to stay out and try and uh, gain back some of the track time? But of course, yeah, you said pitting early. If you then get a safety car, it does rather put you on the back foot. So we shall see if that pays off. Of course, they can save a bit of fuel behind the safety car. But if it is only for debris, it won't be a long safety car period. Uh, so that might even uh, uh, limited your uh, limiting your opportunity to do so. We are hearing there are no cars off. So it is just to pick up the rubbish that's been distributed around the circuit. Great stop for the um, enduro team quite slow on the pit exit as if they were worried about that being too quick when you consider these two cars came in nose to tail and the other way round that is a suspiciously big game for the 77 car I get your logic uh, the pit stop timer they're 1.3 seconds safe as you see the DK car going really slow potentially was there a red light on pit exit that the safety car was going past i think it was red and then went to green because the train of cars was so small behind and i i think what has happened here the pit positioning of that two c's car was so compromised they would have lost time in their pit stop and the the enduro car just did it right and importantly has got in front of the safety car and has gained a whole lap behind the problem here is now we should get a wave by for everybody that's not the leader. The leader, unfortunately, is going to be one of the last cars. So this could be a bit of a prolonged safety car because they're going to have to let everybody then catch back up. So it's a short safety car for debris, which is now gone. So look at the space he is in. So at the moment, he will be a lap ahead, but he is the leader. It's a big call by race control here on what they do. I, I haven't got a right or a wrong answer, but I know what I'd rather see for the next two hours, 20 minutes of racing. I'd be surprised if they don't wave everybody else through. Um, what was that I was saying about this being a short safety car period? That won't be the case now, will it? And of course, they will only uh, wave them through so they can pick up the GT3 leader. What it can do, and probably will do, is really mix up the GT4s because some of the GT4s might find themselves trapped an extra lap down uh, because they happen to be behind the GT3 leader so this will all take a few laps to shake out but we have seen in the past uh, GT4 races get really turned on the head by uh, mid-race safety cars yeah like we said we always talk about the leader and the leader is normally a GT3 car so they are really the dictator let's see if that arm pops out of the safety car there to wave through that Mercedes um, it's going to be an interesting one the only other thing that I'm a bit of a nerd and excited about is that the strategy that ABBA have done will mean that their pro is behind the safety car the least so at the moment, every GT3 car and the predominant amount of GT4s have their pros in behind the safety car. So if that safety car, let's say, does last probably eight minutes if we do a rave, wave around, that is eight minutes of pro time that they're not getting versus the ABBA car. And if we are seeing maybe a second and a half, two seconds difference, that could be the difference to get that ABBA car back up there. It's an interesting dynamic when we go there. And we're seeing some cars still pitting, um, yeah, this is going to be an interesting one. Yeah, Nick Jones there, who had taken over the race lead technically, but that's because he hadn't stopped yet. WPI have been in, and look, and they've put some uh, tank tape on the left front corner of that car, that a legacy of the contact they had with Ballon. We haven't yet heard anything about that being investigated. I would imagine it probably is being, uh, but uh, with the safety car drama, that uh, notice not yet getting to us. Uh, nice that they've uh, they've gone to the trouble of buying red tank tape to match the red bodywork of the WPI car, so it doesn't stand out quite that much. Team Park racing in, making their stop. And you can see now that the first car behind the safety car queue is the number four car. Now with Lewis Williamson at the wheel. Uh, and uh, I think probably once everyone has stopped and all of the marshals are off the track, because of course, marshals have been out there cleaning up the debris. Uh, they will more than likely wave everybody through. Right, I mentioned Michael Igo and that contact he had with uh, Adam Ballon earlier on. Ballon got the car uh, back to the pit lane and he's down there now with Brim. Adam, it was a, a disappointing thing for you. I mean, you, you look absolutely uh, distraught by it. Tell us what happened. Well, I'd had a couple of bad laps, so I go was reeling me in a bit, but um, he just lunged me down into Melbourne Loop. I mean, he was miles away. It was never on and spun me around. It was just like, oh, so irritating. It's destroyed our race. 
Well, here's the replay. Talk us through it from your point of view. Yeah, so I got yeah, there was a GT4 car on the inside. I got a reasonable run up there, and then I went to the inside, and that's my line. And he just tagged me. I mean, it's obviously he's nowhere near nose in front of me. Um, it's obvious what I was going to do, go around the corner, and he just dives up the inside. He knows it. He's going to spin me as well. That's the thing. There's nothing you can do as well. But from the car after that, was there much damage to it? Did it still feel okay? Uh, I, I think the car felt all right. Actually, it was a bit right hand down, but generally it's all right. Um, but I left a load of carbon. Next lap, I didn't want to run over it and puncture myself, which would have been real irony. Well, look, I, I know it's gutting, but fingers crossed you can get back out there and have another go. Yeah, I hope so. We'll see what Sandy can do. Yeah, thanks, uh, Bryn. Uh, uh, rather unhappy Adam Ballard, understandably. And he mentioned there, Joe, that, that he'd left some bits of debris behind. Uh, that is the debris that's been cleared up that led to the safety car that has completely changed the complexion of this race. Yeah, and I, I think he's, he's called it right. Adam is actually a very calculated guy. You can see he's peeved, but he's not raging. And um, I think I just feel sorry for him in, in that regard. Just when I pick up on the thing, he said, he said right hand down. So that means the steering wheel wasn't straight after the contact. And the, the knock he would have had on his rear right tyre could have just knocked the suspension out the toe link so that tyre probably is pointing a little bit toe out which is the better way to really have it in terms of the tyre wear and performance but can make the car feel a little bit lively um, so we're trying to pick up here the car still catching the safety car the 42 car obviously with its spin earlier this has really been a heaven sent for it and is now allowing it to get all that time lost with sending the car ready for the restart. He will be going as fast as he can, but still respecting the yellow flag. So that's why uh, the Ewan Hankey 76 McLaren behind looks a little bit racy. It wants to just make sure he definitely catches up the train if when we go back to green. Yeah, so the Audi uh, getting a bit of a lucky break here. Then Senna fielding back in the car now. He is not, uh, no, he is on the same lap as the leaders in his class. So, yeah, that's uh, definitely going to benefit him. Unless, of course, they then get waved to a hammer in the safety car, in which case they essentially get that lap back. There has not yet been a wave around. Uh, the top three cars in the race overall in GT3 are Enduro Motorsport, followed by the 76 car. Now, I noticed that car pitted uh, a little bit out of sequence with the others by a minute or so, and it's come out in second place, according to our timing screen, with third place for the Team Parker Porsche. But again, that will probably drop down once it eventually completes its pit stop, but uh, there will always be winners and losers in these situations. And the difference here is that you're gaining or losing huge chunks of time rather than a couple of seconds. Yeah, I still maintain I was correct in the statement of the cars stopped too early under the safety car because they hadn't caught the safety car. So you don't get that delta effect of it. The problem I think they realized is that the safety car was going to be a short one, should have been a short one, and they might have missed it. So they're getting waved by now, which this is good, great news. I was fearful if they didn't get waved around, we were going to have very few. So all the cars will get there until we pick up the Enduro car. So there might be a few cars in between the Enduro car and the rest of the GT3 field, but crucially, they will all be on the same lead lap. So I think the biggest winner really actually is the 76 car of Fluid and Hankey, because they were outside the top 10, and now they're going to be a legitimate second place. Next big winner, our new race leaders, the Enduro McLaren. And then your probably biggest loser emotionally will be the DK car two C's Mercedes that was leading and looks like it will most probably even be third or fourth depending on where the Parker car has slotted itself but yeah, I'm maintaining that that extra lap behind the safety car is why the 76 McLaren and the Parker Porsche have leapfrogged up the field. I think you're right yeah they did come in a lap later than the others just noticed a Seto Motorsport back in as well Will Tregertha jumped into the car behind the safety car caught up to the queue and then pitted again to hand back over we guess to Mark Sansom so that's interesting. He was in the car for nine minutes, was uh, Will Trigger. That's a very short uh, opening stint. There it is. Uh, now, does this look scheduled? Looks like they've done the driver change. They will maybe have topped the fuel up slightly. They certainly won't have bothered changing the tyres, so they can now uh, sit there and wait. But interested to know, I don't know if Brink can get down to a setter and see if he can find out the thought process here. Uh, and uh, that does seem odd to pit twice within the same safety car period. It's yeah, just bur burning up one of those mandatory pit stops. So if they, can, if they think they can get to the end of the race now with only one extra fuel stop, so split this stint in half, a minute and eight, that's definitely doable, a little bit of fuel saving. And if there's not, not another safety car and everyone else has to do two pit stops that they've got remaining under green, 
that car and the Abba car are on a bit of a left field strategy. And you tend to find that if you're outside the top 10, you've got nothing to lose. It's podium or nothing really in these sort of races. So you might as well try that left field strategy. And as a racing driver, it's toys out the pram. I'm not in the top 10. So yeah, fine, just keep pitting me. Let's get rid of these really slow, laborious, mandatory pit stops that you see the cars having to do. Uh, yes, because of course under green you lose a lap from a pit stop here. They will stay on the lead lap, so it is a free pit stop. Uh, Mark, by the way, used up Mark Sansom. This is used up about half an hour of his uh, allotted driver time. So yeah, he will have to do just under an hour. Uh, but uh, yeah, they need to make sure because they'll have their, they'll be sort of restricted now in how far they can push the fuel because he's only got a limited amount of his uh, driver time left. So that's going to be a calculation that I do not have the brain capacity to work out right now. But I'm sure the team is working on it. Yeah, you're correct. Correct. The only other thing is that the rule is 100 minutes maximum. Yes. So they won't be able to maximise Will Trigurth this time. He's only done eight minutes, so he's still got 92 minutes remaining. There's no way that car will do an hour and 32 minutes on fuel. So now the AM will have to do more time than he should do strategically to make it a one-stop race. So now you're weighing up, right, if my AM is one, one and a half seconds slower than the Pro, but I don't do an extra mandatory, what's the bigger winner? And at the moment, that definitely would be another 25 minutes with the AM for me. Uh, uh, getting some uh, some information here from Britain to say that actually they underfueled the car. That's why he came back in again. So it wasn't necessarily planned. It's uh, expensive the at the moment. <laughs> yes. Uh, on the screen, though, we're seeing the order of the race. Uh, and uh, you can see quite clearly one pit stop done by the uh, leading cars. The first car to have done more than one uh, is the WPI Lamborghini. And it is still Michael Igo in that car. So I think they did briefly do a driver change to Phil Keane. Uh, and you can see that uh, car running a lot further down the order. Within GT4, by the way, uh, Matt Cowley has come out of all of this as the leader in the Ford Mustang with Darren Turner second for Newbridge Motorsport and uh, then Josh Miller third fastest uh, third place sorry in GT4 as well so roughly the same group of cars up there albeit in a slightly different order uh, within the GT4 category yeah and so now we've got the safety car lights are off just spotted so safety car will be in this lap I assume so we're seeing the leader this is all correct we then just have innocent GT4 cars in the way essentially for those GT3 guys they're in their own race so Morgan's gonna sorry Marcus now Clutton is gonna back them up I don't want to give away a strategy, but he should go as slow as he can to get the gap to that safety car as big as possible so he can go as early as possible to use those slower GT4 cars to hold up you and Hanky in that Mercedes. So he wants to go early and the GT4 cars naturally won't be able to stay with him. And Ewan in that McLaren that we're just seeing turning in now can't overtake until the line. So I think Clutton could have a 12 to 15 second lead here at the end of the first flying lap. Well, let's see. He's certainly gone early, hasn't he? And actually, Ewan Hanky isn't even that close to the uh, back of the couple of GT4 cars one of which is the Stella Audi. So it did get trapped behind the uh, overall race leader. So it's almost a lap down on the rest of the GT4 competition. Marcus Clutton then gets the race back underway. We're onto the 29th lap of the race with just over 45 minutes gone. There goes Ewan Hankey trying to get up the inside of uh, Seddon Fielding's Audi, but he in turn was up the inside uh, of the uh, Freddie Tomlinson Ginetta. So Ewan losing more time there. The gap of the line between first and second in GT3 was uh, just under 4.3 seconds. It probably went out again though through Red Gate. Yeah, and uh, we're seeing F I go, sorry. Oh, whoa, whoa, big, big lockup. I was just about to say, see, I go in the Lamborghini there being the AM around all the pros, and that created his own bottleneck. So he's essentially a lap down, but has done an extra pit stop. So I'm not going to talk too much about it. It's too confusing. What we're seeing on track here on the lead lap, Clutton, Hanky from the Porsche of Malvin, and then our former race leader now in the hands of Lewis Williamson, and he's getting through the traffic. And then he's got a Mercedes behind him of Callum McLeod also on the lead lap. So those are the bunch of cars all together. Then let's see what these pros now have pace. We saw what the Ants had. We got used to their flow. It is now completely up on its head as you see all the pros cutting the corners a lot more than the Ants. Yeah, Scott Mulvin a bit wide there in the team park of Porsche. That might give Williamson a chance. It does give Williamson a chance to go around the outside in the car that led for the first half an hour of the race, the safety car, uh, and their slightly slow pit stop costing them that lead. And now trying to get back into that second, uh, into that third position, I should say, back into a uh, podium spot. Williamson late on the brake, rolls up to the back of the team Parker car out of Goddard. And there you can see that rear engine traction. The Porsche just seems to accelerate off the, the uh, tight corners that little bit better. And Williamson, therefore, not close enough to have a go uh, on the brakes into Redgate Corner. Team manager, by the way, of car 18 has been summoned to race control. That is WPI Motorsport, I guess, for the contact uh, with the 
uh, Barwell car earlier on. Would not be at all surprised to hear a penalty incoming for that car in the near future. Yeah, and I think, interestingly, I, I've been told a million times not to exaggerate, but the gap to Clutton to Hanky was six seconds. Not as big as I thought it was going to be, but still, that is a nice bit of real estate that Marcus has now got. He can settle into a stint. I'd imagine the car is fueled to do the hour. That would be my strategic one for this first pro stint. And then where we can see where we go. So I go getting a 10 second stop go. So the drive through the pit lane, 18 plus 10, 28. I mean, still up on what Ballon lost. So I'd accept that as a penalty if I was WPR. Yeah, I think so. Let's hope, of course, that their car isn't damaged. Did have that bit of tank date, didn't it, on the uh, left front corner. Right, lead in GT4 held by Matt Cowley's Ford Mustang, but he's got Darren Turner all over him. We remarked in the first stint of the race how well Matt Topham was doing as an AM driver surrounded by silver graded drivers. Now, Rolls reverse. Cowley a silver and Taron Turner very much a pro driver. Uh, but Cowley is no slouch and he uh, he came through Formula Ford 1600 racing amongst other things, knows how to defend a position and he ain't going to roll over and let Turner through here. No, definitely. And he's been in that car for a few seasons. So it's so nice that he knows this circuit in that car, which will really give him the confidence that he can have a fair fight here with uh, superstar Darren Turner, who has literally won everything there is to win in sports car racing. And so actually speaking to the Academy Motorsport that run that Mustang, Matt Nickel Jones, the team owner, about that car. And Donington really is the best circuit. That car loves it round here. So he was pretty confident of a win. So let's not throw a commentator's curse on him with over two hours to go. Oh, now that was the Century BMW lapping this pair. That almost it did force Cowley onto the wide line into Redgate Corner and almost allowed Darren Turner through. Uh, but Cowley with uh, some good grunt there from the uh, V8 engine underneath his uh, Ford Mustang's hood gets out of Redgate Corner and chops across the nose of Darren to uh, retain the lead of the class. Uh, WPI, by the way, have been given a 10 second stop go penalty. We saw that coming. So that will be Michael Igo back into the pit lane. Uh, that car's third visit into the pits this race, but this side, uh, to serve the stop go penalty through McLean's they go senior uh, S.I. Cowley at the wheel of the Mustang just starting to stretch away slightly here from Turner uh, but again this will continue to develop as the GT3 cars one by one make their way past them yeah and we're again starting to see the mix of GT3s now coming back through once more and just looking at the timing screens that uh, everyone can access via TSL timing we've got 12 GT3s still on the lead lap so we've got a big race here we've just seen Marcus Clutton do the fastest lap of the race at 26.5 and then for reference Ewan Hankey in a McLaren behind 27.3 so that enduro car that was on pole position let us forget has got some serious pace at this moment in time uh, that fastest lap by the way is a new official lap record here at Donington Park by about a second faster uh, than Phil Keane right replay of the restart this is on board with Lewis Williamson remember he had that really close moment with the Igo Lamborghini which you can see two cars ahead oh and the brake lights come on that is every driver's worst nightmare did well to avoid contact at the top of the hill and through the middle of it then Igo gets boxed in behind the Audi and at the last second Williamson well did he intend to go to the inside or did he lock the, uh, the uh, rear brakes there I think he intended to go there once the rear was locked <laughs> yes. he had no option but I mean the first break down the crane is you expect to be pulling fifth gear there 130 140 miles an hour so to be on the brakes hard as we see more close multi-class racing going on there. The Ginetta being really nice at getting out of the way in that regard. That's really helped Lewis Proctor in the Greystone McLaren get through there cleanly. And you just saw the gap that then gave him over the Ram Mercedes. It suddenly changes so quickly, but uh, a safety car restart is just so difficult to not have those sort of clumsy little mistakes. And there was no contact. It was great yeah. driving by everyone involved. Uh, car nine now being given a drive through penalty. That's that car's second penalty, is it not? So uh, what well, this one's for, I'm not sure. But that is Chris Salkeld at the wheel at the moment uh, of the Century Motorsport BMW in GT4. Running sixth at the moment, but won't be uh, for much longer. Down into the chicane comes uh, Cowley with uh, Turner behind him. These two, 16 seconds up the road now uh, from the Josh Miller are racing Aston Martin. So somewhere that car which was leading before the pit stops remember in GT4 has lost a big big chunk of time and uh, that will certainly not help their chances of contesting for their first race victory in the championship. Battle on here for 11th within GT3. Joe said that there are 12 GT3 cars on the lead lap. The last of them is the number 15 Ram Racing car, the sister car to the number six with a new driver on board. John Ferguson still part of the team, but with Elisa Powell uh, jumping in to replace Jamie Caroline. Elisa Powell uh, having, uh, he's racing in the GT World Challenge Europe uh, series this year. Won a race at Brands Hatch 
earlier on in the season. He was uh, third place in the British F3 Championship a couple of years ago as well. So a star name. Great to have you, least in the championship. Yeah, definitely. And it's, it's interesting to see a driver change unplanned mid-season. And that's difficult for the team to make. But if the driver's not moving on in the way they want, the team will make that cutthroat decision. And Ulysses de Pau, I mean, it's a brilliant name. It sounds like a strip club I've been to, but he is so fast. He's really got talent. And I'm excited to have him in the series. I always like when our little British island attracts these top European drivers and we get to see where we are in the food chain. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, really, really uh, close stuff out there. Out goes the number nine BMW from the pit lane, by the way, uh, as the third place battle in GT3 makes its way back towards Redgate Corner. Now, uh, despite the pressure that Williamson was uh, applying a few laps ago to Scott Mulvern, Scott, the experienced driver that he is, now seems to have settled in, doesn't he? He's getting away from the Mercedes again. Uh, Mulvern's lap times are uh, pretty comparable, actually, to the, all of the cars around him. He's looking stronger now. Yeah, but he is on his final track limit warning, so one more misdemeanor, he will get a drive through. Interestingly, there's just over five minutes remaining yeah. until that is reset. So hopefully the team, or Scott, are asking how long have I got until my lives are reset and I become a new cat and I can suddenly start <laughs> cut, cutting the corner or running wide. But yeah, if he does one more in the next three laps, essentially, that is going to be a drive through penalty. So, so difficult to get this balance right. And at the moment, we're seeing quite a few people falling foul to it. Bobby Trundley here about to go a lap down to the leaders of the GT4 category. The GT4 McLaren then ahead of the top two in the class. And again, Matt Cowley has to get his elbows out there to keep Darren Turner behind. He's not made any mistakes yet, Matt Cowley. But if he leaves that door open, even a chink, then Turner will be through the gap in a, a blink of an eye. And uh, Darren, again, with so many years of experience, he knows that patience is key here. The opportunity will present itself, and you've got to be ready at all times uh, to pounce at that. It could come here, actually, because Trundley is almost defending here uh, from Matt Cowley. It's putting the Mustang offline. Comes out of McLean's corner. Is there a gap on the inside? No, Trundley, uh, does he not realise these are the race leaders? I'm not sure what's going on here. Difficult. The blue flags might be out, might not be. But at the moment, if the team aren't telling him, he, he won't know. So. He we can't lay the blame on him, but this is going to get quite messy quite quickly, especially if he doesn't let Turner go. If, even if he's looking like he's going to lunge for a second back in, I think the team have let him know that that isn't his fight for today, unfortunately, and they've let the guys go. And all of that, there was a Lamborghini overtaking it all as well, so super interesting. Uh, Three-second stop-go penalty for car number eight. That's the Neary, so they're on this strange alternate strategy, uh, and now they've had uh, they've hit a bit of a speed bump here. A three-second stop-go sounds like too short a pit stop. Yeah, for me, it's the only logical explanation. Whatever you're under your pit stop, you normally get it added to a drive-through penalty, and the timing screens are showing a 1 minute 47. So, as you correctly said, that is three seconds under but that's a 21 second time loss. It's so difficult to maximize that minimum pit stop time. Uh, yeah, not worth the uh, the tidy gain you make, is it? Turner again, having a nibble at the back of the Ford Mustang here through Redgate corner, still frustratingly, can't quite find a way through. Uh, these two on the previous lap, by the way, were a little bit slower than the third placed Aston Martin of uh, Josh Miller, but he is under an awful lot of pressure uh, from the number 65 team Parker Porsche behind of Seb Hopkins. So the battle for third in GT4, every bit as close as the fight for the race lead. Yeah, it's really good to see. And we're seeing a, a big battle, I think, evolving in GT3. I think when the AMs get back in, we'll see some fireworks because the, the pros are in a bit of a disjointed order. But unfortunately for us, I actually think they're in an order that they seem to be in the correct pace. So we haven't seen an overtake. But when the AMs get back in, they're now in a different order to how they finished the yeah. first in. So hopefully, I think the fireworks are up on them. Whereas the GT4 looks like it's going to bunch up, as you've said, they're starting to hold each other up, those leaders of the GT4 class. There goes the uh, Red Lion Lamborghini, seventh place for them at the moment. This is actually the fight for sixth because Adam Carroll uh, is ahead here of James Dorlin. If you're James Dorlin here, I don't think you'd be fancying your chances of gaining sixth place. We saw how good a defensive driver Adam Carroll was uh, back at Alton Park when he fended off Jules Gunon uh, for the win at uh, Alton in the season opener, one of the best races in recent memory in British GT, and Adam Carroll very much the star of the show. That being said, Dorlin is closing in slightly here, and the Lamborghini we know uh, is capable of going well here at Donington, whilst the Audi uh, has been there or thereabouts, but never quite as quick as it has been at either of the previous two circuits. So something about Donington perhaps not quite favouring that car in the way they'd like. Yeah, and it's really interesting, actually, those cars are so similar underneath the skin, both uh, the V10 from the VAG group that's found in both of those 
road-going versions. The manufacturers in terms of Lamborghini and Audi are obviously on their own aerodynamics, and actually the geometry is quite different on the Lamborghini again. But it is amazing that they're basically the same car that perform in such a different manner, and Donington Park and the Lamborghini just go together so, so well. Yeah, they absolutely do. We've seen lots of success here over the years for the uh, the Lamborghini teams. I uh, told you the number nine BMW had a stop-go penalty to serve or drive through one or the other. They served that, and on the very next lap came in for a driver change. So Tom Rawlings back out for his second stint now uh, in car number nine. That's another interesting way of reacting to a bit of misfortune, trying to turn it into uh, maybe uh, an opportunity to use strategy to your advantage. Sixth place GT4 battle that makes its way through. They've got the uh, Rocket RJN car of James Kell just up the road. That is another GT3 car, but it's not on the same lap as uh, those two. As into the pit lane to serve his penalty comes Richard Neary. Yep, so three seconds, counting ahead. One, two, and three. He would have been leaving just there, and he would be straight back to a racing speed. Blue lights flashing on pit exit, showing that there's a faster car potentially coming past him and look pretty clear. So he's actually in a really good bit of space looking out the window. So hopefully now he can just settle into a rhythm and he needs another safety car, essentially. Uh, black and white warning flag now for Elise de Pau. He's just overtaken uh, Lewis Proctor, we believe. So that's now 11th place for Elise, but uh, uh, black and white warning flag for track limits. Third warning, that is, for him at the chicane. But as Joe said, we're 30 seconds away from the end of the opening hour when all of those track limits get reset and you get a, a clean slate. So uh, he can afford, if you've got some left in the bank, you might as well use them, I suppose, uh, even if it only gains you a couple of tenths. Uh, there looking to extract as much pace as they can. Into red gate corner then comes the uh, the uh, Audi and Lamborghini battle here for sixth place. Adam Carroll and James Dorlin. Dorlin looking quicker as the overall race leader there. Marcus Cutton puts a lap on the GT4 leaders. Yeah, it's the first time we've seen him really since the safety car. So he's obviously been relatively uneventful. He's got the fastest lap of the race. He's actually just on a, another f personal fastest sector one. So the car's performing well. Marcus is a, a brilliant driver and he's really bought on Milgard, Morgan Tilbrook side to be one of the fastest AMs. And that coupled with Enduro really getting on top of this McLaren, they've suddenly come into a really rich vein of form this weekend. And they almost look unstoppable in, in that sort of current guise of it. And it's interesting to see what is going to be the rest of the best. Uh, and I just hope they have a, a problem-free run. And we've seen them win here before, and it, that looks the, the likely option with just under two hours to go. Yeah, they've been quick all season, just had a few bit of issues, and by their own admission, they were driver errors, things like uh, knocking the fire extinguisher on at Silverstone and Morgan missing the pit lane, or missing his pit box at Alton Park, which cost them a lot of time. James Dorlin, good run there on Adam Carroll. They both get boxed in a bit behind the R Racing uh, Aston Martin, though, and they will now, one by one, go to its right, uh, heading up the hill towards the uh, final corner. So for the time being, the Balfoudi stays in front then of the red line race. Lamborghini. I've been impressed with uh, Redline this season, actually. Had that off at Alton, didn't they, in the first race of the season. Still managed to uh, score points in that race, actually. But last time out at Silverstone, this team were a bit of a revelation, of course. Redline, far better known for their association with Porsches, uh, but the Lamborghini, a strong car, and had it not been for a bit of contact that Malikin had in his first stint when he took the lead from Adam Ballon, they could well have won the race. Yeah, definitely. A relatively new team to us in British GT and Redline, and a team historically associated with Porsches. They've really got to grips with that Lamborghini quickly and yeah I had a, a great battle with James Dorlin actually at Silverstone proper door to door nice and fair and I've raced with James in previous guises at McLaren so lovely kid and he's really done well to get this opportunity in a top car with a top team uh, they actually had an ABS failure towards the end of Silverstone I think that's why I uh, managed to get away from him in the end so I was very pleased that the Italian electronics let him down on, on that front but he looks quicker than Carol to me at the moment and just looking at the speed trap data I've got in front of me it looks like he's got a good half a mile an hour to a mile an hour in the speed traps as well so probably just needs to wait for that car to line up and get the slingshot done and dusted on him on board looking backwards always a great shot on this mercedes you see the rear wing you see the pylons how much they move left to right i'm glad as a driver you don't see that live because it doesn't fill you with confidence it just shows you the energy in these cars coming from itself the engine vibration the curbs the tires 
everything in these cars is absolutely brutal. Yeah, it is. So commented on that in qualifying when they rattle over the curbs, it makes you wince almost. You would imagine that it must be damaging the car, but they're incredibly robust and well prepared by the teams, these cars. And they uh, more more often than not can uh, stand up to the punishment. And Matt Cowley, withstanding the pressure here from Darren Turner really well, you get the sense that Darren isn't maybe going full attack just yet. We still have just under two hours to go in the race, uh, but Matt Cowley not really opening the door at all for the Aston Martin driver to come through. He will, though, have to open the door for Lewis Williamson and Callum McLeod to come by because the two Mercedes run out of different teams, of course. Two Seas Motorsport, the yellow car, the pink car is the Ram Racing example, and they will both move through now. Callum McLeod back with Ian Loggy uh, for this weekend before Gilles Gounon, we hope, uh, will be back in the car later on in the season and those two Mercedes uh, well Williamson a little bit quicker on the previous lap so perhaps just starting to uh, eke out a bit of an advantage over the Ram car yeah definitely I'm really impressed with Matt Cowley he's got a bit of a gap because of traffic but like you said he's soaking the pressure up he's probably got another 35 to 40 minutes of it but if he holds it there I think we had to ring him out and pressure will be dripping out of him because that is a phenomenal performance and it's hopefully going to stay clean as well as you see that ebb and flow the gt3 is just tucking the little gap in between but there they're disappear disappear into the uh, distance and that should allow darren turner to get a couple of clear corners before that bentley in the distance behind catches them and it all starts again as we see down the inside brilliant move Wow, judge that to perfection then, James Dorlin, didn't he? Of course, uh, used to race in Renault Clio Cup, so I guess the cut and thrust racing like that, he knows well. And uh, yeah, just about managed to clear the GT4 car, but then also get to the inside line to attack the Audi. So through he goes, although now Adam Carroll tries to fight back and does fight back. They're almost side by side at Hollywood, but the Lamborghini will squeeze across in front. And I reckon Dorlin might be the faster of these two at this point, so should now start to build up the margin. But that was... Um, absolute precision driving and a great example there of how to use the traffic again to your advantage not so much because the back markers held up uh, Adam Carroll but just being on your toes uh, to the point that the second you clear the lap traffic that inside line was left open and three went yeah and that's so key to looking ahead trying to plan what's going to happen so you can kind of predict the more likely option of where you should go and fill that void of space that sometimes is created by a GT4 when you're overtaking it in one of these GT3 cars. And now the interesting bit will be the roles are reversed in terms of dirty air. So Dorlin's pace was obviously good and he was in dirty air. And now Carroll's got to try to respond. But unfortunately, he's now in the dirty air of Dorlin. And that can really affect the balance of the car. You tend to pick up more understeer in dirty air because the front of the car is closer and it's less efficient in that. So it suddenly becomes a completely different race car within a matter of minutes. Uh, yes, it does. A bit of dirty air maybe here as well, given how closely bunched the GT4 cars are. Although, because they're that bit less aero dependent, you can run those to tail in GT4 uh, without it really affecting your performance mid-corner. They're proving that now because you've got the two Century BMWs, which have been inseparable all weekend. They qualified together. They've been very close on the practice times as well. They run nose to tail now towards the Melbourne hairpin, and they've got the Toyota Supra behind catching up so um, two of these cars are fighting for position annoyingly for us it's the car at the front of the group and the car at the back the middle car is that number nine machine now in the hands of Tom Rawlings again which has been in to serve a couple of penalties and has made uh, its second uh, mandatory, mandatory stop as well so it's off sequence it's a lap down uh, but very much acting as rear gunner at the moment to its teammates yeah it's oh, difficult I'm sorry commentators go I can't believe how real <laughs> commentators go I'm so sorry Matt Cowley as we see Turner has obviously passed we didn't quite see maybe something happening there with the paddock car I don't think it was involved but it was quite a strange dynamic in terms of Turner being around the outside there it's not a move we historically seen you actually uh, see it now coming back so it's a ah. BMW involved see how dirty it was off the line and Cowley then is compromised through the left of Craners and Darren's got the outside line both very fair giving each other plenty of space and then the McLaren wants to make it three wide and Cowley's too preoccupied with Darren Turner and then the door is closed and that McLaren has to back out of it and they all live to fight another day but just super unfortunate time with Cowley he probably should have shut the door on that BMW GT3 and not given him the opportunity 
to be wide through the middle of crater curves. And, and that was exactly my point about Turner before, because you said Cowley hadn't made a mistake, and you were right. Uh, the one bobble that he had, though, Turner was there instantly. He knew that was the chance and wasn't afraid to take the risk. I mean, going around the outside of the old hairpin, even if the car you're passing has just been held up through the crater curves, that takes some doing. And uh, Darren Turner, on the dirty side of the road, committed to it because he knew that another opportunity might not come for the rest of his stint. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's a big and a feeling as a driver when you go around the outside of someone is impending doom. <laughs> the physics are all against you. You're just waiting for that car on your inside just to give you a little nudge and you're already on the limit and that just sends you straight off into the scenery, into the barrier and it's day over. But when it comes off, it feels so sweet. And that's what I meant. It was genuinely such clean driving by all of them. It looked hard and fair, but no contact. And hopefully that means that we get another battle as the cars continue to evolve over the stint. Uh, and for Matt Cowley, that's still a really good job done. Yes, he's lost the position, but that was a number of laps that he uh, managed to keep Turner behind for. Um, and uh, he was able uh, to get through with Turner, but you know that was a number of laps actually that he was still stuck behind the Mustang running its pace. They are both, of course, leading their classes within GT4. So Darren Turner, the Pro-Am leader, one of only a handful of Pro-Am uh, entrants in GT4 this weekend, and the Silver Cup being led by the Ford Mustang. So in a way, didn't cost them much, but of course, uh, Academy very much targeting overall GT4 race wins. Yeah, this is, class is important, but overall is more important to And when they're both for first place in class and overall respectively, it is always worth defending. There's no way that you could ever pretend that you're not that bothered. So, yep, interesting, the dynamic, the Pro-Am versus the Silver Silver pit stop as well for GT4. They have an extra 12 seconds in their pit stops. So that gap is going to grow as we see two McLarens wow. going at it nice and hard. Rob Bell and Martin Plowman there. Nose to tail, obviously two cars are the same, run by different teams. You do see it going, and we're getting another battle evolving here. You and Hanky and another GT3 McLaren getting caught by Scott Mulvin. That gap now under a second, nine tenths of a second. Mulvin two tenths quicker in sector one. They blast through sector two now, and another two tenths to Mulvin. So expect that gap to be the half a second hovering around as we go there. And Mulvin, remember, has now had his track limits reset for this next hour. Really happy for Team Parker here. They've shown good pace all weekend, but for whatever reason, didn't quite put it all together in qualifying, but uh, through a little bit of good fortune with the timing of their pit stop behind that safety car, they've now put themselves in the part of the field that they really ought to be in anyway, in podium contention. Third place at the moment, same strategy roughly as all of the cars around them. So this is a genuine third place. And Scott Mulvin now seeing an opportunity to turn third into second. He is again a tenth and a half quicker than you and Hanky on that lap and gets the gap down to around three quarters of a second now. Mulvin has pulled a 4.4 second cushion for Lewis Williamson as they both went a bit wide out of Redgate Corner. Williamson is still fourth, Callum McLeod in fifth, and James Dorlin in sixth is matching the cars ahead. So having passed Adam Carroll, oh, isn't really gaining on them. Big, big delay there for you and Hanky. That was the stellar Audi in the way at the old hairpin. And now what was a seven tenth of a second gap comes down even further. Yeah, I, I love these tight shots of the cars. You see them working so hard over the bumps and curves. Just look at the roll of these cars. I find in the Porsche fashionate, I've raced one in the past. The engine is in completely the wrong place for it to work dynamically, but yet yeah, it's so fast, so much traction, it's got so much weight over the rear of that car, it really gets out the corners and just goes. Yeah, it certainly looks like a, a nice car to drive, well balanced, isn't it? Makes a nice noise as well, uh, does the Porsche, which is now looming ever larger in the mirrors of the second place man, Ewan Hankey. Uh, Ulysse de Pau, by the way, on his final track limits warning, and we're only 10 minutes into the hour, so uh, that does not bode well for Ulysse, who of course has done most of his racing in Europe, and is therefore used to the the European track limits rules, which are a little bit different to the British ones. There goes uh, Dorlin up the inside of the Rocket RJN car, but this is the fight, second place overall, and Scott Mulvin now starting to ask all the right questions of you and Hankey. But again, Joe, this fascination of GT racing, two completely different cars, they both generate their lap times in very different ways, not a lot to choose between them lap time-wise either, so where does Mulvin make the move? Again, it's going to be sector three, the big overtaking spots, but the McLaren looks good on the brake, so Really, the Porsche's advantage is the traction, like I alluded to, because of its engine position. But it doesn't seem to be getting that much. The best opportunity really should be out the biggest traction zone, T12, that hairpin up until the last corner. It just hasn't seemed to happen yet. So it's interesting to see. And again, I think we're going to probably wait for traffic 
for the catalyst to be the move in this uh, in this instance. Yeah, I think that could well be the case. The GT4 traffic spread pretty evenly around most of the track, although uh, actually these two seem to have found themselves a nice bit of clean air up at the top end of the circuit. Just got a, a glimpse, you might see it again now, of the orange Team Parker GT4 car in the background. That car, I meant to say a while ago, was running inside the top five in class, but was given uh, a stop-go penalty. That's why it's dropped out of contention for the time being in GT4. Still runs in uh, seventh place overall in GT4, though, with Seb Hopkins at the wheel, uh, but it was definitely in the podium fight before that. That uh, technically the sister car, then, to the Porsche on your screen now. This is the uh, Porsche 911 GT3. Scott Volvan, which having caught you and Hanky just can't quite manage to prise the door open. These two still running in the high 1 minute 27, so they are dropping a few tenths a lap here to Marcus Clutton, whose pace is just electric, isn't it? Really, really good. And we just seem dipping a little bit quicker into mid 27s, both of those cars. And just watching them all come across the timing screens, they're all pretty similar. Malvin uh, has just lost a little bit on the last lap. Actually, James Dorlin's pace the lap before was strong as well. So we still seem to have this sort of six to seven car potential battle pack evolving uh, all the way through there. We see the Mercedes diving through the Crane curves, lost its polystyrene that it picked up earlier, so that'd be running absolutely smooth. You'll see in the fading light later on potentially as well, the sparks coming off that Mercedes. It's a very dramatic experience to watch that car. And what's nice about that leading group you're mentioning, six or seven cars, only one of them at the moment would have to carry a success penalty uh, based on their Silverstone result, and that would be the red line car number 32. Uh, which finished second last time out, so would be carrying an extra 15 seconds at the final stop. But apart from that, yeah, it's a genuine fight uh, with 29 seconds covering the top seven. Down through the uh, chicane comes this second place battle. This is what they call turns nine and ten. It's the Fogarty S's. And this, Joe, is where track limits has been the talking point. Exactly. So the first part is pretty well regulated by a big tyre stack that you definitely don't want to hit. But the right's that little bit more open. You've got the three sets of yellow kerbs, which are scarily big in real life. When you see them in your face, you definitely don't want to touch them. But then suddenly when you're in a race car, it's OK. You see a little bit of bunch of the traffic. But that is the hot spot of track limits. It's such a win to cut there. But the tire, the left-hand tire, could not leave the track. That is the big rule there. And we saw three or four, really, out of those six cars in shot doing that. There's a judge of facts stood there. I actually went and spoke to him on the test day. I wanted to see what rules he was playing to and how he was monitoring it. Super interesting, doing a great job, but so difficult to do. And he has stood there, and he, he literally has got the perfect view. You can't argue it. You could go up, talk to race control, but they've got a judge of fact who's trained been doing it for years that is it it's black or white yes which uh, is why we're seeing so many of these track limits calls but that is literally just that person's sole job and uh, they don't have to concentrate on anything else so they almost always should be getting it right uh, second place battle up through uh, coppice corner again still hanky holding on here from uh, scott Mulvard as we tick towards the halfway point of the race one minute and 45 uh, still to go and uh, the next pit stops then, when do we anticipate them to come? I guess uh, with the race running green at the moment, no sign of a safety car, touch wood. Uh, and for the most part, the GT4 traffic not actually too bunched up either. I guess the GT3 teams happy to leave their pros in now, those of them that are running the pros, uh, for as long as they possibly can. So I'd imagine this mid portion of the race will be stretched out for quite some time. But of course, the teams want to make sure they get their pros in for plenty of time at the end of the race as well. Ideally, the last half hour, 40 minutes or so for the run to the flag. Marcus Clutton here, very much the pro driver at uh, Enduro Motorsport. And uh, this has been uh, a really good job. Well done so far. He's nearly 20 seconds up the road. Marcus Clutton, a very experienced driver, but it, it, easy to forget that Morgan Tilbrook is only in about his third or fourth season of racing anything and moved into GT racing so, so early in his racing career, uh, which I will be honest now, didn't say this to him at the time, but I thought that was a, a, a step too far, a little bit too early. But uh, with the coaching from Marcus and all of his experience that he's got, he's turned Morgan into one of the best ams on, in the field. Yeah, definitely. And Obviously, it's a car I know well in the McLaren GT3. And when we develop the car, we're looking at those AMs and what they want feeling-wise. There's no point us as professionals developing a race car that's fast but yet undrivable slash Larry. So we're able to really use all the traction control systems, ABS systems, and the general dynamics of the car and the chassis to dial it in to make it drivable. So guys with relatively limited experience, it's scary sometimes how little they've done. They're then able to be on the pace of where they need to be. 
the interesting bit now for, for Marcus is really when's he going to pit? The strategy is still up in the air. We saw how a safety car suddenly juggles it. Oh, I would say you're probably going to be looking kind of on the hour potentially in the next 15, 20 minutes, maybe a little bit more. If you've got clear space, you can fuel save. And by that, you shift up a little bit earlier, keep the revs lower, you lift off the throttle before you brake and coast into the corner. And you can easily find 5 to 10% fuel saving. And then suddenly your stint is extended. There's no limit on how long a single stint is in this race. Yeah, so that uh, last round or first round of pit stops, for the most part, uh, happening at seven minutes past one. So uh, that was, yeah, about 50 minutes, 45, 50 minutes ago. Uh, so we are getting to towards the end of the hour. Of course, they will have saved a bit of fuel behind the safety car uh, and they'll be uh, back planning this essentially from the end of the race. They'll know already when they want the pro to get in for the end of the race and that sort of then uh, decides the rest of the strategy for you. Let's see the, uh, the Paddock McLaren back out there. Spent a bit of time in the pit lane getting that right front corner uh, fixed after its early tangle with the Assetto Motorsport Ginetta and uh, also then was handed a penalty as a result. But that car being driven by Ashley Marshall at the moment, 47 laps down. Uh, 21 laps down behind the uh, the next GT4 car, but running actually 10th within the Silver Cup, so they would, at the moment, uh, take a point home from Donington Park. Yeah, and it, it might seem a bit pointless to be running that far down, but all of this track time is always learning, especially for a, a team that aren't used to a car paddock running the GT4 McLaren for the first time. They're just going to be learning so much about it, so it's worth just getting out there and testing and seeing what works and what doesn't. They may even come in and do a setup change in the race. It's all very valuable learning and track time as we see the 76 McLaren blast out of there. Melvin's not really got closer or further. It's kind yeah. of status quo, really. And actually, in the background, the Paddock McLaren did box, so uh, he obviously wants to do a setup change uh, on my advice. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. Let's hope that is all it is, not uh, not something more sinister. Yeah, you're right about this. And Mulvin will be getting frustrated because the rate at which he was catching Hanky about 10 minutes or so ago, it really did look as though he was going to have the potential uh, pace here to. Uh, make the move, but you can see the Porsche wriggling around a bit there through the old hairpin. So this car that we've been saying all race is so well balanced, looked anything but through the old hairpin that time. Of course, he's been on these tyres for the better part of an hour. He's been stuck in the dirty air for a long time as well, and that, no doubt, will be having an effect on the way the car is driving for the time being. Yeah, potentially teams have been um, sold a bit of a dummy here by the weather. The mm. track temp has really been climbing, the sun's been beating down on it, and obviously the track really attracts the heat being a dark colour. So seeing the track temps rising, so the pressure's at the start of the stint potentially getting a little bit too high, and as the pressure gets higher, the tyre starts to fall out of its performance window, and the car will start to move around again. Obviously, for the next set of tyres, the driver getting in, as we see a car, Ginetta off oh, no. in the gravel. That's an interesting place. We do have live snatch available at Donington, which essentially means that car can be recovered under a local yellow. It's right on the cusp of whether the race director will be happy to do it under a local yellow or we will call a safety car. All the teams will be ready for a safety car pit stop. It will work for nearly everyone's strategy. Yeah, this could be interesting then. We're approaching half race distance and uh, have we just seen uh, the latest twist in the story here for round number four of the championship? Well, Academy Motorsport thinks so because they are in the pit lane. Now, if they are anticipating a safety car, I think this is too early myself. In they come anyway, Matt Cowley getting out, handing over uh, to uh, Marco Signoretti for his second stint of the day. This pit stop coming at 13.55, so that was... Uh, yeah, 45 minute stint or so that for Matt Cowley. They definitely cut that short. You can see the Toyota coming in as well. Uh, a lot of teams, I think, here are anticipating a safety car stoppage, or a couple of them anyway. Uh, but I'm not convinced we're going to get one. We've seen uh, quite a lot of cars stuck in that gravel trap over the years, and they do tend to be recovered by the live snatch vehicle under a local yellow. So they, you never know. This could turn out to be an absolute genius call, but I'm not so sure. Yeah, it's too early for me on that one. I think that was just coincidental, they boxing then, to right. be honest. Uh, I understand it could have been a call, but it's going to be hard to work out. Interestingly, when you saw the Academy Mustang come in, you actually saw Aaron Morgan in his wheelchair getting ready to get in. And they're in the garage next to me at Silverstone. And just absolutely incredible to see somebody with a wheelchair getting in a race car and then being so fast on track that you couldn't tell there's a single difference going on inside that car. Really inspirational to see that going on 
in, in British GT. Yeah, lovely bloke, Aaron Morgan, as well. I know him from uh, some of his club racing that he's done beforehand and uh, even rocked up at Silverstone last week just to watch the C1 24-hour uh, race. He's a real enthusiast of motorsport, Aaron. Uh, great that he and the Team Brit team uh, have this opportunity to race in British GT. Right, uh, Academy with tyre changing going on. Signoretti, as I said, getting in. So if we're thinking this was a planned pit stop, interesting that they cut this stint short uh, for Matt Cowley. Went, uh, could have gone at least another 15 minutes or so on fuel, you'd imagine. So saving his driving time for the last part of the race. Yeah, potentially. And sometimes it's predetermined and maybe they didn't have the fuel in to get to the end. And they, yeah, exactly. It's hard to see. You saw the, uh, Jesus, that's the purple <laughs> sector two for the, uh, I think that's a Manor two, isn't it? When it's uh, green, not a JCB. Uh, it's his time to shine and you can actually see it's a bit harder there towards the wall in terms of the gravel's not as deep see the toyota it looks like a scheduled pit stop on that one as well but let's say the academy mustang when you saw him pull that front right off the brake dust that came off it really shows you how hard these cars are working the front brake disc getting up to anywhere 650 degrees centigrade so the heat really would be pretty hot there for the mechanic working on the car uh, tenth place has just changed hands, by the way. Ulysses Power ahead of Martin Plowman now, so gets the uh, second of the Ram Racing cars into the top ten. Uh, out onto the circuit goes the Academy Ford Mustang. We're hearing, by the way, that the uh, Assetto Motorsport team have been told they can continue in the race uh, once the um, once the car has been recovered from the gravel trap. So despite receiving clearly outside assistance to get going again, they are being allowed back into the race, which is nice to see. Yeah, sensible decision in a lot of ways. It's probably quicker for it just to rejoin the circuit from where it was once it got pulled out that final bit of gravel. Um, and exactly, it's not going to get in the way. So I think we might be able to see a bit of a replay here of the chicane. We're talking about this curb earlier, the WPI Ooh. just taking a nibble out of that. And that tiny bit of carbon fiber is what we call a dive plane attached to the front bumper to help stall the air and create more front downforce. And that being lost will be a few tenths of a second over the lap for Michael Igo. I won't say how much it is because it's extortionate for the size of that piece of carbon fiber, but I definitely could spend 1,500 pounds on a better piece of uh, equipment, I think. And there you can see the uh, Seto Ginetta being moved out of the way. This, by the way, is a fight for position. Uh, there is the Ginetta being dragged unceremoniously out of the gravel. And another part of the marshal's job, actually, and the recovery worker's job, is to make sure you do this without making the damage to the car worse. Because uh, once that front splitter starts digging into the gravel, you can start ripping bodywork off the front of the car quite easily. Yeah, I hadn't anticipated going through the gravel that deeply for that long. That thing is going to be filling itself yeah. up. Not just the splitter, the side skirts and the Ginetta diffuser. And I think where it's going to rejoin in the brake zone of the chicane, there's no way he's not going to be able to put gravel yeah. somewhere and it is going to make that... If I was the uh, engineer for a car, I'd be saying, in the next few laps, keep an eye out. One yeah. for the flags on the marshals, the slippery surface flag, and just look for the gravel. It's going to be like ice. If it puts down 10, 15 kilos in the brake zone, I'm excited. <laughs> yes, could definitely spice things up, couldn't it? The chicane already uh, is a part of the circuit that does get quite dirty because people do cut it and run through the gravel and kick up bits of dirt. We saw in the TCR race earlier on cars flying off when they got onto the gravel there. Could be a similar story here. Oh, Scott Mulvin just delayed slightly by Signoretti, who is on his outlap, I think, uh, in the Academy Ford Mustang. That just drops the Porsche back from the uh, Ewan Hankey McLaren ever so slightly. But they've both now caught. Uh, well, in fact, we've just had a change there. That is the Neary car going slowly, is it not? It looked a bit sideways ways there. Is that a left rear puncture maybe for the Team Abacar? They just lost a place to the uh, WPI car. Richard Neary definitely off the base. Yeah, I mean, God, that looks so fast and scary. So we see the Ginetta rejoining there, but that uh, the, the Abacar is definitely not happy. Hasn't even come into shot on the start of the straight. And it's really allowed Mulvin to get right up close. So best sector to catch someone. Hanky will be a little bit compromised by the stellar Audi GT4. This is a chance. You've just got to send it. So fake left, then back to the right. He's going to commit to the outside. I don't want to say never, but I've never seen that work. You might get a run, but then Hanky's got the inside already oh. covered for the last corner. So they're going to be level. All Hanky needs to do here is hit his brake mark and then just hold moving all the way around the outside, block the apex, stop a little run, unwind the lock, and he should be safe to live another day. Still very tight, but he's in front.
Uh, yes, will Malvern try and get up the inside into Redgate Corner? He's selling the dummy, he goes from the outside to the inside to the outside again. That was pretty uh, lively stuff. But you and Hanky, again, an experienced racer, both of them are actually, which is what's making this battle so entertaining to watch. Neither of them likely to make a mistake, so you're really going to have to work hard to outfox each other. And that's not something that Scott Malvern can do for the time being. Car number five, by the way, Lewis Proctor being given a drive through penalty. Haven't seen that car getting involved in any contact. So, uh, yes, we are getting confirmation now uh, it is for multiple track limits offenses they've got over their final warning and we're not even halfway through the hour so Lewis Proctor who was running in 12th place unfortunately will be in the pit lane soon yeah difficult so yeah rear left you called it right you're getting good at this Andy. I have to say <laughs> I need you on my strategy team so he'll be limping that back luckily at the moment the carcass of the tire is staying as one so it's not flailing and doing any more damage to the bodywork suspension brake lines and everything so he'll limp it round and actually a right hand at the last corner will be absolutely fine but he's taken up very carefully I almost feel he's a bit defeatist and he's going so slow to not create damage because he knows there's not a result on the card so clever thinking there from Richard really to, to preserve the car as best he can. Yeah, if he'd been in contention for the race lead at this point, then he, the, the temptation is to just put your foot down a bit more and get back to the pits, not to lose the time. But yeah, they were they were laps down anyway, uh, having had that penalty earlier on. And uh, yes, uh, they, they were on that slightly different pit cycle. Would have been nice to see how that would have played out. But of course, another delay now uh, will well and truly take them out of contention. So no repeat of the Donington heroics from 12 months ago for Team ABBA Racing. Uh, but they'll be back, I'm sure, next time to try and get back onto the top step of the podium. Now, Adam Carroll is in. This is interesting. So, Balf Motorsport bringing the uh, number 22 Audi in from sixth position there, Jeb. Yeah, definitely. So, they're obviously short fueled again. Uh, there's not a strategic time you'd want to pit now. So, hour and a half remaining. Sean Balf will climb aboard that car. And that should give, just working out. So, he's done 55 minutes, Adam Carroll. So, he should have another 35 minutes stint to go at the end. So, probably going to be looking at like a, obviously a 50 to 60 minute stint from from Sean Balfe potentially. Yes, and Sean, again, one of the quicker AMs out there. So as we start to now get more and more driver changes, he'll be uh, right back in contention. Out goes the uh, now Sam Neary driven car. I'd imagine they will have done a driver change there at Team Abba Racing. More traffic here for Ewan Hankey to deal with. And again, he's stuck here behind uh, Michael Igo. He's been following the WPI Lamborghini for a few laps. And Igo, again, uh, because he's going up the inside of the Paddock Motorsport McLaren, it leaves no route through uh, for Ewan Hankey. Look at the way Lewis Williamson, who was four seconds behind these two a few laps ago, is right back on their tail. So three of them together now for third place. And Michael Igo defending on the inside. There goes Scott Mulvan. That was a really late move. He gives a bit of a hip and shoulder to you and Hanke. They go side by side off the corner. Hanke out wide. Through goes the Porsche. And Lewis Williamson may gain the spot as well. He's going to try and crowd over to the inside line. Just about gets there in time. And Scott Mulvan into second place. Williamson third. That was really, really close to an aggressive move by Mulvan. A little bit a contact made at Goddard's corner and he goes through and brings Williamson with him. Amazing, it really changes the race now for him. He can get on the front foot and with clear air potentially once he gets past Igo. Let's see what times he can do. And Igo is already a lap down, but if he can hold these pros up, it does make Phil Keane's job a little bit more interesting later. So again, the dynamics so hard to call. Look how slow it feels as a pro getting held up by an arm. It literally feels like someone's doing 10 miles an hour through a 50. It's terrible. Malvin looking racy, I goes he's run wide there, so should get the run on him. Will Williamson be able to follow him through? I'm not sure. No, uh, not Dicey. after Cop is. He's going to look to the inside into the chicane, and I think he might well go through now, but that is really what triggered all of that, because Igo was defending from um, Ewan Hankey into Goddard, forced Hankey onto the outside line. Here comes Williamson. There's no gap up the middle. Surely there is. They're three wide as they put a lap on the Century BMW. Somehow Malvern hangs on. Williamson darts back to the inside, almost into the back of the Porsche. This is terrific racing and a great example of how the traffic, especially when it's another GT3 car, can come completely changed the dynamic of a battle and we've got Callum McLeod part of this as well now so what was a two-way fight for second now becomes a four-way brawl yeah, and this is the battle pack I was talking about earlier it's really collided quickly some nice circumstances around some really good racing I go actually pace looks good in that final sector hardly lost anything at all to the lead two in front of him Hanky having to defend hard from McLeod's going to be losing it in time and he's still got to get past Igo 
at some point as well. So there's a lot of things going on here and it's, it's hard to call who's got the pace, but I, I really do fancy that Porsche seems to be really good on its tyres as well. Uh, yes, had a bit of news just very quickly about the Motor Swan racing McLaren. They are out of the race. Remember, they uh, uh, sort of drove over the front of the Barwell car when Ballon had that spin earlier on. That punctured the radiator and a coolant leak means that they are out of the race. So thank you for Bryn Lucas for uh, digging that little bit of the of news out. Also, he says that Phil Keane will be getting into the WPI car with about an hour and 13 minutes to go. He will have to fuel save, therefore, that is well over an hour, so he might not be able to unlock the true Phil Keane performance, but he'll be in for an awfully long time at the end of the race. Yeah, and all I, I, I said about drivers having to save fuel, but the cars, as we see, a really dicey battle emerging here. Williamson seems to turn the heat up here for me. He looked quite docile and placid at the start of his stint. Maybe he was concentrating on looking after the tyres to give him this opportunity towards the end of the stint. But with the fuel saving element, the card will have a feature, all of them, where they can run a little bit leaner as well. So putting less fuel in the combustion chamber, not losing a little bit of power, but saving as we see the 76 car of Hankey bail for the pit. So that's one car at the battle for now, but getting that am in. And that potentially leaves you in more driving time at the end of the race. So although the pro's going to be in for a little bit less now, that means that they will have that little bit more at the end of the race. Almost exactly a one hour stint that for you and Hanky and a job well done. Held on to that second place brilliantly for most of his stint. And uh, Mia Fluitt we saw getting stuck in in her first stint earlier on as well. So this is a, a driver combination that I think could be a contender still for a good result come the end of the day. They may have lost a couple of places just before the pit stops, uh, but uh, they're still in it. We see the uh, Porsche in as well. So Scott Mulvern bringing that car in to hand over to Nick Jones. So two heavy hitters pitting at the same time. Yeah, really good. And actually that released Williamson, who then did a green sector one. So uh, it's interesting the pace of these cars. So at the moment, as we uh, see that battle still going on, or actually, of course, now it's Balf in the car. So James Dorlin is having to now watch Malikin in the Lamborghini and Balf now. So we've got exactly <laughs> the same cars with completely different drivers in having a very similar battle. Uh, yeah, at first glance, that confused me as well. But uh, yeah, you're right. The Audi has pitted, of course, for a second time, whereas the red line Lamborghini has only pitted uh, the once. Replay here of them going side by side and contact at Hollywood. Not a nice place to be banging doors there and quite easy to cut down a tyre with that sort of contact. Yeah, definitely. The thing that saved them both there, it was very wheel to wheel. So we didn't see a big discrepancy in the car getting turned around which is easily done there so elbows out from both of them hard but fair on on, on that one and um, yeah Malikin's really got some good pace there on, on Balf at the moment Balf looking back down to the inside as we see Nick Jones rejoining where's he gonna be on track he's gonna have a couple of GT3 cars and fours around him so you just want as a driver your outlap to be peaceful to calm find your references find your marks and go and at the moment he's got the complete opposite of that both of them back out onto the circuit. Roughly the same sort of gap between them. Maybe a slight uh, advantage to the Team Parker squad. Uh, no, their pit stop was actually a second slower. So there you go. What do I know? Uh, 76 team getting that car out very well. I was talking absolute nonsense just now, wasn't I, about um, the Balf and Malik in pair. They have both made their second stops. That was a genuine fight. Will Tregertha is in, in the Assetto Motorsport Bentley. This car's been uh, in and out a few times as well, but we're back inside the top 10, actually, just before they pitted this time. Yeah, I remember they pitted with two hours 32 to go to make it to the end on one compulsory. That's right. So they're nearly 10 minutes out on that fuel safe strategy. So they are going to have to do a splash and dash, but unfortunately the regulations don't really allow a splash and dash as soon as you introduce fuel to the car it becomes a long pit stop so that's going to be pretty much day dump for them in terms of getting a podium or even a top 10 I would kind of say on that one yeah that is a shame a circuit the Bentley has gone well out in the past and Assetto uh, once a few of the race by race entries were taken out of the result from Silverstone because they don't score points it meant Assetto actually scored the points for third place uh, at the Silverstone 500 so they also have therefore a 10 second success penalty to serve at their final pit stop there goes the uh, 32 of Alex Malikin, who looks quicker than Sean Balfe, doesn't he? He's getting away from him on this lap. That gap was a lot smaller uh, the last time we saw these two, a lap and a half ago. And uh, Alex Malikin makes his way through the final turn. I do still expect that red line car uh, to be a contender come the end of the day. And of course, now we've had Team Parker and 76 pitting as well. These are genuine gaps for position now, aren't they? Between the 66 car, the 76 car, the 32 and the 22, all on the same lap, all on the same strategy. Yeah, and it's now just trying to see where people got the AM in for their final stint, because the earlier the AM's in, that 
obviously means that the pro has got more time left at the end. So sometimes like you're seeing Malik in a little bit behind, say, Fluitt and Jones. But I think that Dorlin will have at least four laps extra still to go. So that's potentially seven or eight seconds they will then gain on the Ams having to do the extra time at the end of their stint. So it's super interesting uh, dynamic there. And I'm just even looking at Sandy Mitchell's now back up to fourth overall. We know they lost nearly 40 seconds when Ballon got turned around earlier by the IGO WPI car, but I think they're still kind of out of contention with that. I think that's just where pit stops have been made as we see Mir Fluitt and Nick Jones also resuming in a battle that we saw their pros having uh, not that long ago. Yeah, I thought Jones was getting away, but Mir has uh, hunted him down on this lap and is right in firing range now uh, as they head into the uh, braking zone at the Melbourne hairpin. Just had a, a penalty for track limits, by the way, applied to the Team Brit McLaren, uh, which had moved up into uh, third in GT4, as others have stopped, and it's just come into the pit lane now uh, to serve that stop-go penalty. On track, though, Team Parker Racing versus the 76 team. Uh, you can see where they got the idea for that name uh, from, can't you? They are the number 76 car, and uh, Ewan Hankey and Mia Fluitt have been racing together in the championship for a while now, uh, are uh, looking to try and get back ahead of this Team Parker Porsche. At the moment, it is the fight for seventh place, but of the cars that have made two pit stops already, they are actually uh, the second, uh, sorry, the third and fourth cars uh, of those that have done their, their second of three pit stops. And this is genuinely a fight for what should be something inside the top five. Yeah, definitely. And just starting to see the amp pace is a fair bit slower than we saw them from their first stint. So they're obviously be heavy on fuel again, but I really do think this track temperature is rising and it's potentially just causing the cars to go a little bit slow as we can see that gap really decreasing to the red line car Malikin. It's a shame for him. He has got that 15 second success penalty in his next and final pit stop from their podium at Silverstone. But he's kind of bringing Balf with him as well as we see Mia Fluid blasting past. That's a, a lovely move. She's down and gone. And then now she needs to get going and try and get a gap to that hard charging Lamborghini. And Alex Malik needs to capitalise on uh, Nick Jones being a little bit out of rhythm there, having been overtaken into the chicane, and that's exactly what Malikin does. Goes up the inside and takes over eighth position then, and I don't think it'll be long before Sean Balfe tries to move ahead of the Porsche as well. Nick Jones struggling to get up to speed a bit in this stint. Two places lost already, already and another car hot on his heels. Speaking of hot, you said the track temperature was rising. I checked it about 10 minutes ago. It was 27 degrees. Now it's 31.6 degrees. So that really is rising and not at all what we expected. So I do buy into that idea you had of the teams being uh, caught on the hop a little bit about how warm it is today. Yeah, and another thing to factor in this year, we have a new spec Pirelli tyre, the DHF spec. And again, just the information we have on that tyre is relatively limited. So teams will be having to take quite a big punt on pressures, cambers, everything that involves the tyre contact patch with the tyre. And uh, interesting to see that Barwell Lamborghini now where it's going to fall into the food chain. Now it's obviously got Adam Ballon back in the car. We see the leader bit pitting now. So both drivers, Morgan uh, Tilbrook with the orange helmet on the slightly further back position. Marcus then standing with him. I think it would have been a pretty simple handover in terms of car's good, mate. Get in, do the same job, please. Let's go. So let's just watch them. It's a great shot when you can see him stationary. It's so painful for the amount of time. Fuel going in. One of the hoses is the fuel itself. The other one is the breather. When the tank gets full, if they do decide to brim it, which I don't think they will actually with how long Morgan has to do, the breather actually lets the fuel back up so you know you're full. And we have seen Malikin get past fluid already in that lap. He is flying. Oh, yes, he is, isn't he? He's uh, head of uh, Malik, uh, head of uh, Fluid, as you say, so that now puts him into seventh position. He will come sixth now, though, with um, the Barwell team having pitted as well. So, yeah, really good stuff. You can see the Barwell car just at the back of this group. So we've got even more cars now uh, on top of each other as they make their way out of uh, the Goddard's hairpin, down towards Redgate, looks up the inside of the BMW, but uh, looks like he'll go through as well. So, coming towards the end, well, just uh, past halfway through the second hour of the race, I suppose, a three-hour race, and we're seeing lots of teams now making their second mandatory stop of the day, as uh, Nick Jones has a very close moment there with the Betty Chen BMW, and that almost cost him a position to Sean Balfe. Yes, three-hour race, three mandatory pit stops, many of the teams making their second of those mandatory pit stops now you can make those pit stops whenever you like but as you said neither driver can do more than 100 of the 180 minutes the minimum pit stop times are there as we've explained to make sure that uh, the pit stops are done as safely and efficiently as possible however 
once we get into the third and final pit stops of the race, you then have to serve your success penalties if you were on the podium last time at Silverstone. And that applies to these six cars, the Barber Lamborghini, the Redline Lamborghini, and the Assetto Bentley in GT3, the new Aston Martin, the, the Luger Porsche, and the Stella Motorsport Audi in GT4. Nick Jones there going up the inside of Betty Chen, not for position to put a lap on her, rattles over the curbs as a result, but actually it's the car behind of Sean Balfe that, Balfe that may lose out here. Adam Ballon up the inside, this is all for position. Exactly, and we've got all kicking off. We actually saw Nick Jones really clutter that curb there, a little bit worried, almost like the radiators on that Porsche. It was such a big hit up through the splitter, quite easy to crack something there. And yeah, Balfe has lost the position to Ballon, so interesting to see where Ballon's pace is at now. If he can get past Nick Jones, he's got some good clear air. It's whether he could actually get anywhere near Malakin, and for me, he's absolutely on fire. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see if, like you say, if he can get past the Porsche, what Ballon's pace is like. So. Uh, good effort this from Barbell actually to be back in this fight, having lost all of that time with the spin, as we said. So a uh, really good stint that went a little bit under the radar, did uh, Sandy Mitchell, but uh, some really good pace out there. And uh, that car right back in podium contention then. Uh, so to Nick Holstead, who is back into the Fox Motorsport McLaren. So lots of cars uh, which have uh, slipped down the order earlier on getting themselves back into contention. We're on board then with the Fox Motorsport McLaren. A huge battle going on ahead uh, and a really tough circuit to uh, wrap your head around as well. Uh, Joe, what's uh, what's Nick feeling at this point? Absolutely amazing. It's such a good view when you sat here. So let's have a ride round with Nick House. His last lap was really quick, actually, in the 29s, quicker than all the cars in front of him. Little uh, bit of trivia, this car's actually been signed by Lando Norris. You can just see it to the right-hand side of that timing screen. And on the brakes, into the chicanes, here we're talking about track limits. Don't hit the tyres, don't cut the track too much. Perfect there, get the run out. Maybe show your nose down to the inside here on Balfe. Perfect, you can hear me. On the brakes, not looking to overtake, looking to intimidate all the way down to first gear. Lots of steering lock, unwind the lap, full throttle, go. You see all the lights illuminating on the dash, traction control active, rev counter going berserk. You can actually see Balfe looking on Ballon now. Nick Jones still up there as well. Get it back in, similar to the previous corner, unwind the lock and off you go. Starting another lap. So it looked interesting to me, it looked like the McLaren's pretty strong on the brakes here. So let's check it into red gate. Fifth gear all the way down to third, on the brakes, roll it in. A little bit wide there, couldn't commit to the steering lock, so maybe the rear of the car was moving around a little bit, giving that sort of unnervy feeling for the driver. Plunging through craners, easy flat, don't lift Nick, easy flat, hook the kerb up on the left, drag it to the left on the brakes, all the way over to the right, hook the kerb up, and off we go. You can see really relaxed behind the wheel there, and in terms of the grip of his hands, it's always my cue to tell my co-driver to breathe if he's gripping on <laughs> for grim life you know that he's not particularly comfortable at that moment in time but cool to flick to the exterior shot as well now absolutely love it uh, now drama's wow. here for Assetto Motorsport then that is the uh, number three car and we think it has hit these tires oh yes oh. down at the chicane so um, uh, we have this debate frequently, it seems, uh, us motorsport folk, about putting tyre stacks on apexes of corners. They are there to stop you cutting the corner. We've seen through the second apex of the chicane, if you don't put tyres there, everyone cuts the corner. So, you know, it is a, an instant penalty, if you like, for hitting that tyre stack, and that's their race, very heavily compromised. Yeah, you've called it right as we flick back to this GT4 battle that seems to be going on for the last eight hours of this three-hour race that we've got this afternoon. And really interesting Ooh. that down the inside, that is a brilliant move the speed he carried there just about got it closed but then the Aston's then back down the inside should be able to fight back getting squeezed all the way up to the grass he backs out of it on the brakes and he's thinking I just want to survive another day really good racing top him in the Aston Martin Boxing smart is how I'd kind of defy that little battle we just saw unfold. What I like about this battle is that, as you say, they've been inseparable, these two cars, for the entire duration of the race. They both made their second pit stop. Remember, the Mustang, because it is a silver cup car, has to spend an extra 14 seconds in the pits at every single stop. Despite that, though, they're still tied together, uh, the Silver Cup car with the Pro-Am car, after each of their pit stops. So it's working. This is why we have that Silver Cup penalty. Some people think it's unfair, but it's so that it balances the two classes together and it gives us this racing uh, out on track. Couldn't agree more. I think they've got the 14 seconds bang yeah. on in the window round here for this race, and it's really 
allowing us to have an extra race that potentially we wouldn't enjoy. The interesting bit of that chicane, just going back to the Bentley, uh, it, one thing is the Bentley might not be allowed to continue. It looks a bit mad, Max. It's got an exposed front wheel, not particularly safe, but the amount of carbon there, to me, looks a similar level as we saw our safety car was called for. Potentially a bit better, it's off the racing line, but you think how much of that Bentley's missing, it's all in that chicane area. So. If we haven't seen the safety car now, I'm guessing we're not going to, unless that debris gets run over and broken up into even small bits. As we see this GT3 battle at the moment, they're all in the same, same order. Porsche of Jones, Ballin in the Lambo. Then we've got Balf in the Audi and Halstead in the McLaren, but they're all still tight together. So this, this is gonna rage on until they pit. Yeah, it's for fifth place at the moment. Lots of these drivers are pretty early into their stint at the moment, within the first 15, 20 minutes, certainly. So we anticipate they'll stay in uh, for a little bit longer. We're still waiting, by the way, for the top three to pit. So Lewis Williamson, Callum McLeod and Ulysse de Pau, uh, the three Mercedes AMGs at the front of the pack, all owing us a second pit stop. So they're choosing to go long with their pros now and shorten their final stint later on. That's interesting. See whether that's the right call in uh, an hour and a quarter's time, I suppose. Back on board with Nick Halstead and you've got the team Parker GT4 Porsche not exactly jumping out of the way. And Nick just didn't want to commit to that gap, did he? It's difficult there for both parties involved, I think. If Nick looked back at that one in particular, he probably shouldn't have shown the nose of the car to the left of the Porsche, because the Porsche thought that's where he was going, which then actually made him kind of defend into the right hand of McLean's, which meant he couldn't get par. So it was really difficult. The slower drivers are given a really easy task of just stay on your line. You do the best you can, don't deviate. The faster car has to get round you, and it works really, really well. When, when I've been in the GT3 against GT4, the good GT4 drivers actually flick an indicator on to the left or the right to elude which way they're going to go, and it makes your life a lot easier. Likewise, when I was in the GT4 class and our GT3s overtaking me, if I could get the indicator on and make it obvious, I would lose less time. So you can have a bit of a collective here and helping out. You then get the inter-team battles. That was a Team Parker GT4. I'm not saying it was dirty what he did, but he's going to help out a Team Porsche more than he's going to help out a non-teammate car. So it might look quite one-dimensional, but there are sort of hard and fast rules in place to allow this multi-class racing to happen as safely as possible. Exactly, and again, touch wood, we've seen remarkably little contact between GT3s and GT4s in this race, so they are clearly uh, abiding to that sort of unwritten code pretty well and allowing the battle to continue as close as ever out on circuit. Up through Starkey's, that part of the circuit on which we, uh, we rode on board with the McLaren a lap ago. And it now looks like maybe Nick Jones is just starting to settle in. I think it just took him a few laps to get into the rhythm. It's got to be difficult, that, Joe, as in meanwhile comes Callum McLeod for second place. So this was a pit stop uh, at 14.22. So that's about an hour and 10, 12 minutes or so that he did there. Pretty lengthy stint for Callum McLeod. So Callum uh, handing back over to Ian Loggy now then. And we're going to... Uh, see this car in the pit lane for quite some time. Uh, slightly slow lap here for Morgan Tilbrook a lap ago because he almost collects the Team Brit McLaren at the final corner. And again, he sort of half looked to the inside and didn't fully commit, did he? If he wasn't leading the race, he would have overtaken that car. That was one uh, of those, I've got a lot of pressure on me, don't mess up, don't mess up. Oh, I've just messed up. <laughs> and then it starts to unravel from there. Morgan's a smart guy, he's calm, he's just got to get back into that rhythm. But that was an easy second and a half, if not two second time loss there. So suddenly if you get 10 of them, the whole race is put on your head with the gap that Marcus and himself had kind of built up with the safety car and a mega stint from Clutton. So that uh, means that this car now enjoys a decent lead, about 27 seconds or so. Off wide goes Betty Chen uh, in the Century BMW. But this car number four, Lewis Williamson, uh, now in a very much uncontested lead. But again, does owe us this second pit stop and right on cue. In he comes. Wouldn't be at all surprised to see uh, Elise, Elise de Pau in uh, very shortly as well, as soon as Rammer done servicing the number six car. You can see the Neary's are back in as well in the team ABBA machine. Lewis Williamson in to hand over to James Cottingham, whose pace was really impressive uh, at the start of the race. So uh, looking forward to seeing A, how quick he is, and B, where these cars now filter in amongst those that have already made their second stop. As we see, a great battle here. Uh, what a day Jamie Day's having, to be fair. And down the inside of Topham. That, uh, our racing cars really found some pace, even compared to qualifying. It's done really well. So now his job is to try and catch that Mustang. Both silver-silver pairings in that one. So it's going to be a fair fight in terms of pit stop, but also weight added in the car. And he looks really, really racy. I think that car looks really well balanced and poised 
you just get a bit of a feeling when you watch it. If it's not doing anything stupid, not going in deep to the corner, the front end's good. If it's not tailing on exit, you know the rear's good. Pit stop finishing up there. A bit of gesticulation. So it looked like the door wasn't closed maybe quite as quick as they wanted. Fuel going on. You see both drivers behind the line just waiting for that to come off. All the team looking making sure the car's right. There's not a mark on that car. They've had a nice clean afternoon. As you go back to this GT3 battle, House did pass the GT4, the Luger Porsche. The engineer there, you see him just with the lollipop looking into the windscreen. He's not checking anything in particular. He'd just be probably looking at the pit stop timer. So he'll be able to see how long they've got to complete their stop before they'd be stopping for too long over minimum. And he'll just be telling that to the tyre guys. Guys, you've got plenty of time, 20 seconds. Then they'll drop the car, most probably with 10 seconds to go. So the tyres on on the cold tarmac, losing heat. The driver will fire up and pull away on zero, as long as the fast lane is clear. Uh, indeed, so pretty much picture perfect stuff there for uh, Two Seas Motorsport. That car that we briefly saw, Enduro Motorsport, have now gone back into the race lead as a result of this because both Williamson and DePaul pitted. So Williamson now hands over to James Cottingham. That car rumbles out of the pit lane and makes its way back towards Redgate Corner. And some 25, 30 seconds later, we should see that the uh, number 15 car come out. There, interestingly, is Loggy. So that gives you the gap between Cottingham in uh, what will be second place and Loggy in uh, third position down into the uh, old hairpin and of course it was a very very sizable margin uh, for 77 over number four before the pit stops but 77 have had Morgan Tilbrook in that car for a little bit longer remember Enduro Motorsport pitted 11 minutes earlier uh, than the uh, Mercedes AMGs that we've just seen head for the pit lane so that extra time for the pros means the lead gap should have come down slightly now yeah and I think the other thing there is that everyone has now done that stop together so if a safety yeah. car comes out it helps everybody the mercedes were going that little bit longer and at one point the three of them mercedes if they'd had a safety car yeah. that was day done for the podium would have been a mercedes lockout uh, so now we've got an interesting battle see that bentley still got good pace considering how much <laughs> it's uh, lost of its car yeah proper mad max vibes that and uh, you get a good view of the tire and how it's working not quite sure the aerodynamics uh, back up at crew where they designed that car <laughs> are going to be too happy if the pace is that fast. Uh, yes, uh, really going well though. And that's Mark Sansom as well, the AM driver in the car. So doing a particularly good job. Right, Morgan Tilbrook leads the way for Enduro Motorsport then. And uh, Morgan Tilbrook uh, has a lead of 30 seconds, would you believe, over James Cottingham. And that is a genuine lead now uh, because both of those cars are pitted. So actually the lead gap's gone up, I think, if anything, uh, over the last 10, 15 minutes or so. Ian Loggy then is third for Ram Racing. He is 4.3 seconds behind James Cottingham. So that's the gap second to third. Third to fourth then, Loggy to John Ferguson is 19, uh, sorry, 13.9 seconds. So three Mercedes AMGs, second, third, and fourth, but some separation between them. Alex Malikin comes across the line uh, in fifth place now for Redline Racing in the Lamborghini, 5.8 seconds behind Ferguson, and eight and a half seconds ahead of Mia Fluitt in the 76 McLaren. And that is where that big battle pack now finds itself. Sixth, seventh, eight, nine, Fluitt, Ballon, Balf Jones. On your screen now, and there is damage to the Audi look, bit of bodywork rubbing on the left rear tire. And Nick Jones has lost two places on this lap, so something has happened, I guess, in the final sector. Yeah, the Audi's missing what we kind of call the legality panel behind that rear left. So it's definitely been taking a, a hit. You can see the tire a lot more clearly on the left and the right. So a little bit of aerodynamics. Hard to, big slide from Houston there on the exit of the old hairpin. Hard to see what's actually rubbing. It looks quite high in the wheel arch. There is a wheel arch liner in that Audi. It's made of carbon, so it's not going to disintegrate, but it, hopefully it just wears out and it's fine. It looks less smoky. So Ballon down the inside of Jones. Balf then tucks into the inside. It all looks okay at the moment. Don't see much contact. Oh, Whoa. wow. Interesting. Ugh, hard from that angle. Ballon looked like he closed the door on Jones. There wasn't really anywhere to go. And then you got a front right versus a rear left. And that was the trajectory of the Porsche going up in the air. The Porsche's done well to have no damage. That was a big old hit. More carbon fibre on the circuit. Uh, I don't think the Porsche has any damage. I 
I missed where the Balf car picked up the damage, in all honesty. I was too preoccupied with the acrobatics of the, the Porsche. Well, it certainly didn't pick it up in that bit of contact, but as we left that shot, it was going to the outside of those two, going into this corner, Goddard. So if it was on the outside, had two cars on the inside, that would make sense as to some contact being on the left rear corner. The good news for Sean Balf is that that tyre smoke seems to have disappeared now, so the bodywork that was rubbing on the tyre has fallen off or been worn away enough uh, that that no longer is an issue. So that is good news. You can see a little bit of it flapping around in the wind, uh, but that shouldn't be too much of an issue. This was uh, Nick Hulstead's view. Uh, we're going to see the little bit of contact here between Nick Jones and Adam Ballon. There, first of all, up into the air goes the Porsche. And now there to the outside goes Balf. He tries to go in the middle of the pair of them, and Nick Jones isn't expecting it. That is where the contact came from. I mean, that was ambitious from Balf to try and uh, thread the needle between the two of them. And fair, fair play to Nick Jones there. Not really much he could have done at that point. No, he definitely couldn't have backed out of it any quicker no. than he did. So I think Balf was the aggressor in that one has kind of paid the bigger price. So. Again, if we're looking race steward-wise, probably race and incident, nothing else needs to be done on that one. It was still just a strange one. The first bit when Balf, uh, sorry, Ballon and Jones got together, that Porsche is built pretty strong, to be fair. They were two really, really big hits, and I can't see a mark on it. No, no, exactly, and it went in the air and dropped down onto the ground, which won't have done the suspension much good either. Uh, but yeah, Nick Jones still going well, lost a couple of places, but he's keeping Holstead at bay as they both go up the inside of the Melbourne hairpin. Won't be the most shocking piece of news you hear all day when I tell you that those incident, incidents, plural, are being investigated. So the bits of contact between, uh, first of all, 66 and 72, and I'm sure the bit of contact uh, at the uh, hairpin will also be investigated, but uh, we'll let you know if we get a penalty. Also, the driver stint time for car 26, that's Paddock Motorsports McLaren, under investigation. Joe made the point earlier on that this now is a glorified test session for them, so they may have chosen to leave one driver in a bit longer maybe than they should have done knowing that it wasn't really going to hurt them if they got a penalty uh, but that should be a fairly easy one to calculate surely yeah it sometimes can be a, a legitimate mistake in terms of the driver id switch not getting turned around so when the driver change happens in the car you're either driver one or number two in their british gt race and if that's not been flicked then maybe race control have got one driver in the whole time uh, and it could be as simple as that but yeah to be honest the, the penalty for a driver's stint at the end of the race is exclusion i don't know what happens mid-race in terms of it going over it's a, a complete new one to me luckily i guess for us it's not going to change the big result at the front of that field but yeah a, an oddity to say the least indeed it is right there jamie day chasing down marco signoretti here this is for the lead in the gt4 category the gap stands at one and a half seconds and you can see uh, not on the most recent lap but on the two before that a decent chunk of time uh, being taken out of the ford mustang ahead again two silver graded drivers so this is a genuine battle and matt topham is still within four seconds of jamie day so again really strong pace this from topham to keep that car in contention but bear in mind the third place aston martin will have 20 seconds to serve in the pit stop in its final pit stop as that success penalty for winning at Silverstone so it could well be bear in mind the two Silvers have 14 seconds to serve anyway they're the three cars in contention really aren't they Academy are racing and even with their 20 second success penalty Newbridge Motorsport yeah uh, that Mustang is gonna be sick to death of a GT4 Aston by <laughs> the end of the day I think it'll be the first time we've seen the R racing come up against the Mustang today it's always been that top of Turner Aston so far but yeah it's gonna be interesting the good news is is at least the academy car knows the strengths and weaknesses of the Aston different team but will have very similar traits in this regard to how it generates its lap time just over an hour left then in round number four of the intelligent money british gt championship and this is how tight it is for the lead in gt4 gt3 being dominated by morgan tilbrook oh why did i say that drive through penalty for our racing uh, the curse of the commentator is strong today, isn't it, at Donington Park? And the car that is second place in GT4 is being given a drive-through penalty for exceeding track limits. Uh, it changes to what a day now, doesn't it, for Jamie Day? 40 seconds left as well of this hour before they got reset, so really got unlucky. We're also getting the 22 car of a drive-through penalty. So that's the Balf car. It's saying track limit, so I don't think there's anything to do with the contact that was under investigation. It's just a simple track limits one. Again, that is really tough, really tough. Um, and we cut to Loggy there. That BMW we said earlier, it's so hard to overtake a slower car when it's in the same category. And the timing screen's saying that Loggy did a 36 
on his last lap. And for reference, Cosim did a 29. So we're looking at a six second time loss and he's still behind it. And you'll see that BMW generates its lap time by pure waft. And by that, I mean power. Look at it go. Loggy's lost time coming out of there. And when you consider six seconds lost, he should be past that car almost as easy as a GT4 in some regards. And it's interesting to see when we see the car, it looks fine under braking. He's just got to regroup. He would have lost all his rhythm. That's the hard bit for him now. But if he's not past Betty in the next probably four corners, that's day done for a race win for McLeod. He, he won't be able to recover from that. No, absolutely. He's caught back up to Betty now. Might be able to get up the inside into Goddard's head. There's GT4 traffic on the horizon as well. Just to make life even more difficult. Loggy looks to the inside but can't get there. Uh, Betty Chen is three laps down here. Uh, you can see the way that this is losing loggy time to the number 15 car. This is third and fourth, remember, with uh, John Ferguson in that number 15. Not a million miles behind him is Alex Maliakin. So third, fourth and fifth getting themselves together here. Courtesy of the fact that a car that is three laps down is not getting out of the way of a lead lap car. Ah, it has got out of the way of the lead lap car because Betty Chen comes into the pit lane. Thank goodness, says Ian Loggy. Yeah, I think he would have paid a lot of money to get that <laughs> car to pit. So we'll check the back transfer history between Loggy and Century <laughs> Motorsport on that one. But that is going to hurt him because even his last lap was a 34. So you're looking in the, the time loss area of 10 seconds. And like we say, the pros are tenths apart. So for McLeod to recover that deficit against Lewis Williamson in the Merck in front, or even to kind of cover himself from the 15 car of uh, Ferguson in it now doing great, but Ulysses de Pau, that's, it's going to be really difficult. That's going to hurt. That's literally like putting salt in a very open wound. Uh, car, a team manager of car 66 to race control now. That's Team Parker Racing. So the Porsche that we can see directly ahead here as we ride on board with uh, Nick Halstead uh, is potentially about to receive a penalty. You don't normally get someone to race control to be told you're not getting a penalty. Uh, so we'll wait uh, for official confirmation, but this, I'm guessing, is for at least one of the bits of contact we saw in that third sector a few laps ago. Yeah, I alluded to us not having VAR in a football style earlier, but obviously we have so many camera angles yeah. able to use. So race control will use that CCTV on boards, even the TV pictures in some instances to review the situation. So they would have been called up and the officials will basically present a case against them. Unfortunately, it's never for you. And they will go, this is why we're acting on this. You've got a chance to argue it. My sort of favorite go-to argument is like, please, can we just look after the race and have some more evidence uh, and data presented? But normally they know I'm lying and I don't get granted that. So <laughs> let's see, Nick Halstead is on the back of the 66. The team probably haven't told Nick Jones in that 66 portion as an investigation. There's no point adding stress onto the driver's shoulders. Just let him crack on with the job and it will be what it will be penalty-wise. Yeah, well, let's hope not because it's been a decent race for Team Parker and Scott Mulvin's speed earlier on was pretty impressive. They could still get themselves uh, into the top five come the end of the race, although they've dropped nearly 10 seconds, actually, uh, to Adam Ballon ahead, and Ballon has dropped 10 seconds to Mia Fluitt, who's also dropped 10 to Alex Malikin. So the whole group that were right together, some real disparity, actually, in lap times. I mean, you've got, well, Malikin on the last lap in traffic did a 31, but then uh, anything between a low to mid-28 to a mid-1 minute 31 in that group of cars and that's just allowing the gaps to spread themselves out ever so slightly up the hill again Nick Halstead here struggling to get close enough to the Porsche to uh, have a go into McLean's corner and this is exactly the kind of corner where running in that dirty air you will just start to feel it it's just a quick enough corner McLean's uh, and if you start losing that downforce the nose starts to wander and then that means you're not close enough going into the parts of the circuit where you can pass exactly it's, it's excruciatingly painful and like I've said again, the dirty air just really affects the front of these cars, especially. It's so hard to follow for an extended period of time. And that really makes it even more important to act fast. That was close coming out of the pit lane for a split second, but all good. Uh, and what I find really interesting, suddenly the pace is light, lighting up our timing screens again. It will be the fuel coming off for of these AMs. But without sounding like an obsessive weatherman, Michael Fish vibes, the sun has gone in. And I think the track temp's gone down again. So another nightmare for the teams, potentially their last stint, the pros coming up shortly. Where do they go tyre pressure wise? If the sun comes back out, they'd be too high. If the sun stays in, they might be too low. It's almost like you know what you're talking about. It's gone down by two degrees in the last 10 minutes or so, the track temperature. It's crazy to think that two degrees would they make that much difference, but this is how sensitive uh, these cars, and in particular the tyres, can be uh, to track temperatures. John Ferguson here, we've been documenting the way that he's been catching Ian Loggy. Now, of course, the big loss of time on lap 77, that was the last lap that Loggy was stuck behind Betty Chen. 
but lap 78 he wasn't and lap 79 he wasn't either and still the gap is coming down so John Ferguson uh, remember in his first season of GT3 racing having raced the GT4 Toyota a year ago uh, is really getting quicker with every race and this car is catching the third place Mercedes yeah and Ian Loggy is one of the benchmark apps yeah. so for them to be in sister cars so you know the setup's going to be pretty similar and the equipment levels too this is a really good job by Ferguson I'm really impressive it's the best I've seen him drive by quite some margin as well and you, you never know maybe Ulysses de Pau's come in with a bit of a fresh idea how to coach John and can unlock that pace and even in the race he might have been able to help him with a few things but let's see what Loggy can do he's obviously got a little bit of GT4 traffic now but Ferguson looks quick as well the body language of the car looks strong this could be quite an interesting uh, race unfolding here as well two tenth place finishes the best that that 15 car has managed so far this season one at Alton Park one at Silverstone the race in between that as it really bottoms out uh, through the uh, crater curves there the race in between that that second race at Alton was the one at which Jamie Caroline crashed uh, at the top of Clay Hill remember when the heavens opened so uh, yeah they've, they've not had this pace most definitely and uh, nice to see them running at the moment consistently and strong deep into the race. Jamie Day, uh, by the way, has been in to serve the penalty and now in to serve the third pit stop. Yes, this is the final pit stop for this car. OK, interesting. And it's just that drive-through kills it for them again. It's going to be difficult for them to recover. Just going back to that Mercedes, oh, cutting through there, that was a, a big closing speed there, especially when you consider that's Tilbrook, the AM, against Jones, another AM. What's Jones going to do here? And he made his intentions clear by cutting the nose off the front of that McLaren. And, Tilbrook's pace had been really good again. He got into a nice rhythm. He's got, obviously got a 30 second gap, so the risk levels need to be low. The problem is here, because he's the leader, none of these cars want to go a lap down. If they go a lap down and the safety car were to come out, they're out of the race. So you kind of get this really awkward unsportsmanship. And I do it myself, so I'm not taking any liberties in what I'm saying about these guys. You need to defend to give yourself that lifeline of it. And th this is really hemorrhaging time and I actually think Nick Jones was trying to help there and Halstead's now on the front foot and now he looks racy so that was an interesting move by all of them I think Nick Jones was almost actually caught in two minds of what do I do the team's telling me to defend but I know it's not morally the right thing to do and I think in trying to do the right thing he cost himself because he almost had to stop going into the chicane and that allowed Holstead through so Holstead into eighth position now then uh, as uh, Tilbrook puts a lap on them and off off I'm so goes sorry. John Ferguson. What is going on? Off at the old hairpin, and the number 15 car, which had been going so well, has hit drama. Now, thankfully, it hasn't hit anything else. I don't think it made the barriers. That's just a high-speed spin at the old hairpin, and this, Joe, is how he did it. Yeah, and the lap before, he looked nervous, and I was actually going to comment how much Kirby used, and you can just see the car bottoms out there. We saw exactly the same with Cottingham. See you later, Pirelli sign. Good advertising <laughs> for them. And it just bottoms out, and it takes all of the grip away from the tires because they're in the air and weirdly they're not wireless or bluetooth yet so they don't connect any grip but the energy in the car i can remember at school there's always that one kid who pulled your chair away as you're about to sit down it feels like that when you hit the curb it goes all the way from the base of your spine into your eyeballs and they want to fall out so not only does it hurt but he has just lost about 10 seconds and now he's lost a place to Malikin. So suddenly that commentator's curse of him being on the front foot catching Loggy has now lost him a position. So all I can do is apologize on that front. Right, well, I've got to be careful who we talk about next, haven't we, really? Then John Ferguson, that is a shame. Not out of it by any means. They did have a good gap over the bulk of the rest of the, uh, the GT3 field. But as you said, Alex Malikin moves into fourth position now uh, in the Red Lion Racing Lamborghini. Uh, into Red Gate he goes then. And I reckon uh, John might just give that curve a, a bit of a wider berth. This this time down at the old hairpin uh, it seems to always get more severe with every year that curb it never used to uh, really present much of an issue but uh, for whatever reason maybe it's been reprofiled now it is quite a bump when they hit it and John yep yeah, it goes so wide that he almost missed the apex so as to stay away from the curb I can't say I blame him yeah exactly and I think it's also interesting to see this one here so we had the two C cars leading before the pit stops they both did a pit stop and came out and that 20 second deficit up between the Enduro 343 in the pits and 403. I think it was them just getting stuck. The pit yeah. lane was so busy. Enduro have lucked in here and they're the end pit garage. So they have free space. Whereas two C's, they're that little bit further up in the middle. And I think they just probably had 20 seconds of getting the car on the skates, getting it to the fuel rig, getting it back down on the floor before they could start fueling. And that's what we've seen. 
However, the gap is 32 seconds. So you would say the Enduro car has been 12 seconds or so faster with its driving, be it traffic or pure pace. But it is a really interesting one to see, and you can kind of work out the minimum pit stop time of 1 minute 50. If you've done two pit stops, the quickest you could have done it is 3 minutes 40. So you're seeing Enduro and Ramp three, four seconds over. They've really hit their marks on that one quite well. Makes sense, really, because Enduro were fastest in both of the qualifying sessions yesterday, both for the AM and Pro drivers. In the AM session, they were about a tenth and a half quicker than TUC's Motorsport. That was Tilbrook versus Cottingham. But Marcus Clutton then went about three tenths faster than Lewis Williamson did in the Pro session. Now, if you can take two, three tenths a lap out of someone over a stint that might be 20 or 30 laps or more, that will add up over time, then throw in maybe a bit of good fortune for you or bad fortune for them in traffic. And it's quite easy to see how you can uh, get these uh, quite big gaps developing, especially when a team is operating as well uh, as Enduro Motorsport are at the moment. They've clearly got that sweet spot here at Donington Park where they won at the end of last year. Uh, and now here they are dominating once again. They know though, perhaps better than any other team, how these things can slip from your hands in the last hour of the race and uh, in a way having this big lead gives them more time to think about all of the inventive ways they could uh, throw this away and uh, I'm sure will be on Morgan's mind. Definitely so. And he, he seems to have been quite lucky in just traffic. Every time yeah. we cut to him, it looks quite clear. We obviously saw that one bit at the last corner where he lost a load of time, but he got straight back to it as we go back on board with the Mustang. And it feels like the first time today we haven't got an Aston Martin either a yard in front or a yard behind. Sounded like a fair bit of wheel spin out of the previous hairpin. Can't work out if it's just the note of the engine or it is lighting it up as we see Malikin box for his final pit stop unfortunately for that team they do have that success penalty from the last race so that's going to really put them down the order 15 seconds probably going to be worth two or three spaces you would have thought going to drop them into that sort of fluid ballon period just behind him, two spots behind. Although, of course, the Barbell car of Adam Ballon has 20 seconds to serve, so that will go in the favour uh, of Redline, a five-second shorter pit stop in theory. But yes, they'll lose at least one place uh, once all is uh, said and done here, I'd imagine. It is the final pit stop then for Redline Racing. The third stop is where you serve any success penalties that you have to serve. And so once the minimum pit stop time of 110 seconds has elapsed, they'll sit there for another 15 seconds in that case uh, to uh, make sure that they and conform to the pit stop regulations. So Malikin then in from fourth position, the first of the front runners to come in and make that third and final uh, pit stop. And uh, wait to see where he comes out. The other GT3 car, by the way, that has success penalty to serve has just gone through shot. That was the uh, Assetto Motorsport Bentley. This car does not have a success penalty to serve. It has the lead of the class. Uh, Marco Signoretti driving really, really well here. Marco, uh, who is in his first season of racing in British GT, he's done a bit of racing over in Canada in Nissan Micras, of all things, and uh, has really managed to adapt well to the GT car over the last year or so that he's been driving uh, in GT cars. Matt Topham, in his second season of British GT racing, uh, what a, a fantastic driver he has become, Matt Topham. A bronze-graded driver, but knocking on the door, surely, uh, being a silver-graded driver at the speed that he's got. He's six and a half seconds off the race lead, and he is four and a half or so ahead of Will Burns in third position. Interesting season, this, for Will Burns. New teammate this year, but Will and Century Motorsport could not stop winning last year. They won three races, two of those coming uh, in the first half of the season. This time around, though, it's been all about consistency, hasn't it? Yeah, really difficult, I think. When you come off a year like that, it's almost like, what can we do to improve? Because you don't know where the yardstick is. And I think some new teams have come in. We've got some new cars in GT4 as well. And I think it's just up the ante even more. We, we really used to look at GT4 as the second class. It was slower, it was newer. There weren't as many manufacturers. But I just know from a, a personal perspective at McLaren how much emphasis we put on GT4. We have a new car coming out next year in development. And it is literally going to be the new GT3 class GT4. The cars are getting faster and faster, they're getting sexy and sexy, and the racing is so good, we definitely should never overlook the GT4 category, and that's just why we're seeing it getting more and more competitive, I think. And there's not much not to like. I mean, the cars still look and sound amazing. They're still the cars that uh, most kids 
Mercedes will have posters of on their bedroom walls, aren't they? Aston Martins and uh, Mercedes and McLarens and whatnot. And, uh, and the racing is better in a way because you don't have that aerodynamic issue that we've spoken about a few times with the GT3 cars. That was uh, almost a braking issue there for Adam Ballon, who having been nerfed into a spin himself at that corner in this race, I'm sure would not have been keen to do the same thing to Mia Fluent. They are fighting over fifth position at the moment. Ballon looks quicker, but again, can't quite get the overlap in the right part of the track to make the move. He's pushing hard. The previous hair in the set of 11s, we see Mia box yeah. and get out of his way. So kind of lucky he didn't get held up anymore and lucky he didn't put a risky move on. That would have been pretty pointless, but Ballon's pushing on hard. You would imagine he's in his last two or three laps of the stint. The way he's taking the tire out of that corner is not going to have much rubber left on that if he lasts long. See Mia stop on the lollipop of the 76 team. Door open, driver out. The uh, the hard bit sometimes closing the door is the window net can get closer. So that's why it's not super quick. You're just taking your time, making sure everything's there. As we see the Mustang, that's not a DRS rear <laughs> wing. That is one of the quirks of how you refuel that car. The fuel nozzles for the car are actually inside of the boot. So it's a flick of the boot, open it up, and then you go. You see that fuel pouring in. I need one of them for my road car. I <laughs> hate filling my car up. It is completely pointless and just so much wasted time. But uh, they're going to get back in the race pretty quickly. Yeah, and I've never, I've not noticed that before. Actually, all the pit stops I've seen in British GT, just how quickly that fuel gets uh, pumped into the car. That's remarkable. Uh, right, fuel done at the 76 team. So now tire change and driver change happen at the same time. You cannot touch the car whilst you're um, refueling it. But uh, once the um, Fueling is done, then driver change and tyre change can happen at the same time. That's just another safety feature to keep the, the pit crews away from the car uh, whilst the fuel is going in. Yes, yeah, it's, it's difficult to explain. Even now I'm out of the car. If you said, oh, if you did your driver change as quickly as you could, what would you do? I would now I'd say I'd do my belts up and drive off. In the heat of the moment, I'd get in the car, close the door, drive off, and I'd do my belts on my outlap. And that is unfortunately how racing used to be at the start of my GT career. And without saying the obvious, it was pretty dangerous. So that introduction of a minimum pit stop time, just introduce safety, and it's fair. If everybody's doing the same minimum time, then it's a fairer fight out on track. So sometimes it looks a little bit slow and not as racy as F1, where they've got a million people changing two tyres on a canoe driving around a tax haven <laughs> principality, for example. But it still allows the racing to be proper. Actually, the Mustang rolling forward there, just a the slight gradient of the pit lane. The driver probably was looking down at something on the dash and didn't realise he was moving until the lollipop tapped him on the windscreen. Yes, that uh, shouldn't be a major issue there. They managed to uh, get his attention. Matt Cowley, that is, getting into the uh, Academy for Mustang that was leading the class. And, uh, uh, of course, with our racing having that penalty they had to serve earlier on, this does now rather make this an Academy versus Newbridge battle. Academy were, what, six seconds or so ahead of Newbridge when they made that stop. And Newbridge's final pit stop will be about six or seven seconds longer than the Mustangs was. So it should be this car that leads the class. Uh, once the pit stop, uh, third and final pit stop cycle is done, the question will be, what is the gap? And can Darren Turner overcome that deficit? I mean, you wouldn't bet against it, would you? If you put Darren Turner in within 10 seconds or so of the class leader, he's got every chance of doing it. Yeah, the, the, the stint time remaining is decreasing at an alarming rate. Suddenly I've looked up and we've only got 42 yes. minutes gone. Last half an hour has really evaporated on us. So yeah, it's going to be difficult. Uh, now they've got the extra weight as well in that new bridge car. They don't have that advantage in so many ways, especially towards the end of the race, that 25 kilos extra that basically they've been given because of Toppen's pace. It's just going to be working everything hard. And Donington is the hardest track we visit as British GT on break. So the wear, the temperatures, everything are high. And extra weight only means negatives, extra energy in the car that you've got to stop every single time you're on the brakes. Uh, yeah, exactly. A tough place. And most of that, I guess, in that final sector, because it is such a big stop, especially down into this next corner at the Melbourne hairpin, uh, because you carry so much speed out of the chicane, and then it's downhill as well. There is the new bridge car, so Matt Topham staying out now. They'll want to get Darren in as soon as they possibly can, as he almost runs out of road there through uh, Starkey's and Schwantz, trying to get out of uh, Ewan Hankey's way. Yeah, they'll want to get Darren in as soon as they possibly can, but of course, they've got to make sure he's not exceeding uh, that maximum drive time of 100 minutes. So Darren turns and will be waiting uh, with bated breath to jump into this car and it will have to serve that 20 second success penalty 
uh, in the pit stops as well. But for now, relatively clean air and uh, Matt Topham's pace. I mean, this is the great thing about having a quick app. You can be that bit more flexible, especially in GT4 where there aren't as many pro drivers racing. You can be a bit more flexible with your strategy. It's not such a mad rush to get the am out of the car. Yeah, it keeps it open so you can go that bit longer and potentially get a bit lucky with safety cars as we see. A new battle sort of emerging now with Dorlin back in the car against Halstead. It's going to be interesting once uh, they get Rob Bell back in that car with Halstead, how that's going to be. But Dorlin really is hustling that car. He's, he's, he's really, he's the, he's the highest placed pro that's already in the car. So he's going to be able to go, but every lap he's behind Halstead, he will be getting held up there. And uh, a slightly interesting dynamic. Nick Halstead's usual teammate, Jamie Stanley, is actually not doing this race because of his brother's wedding. So, I mean, I don't like anyone that much to miss a <laughs> British GT race. Not even my wife, I would have missed my own wedding. But it's going to be hard for him watching this at home with Dorlin all over the back of Halstead. And Dorlin's really trying to force the issue, but doesn't seem to have a particularly easy answer. Halstead's placing that car really well. A little bit wide there, potentially Dorlin can pick the throttle up, get the nose. It's going to be hard. It's not a big brake zone up here into Coppice. Gets the inside. Ooh. Halstead fought that pretty hard all the way. Millimetres between their wing mirrors. All clean, though. And now Dorlin can unlock that pace. He needs to get going. He needs to be starting to maximise his extra stint. I think he might be able to get down into the low 27s, which would be really, really quick. Considering that extra pit stop penalty, they're really up there. Uh, yeah, and that's why Halstead was defending that, because with the success penalty for the red line car, it is possible that these two cars might be fighting for position come the end of the race, because Halstead has put in uh, this pretty impressive stint uh, into the pit lane. That's Paddock Motorsport, I think, isn't it? They had an issue uh, in warm-up early on today when the left rear suspension collapsed towards the end of the session, but they got it fixed fairly quickly, got the car out there. We haven't seen a lot of it, but Kelvin Fletcher was running seventh at the time he stopped, and just behind comes the fifth-placed car, so Adam Ballon in here, to hand over to Sandy Mitchell and 20 extra painful seconds have to be spent in the pits for that car uh, because of their race victory last time out at Silverstone. So expect that to uh, cost them fairly significantly as well. And that's another car, of course, that uh, Fox Motorsport could leapfrog ahead on once this uh, cycle stops this dump. Yeah, pit lane looks quite quiet at the moment. Obviously, two cars in. I can see the Team Parker car controller from their GT4 car and the stop board, I think, for their GT3 car out. But it doesn't look like anyone's going to be stopping in the next few laps. So, Tilbrook, Costner, Loggy, Ferguson. We've seen Ballon just pit. Halstead. Still have quite a few AMs in the cars. So, potentially going to have a two or three laps with these guys before all the pros are in for the mad dash to the checkered flag. Yeah, and this is, again, one of the interesting things about these three-hour races because it's very rare that we get to see the pros and the ams sharing the track because they tend to have their own uh, set stints within the shorter races, the one and two hour races, whereas the three hours, again, a lot more free to do what you want with the strategy. Down off the jacks goes the Barwell Lamborghini, uh, which had that terrific victory. Only just won at Silverstone, of course, over the Garage 59 uh, McLaren, which was a race by race entry, but a brilliant, brilliant battle it was at the end of that race at Silverstone. They're not going to be in contention to win this one, it would seem, but again, it's these races where things aren't quite going to plan. They had the spin, they've got the success penalty. The points you can take out of a day like this are the points that will end up winning you championships. Yeah, definitely. And you see that on track. Great camera shot there of the red line Lambo getting well past the Barwell Lambo, which is still stationary. So that is really all the points you just raised typified their day. But for championships, you just need to pick those points. You need to bring them in when the sun isn't shining in this instance. And at the end of the season, that's the point or two that you might need. See the Barwell car pull away. That Bentley's shredding a little bit more bodywork, a bit more on its left-hand side. Looks like probably the side skirt is being affected by all the extra air that's being pushed through it. That's a fairly big bit as we see that's going to be... Oh no! What was that about? That was Sandy Mitchell turning into the corner as... A safety car. I think so. That car is buried in the gravel at Redgate and it's very close to the edge of the road. I mean, fresh out of the pits, the, the first thing you do, surely, as a driver, is look in your mirrors to see who is there. But of course, he's fighting that number 66 car now in the hands of Scott Mulvan for position and he didn't want to let Scott through. He either didn't know Scott was there or he was super aggressive. Mulvin's obviously fully up to speed. Inside, commits early, it's not a lunge. Unless he's got some magic potion to make a Porsche just disappear. There's the easier way, the great on board here from the two C's car. Have a look. Mulvin's there, he can't go any more right. He's even still on the brakes trying to avoid contact. 
Mulvey can't do anything, and he shouldn't have to, in his opinion. If I was in Scott's position in that Porsche, I'm there, mate. Where do you want me to go? It's all on you. Uh, and look at it. We just said day done after all he needs to do is recover championship yeah. points. The commentator's curse is unbelievably <laughs> strong. He's beached for sure, and it's even in a really bad position where I don't think they'll recover him to where they'll let him go. Be a live snatch. It's, it's difficult. That is quick to do under a local yellow, in my opinion. I've seen them do it before here at Donington there, I have to say, even when it's right on the edge of the road. So they are going to try and get it moved on the yellows, which is better in a way for the race, because this, again, would have been a really bad time for a safety car, because some have pitted and some haven't uh, for the final time. Uh, but, yes. I have uh, to disagree. Look at the safety of the, the car, the marshal, and the JCB. Uh, for me, that's just too much risk. Uh, you couldn't pay me enough money to stand there. The, the jobs the marshals do is incredible. The bravery they show is through the roof, but... Uh, for me, a, a safety car there. Uh, hopefully, we get away from it, and I and I nothing happens, and it's all fine. But I, be, I don't think they'll let that restart personally. The way they're going to drag it out, I'm not sure he could even get back to the track like we saw with the Ginetta earlier, was what I'm kind of getting to. Uh, there is a, an access point just to the left into Redgate Corner, which is actually where that uh, uh, the telehandler uh, parks when it's uh, not being used. They could just release him onto that bit of tarmac and send him on his way. We don't know if there is any damage to the uh, right-hand side of that car, of course, so that may well uh, make that decision for them. I think, it he's, is, uh, it. I think he's getting pulled to that little tar tarmac apron. Yeah there and that is going to really allow them potentially to recover some points that maybe on another day they wouldn't we actually are seeing a black and orange flag as well for the bentley so that has to pit now to get recovered as we see the race leader boxing for its final scheduled pit stop uh and it all looks to be going pretty smoothly right now yeah morgan tilbrook will get out marcus clutton will get in once the fuel has gone into the car uh that incident by the way uh between team parker and uh, barwell is being investigated no huge surprise there and none of this really concerns enduro motorsport they were the last time i checked 33 seconds ahead of the rest of the pack this is a significant pit stop though in gt4 this is newbridge motorsport plugging in darren turner uh for the final 34 minutes of the race we anticipate this car will come out i reckon 10 to 12 seconds maybe behind the academy ford mustang someone's been off at coppice haven't they in the background uh, but yeah that's going to be an imp important stop for sure yeah obviously they've got their success penalty from yeah. silverstone of 20 seconds so then that silver silver one is actually only is six seconds faster than yes. their pit stop so it's actually a really interesting dynamic the bentley making its way back out still missing a lot of bodywork but obviously the scrutineer would have been next to that car making sure it was safe to rejoin and fit to do so uh, and you can see it had new tires because you can see the stickers on the tires rotating <laughs> as it went past us uh, indeed right on board with matt cowley then into the final corner when uh, does darren turner get released the, the last time just before the academy car pitted it was about six or seven seconds ahead of this car and as you said it's pit stop will be six or seven seconds uh, faster so there it goes it goes past the aston martin it will be a big gap this don't get me wrong but darren turner uh, should in theory be a little bit quicker than matt cowley so there goes the overall race leader that is marcus clutton back into the race not a single one of the car in the distance but that's the wpi car which is uh, some way out of contention and there the gap to some of the other gt3 cars that are still awaiting their pit stop and still, Darren Turner sits in the pit lane, so I think my calculations were off there. It's not 10 or 12 seconds. It could be almost double that. Yeah, it's interesting. Now he goes, you see Cottingham in the second place car, obviously now in the lead of the race. The gap is so hard to visualise that because he owes us an extra pit stop. He should be somewhere in the region of 30 seconds behind that Enduro McLaren. So I think the race for the lead is going to be pretty much off unless something happens. But all the way from second to sixth, I think it's going to be really, really interesting to see how it unfolds. Will Burns is in as well in the Century Motorsport BMW that had just taken over uh, the uh, GT4 class lead. So that car will be in and that will then give the lead back to Matt Cowley, I think, in the Ford Mustang. Those top three within the class uh, all pitting. And they've all been pretty much in the top three or four all day long as well. Doesn't seem to matter what the pit strategy is. Those have been the three cars along with the R Racing car, uh, which have found their way to the top of the GT4 pile. There goes uh, Ian Loggy. He is into second place on the road now. And again, we've got these three Mercedes AMGs going longer than everybody else. Cottingham, Loggy, and Ferguson. We saw the same for their pro uh, counterparts earlier on. And again, the team's now just back timing this, working out what is the earliest uh, point at which we can bring these cars in, get the driver change done, and get our quicker drivers out on track. But I anticipate it will be another few laps. Yeah, and obviously we talk about the maximum being 100 minutes. And 
just for clarity on how that's measured, that's from when the driver leaves the pit lane, his starts and the end of the race where the clock stops, not if they have an extra lap. So we're seeing the enduro car. I really want to hear from Morgan Tilbrook on how he's done today. What's he saying there, Bryn? Sorry, Andy. Uh, yes, we are going to head down there. We are going to head down there to have a word with uh, Morgan Tilbrook. Uh, he's down there with Bryn. Well, Morgan, it went for plan for you, didn't it, really? I mean, you're some 30-odd seconds ahead at the moment, but you got out of the car and said to me you are a bit concerned about the sheer amount of debris out on track and the tyres. Yeah, for sure. There's, a, there's a lot, been a lot of contact out there, especially the chicane, but also some other corners. So some driving around some debris, and I've seen there's been a few punches, near ease and, and another car, so just trying to, trying to avoid that debris to make sure we can bring the car home. So just need, just need a clean, clean, clean 20 laps now. Or... Safety car. <laughs> <laughs> or a safety car, but you know, we, we only used one set of tyres in FP, FP1, FP2. So he started today in a really good place of tyres. So Marcus is on brand new now. So 20 laps of brand new tyres, fueled for, fueled for so many laps. I, I back him to stay in front with a safety car. Um, I'm more worried about track limits, debris, gravel, but you know, so it'd be a great way to bounce back from Silverstone if we can win this. So just drive around, avoid the debris, and don't have a safety car, and then it's fine, right? And then spray like champagne. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> See. Brilliant. Cheers, guys. We've said a lot about uh, Morgan Tilbrook uh, over this race and indeed over the last season and a half or so. When you consider that his very first appearance in British GT was when he crashed on the warm up lap in his first race at Brands Hatch at the start of last year. Uh, and now here he is, uh, perhaps on course for his second victory in the championship. But one of the most dominant performances we've seen for quite some time. I don't want to put the mockers on him with nearly half an hour still to go. But up to this point, flawless performance from this team. Yeah, you would only maybe criticise his start in terms of losing the lead at Turn 1, but it was pretty well calculated. It wasn't like he was conservative. It was actually a really good job by this car we're seeing and this driver, James Cottingham. But apart from that, as you said, flawless. James, again, hasn't really put a foot wrong. Neither of the team, neither of the teammate Lewis Williamson. I think it was just getting caught in the pits under that first safety car. Maybe they could have waited a lap longer. We saw that seem to pan out for a few teams quite positively, but hard to say. Uh, yeah, it can't be long until we get the pros back in and we see what we've got to deal with. But yeah, if I was a betting man, which I am, I'd say that gap's going to be about 36, 37 seconds to the lead enduro car. The last time I checked, it was about 33. So yeah, I'd agree with that because of course they've got their quicker driver in now as well uh, in Marcus Clutter. None of those uh, leading GT3 cars have any success penalties to serve, by the way. So these gaps should be uh, pretty uh, genuine. Marcus Clutter, by the way, new fastest lap of the race as he comes through, does a 126.309 and sets a new lap record uh, in uh, here at uh, Donington Park on the Grand Prix circuit as well. But yes, um, no success penalties for the top four or five or so. The first car that did have success time to be added on was James Dawlin's number 32 car. But of course, he is now lapping a lot quicker than the AMs that are staying out on track. So that car is not out of the podium battle yet, the uh, red line car. No, definitely. We cut to it. We've seen it a lot on track today. And that is the other car that's potentially in the, um, in the top sort of three, yeah. I think. This is the battle four, is the Hankey 76 McLaren that he shares with Mir Fluit. See it diving into the chicane, getting tight. Oh, that debut on the outside. It looks like a bit of a war zone over there. The pace looks pretty matched, doesn't it, between more, um, sorry, Dorlin and Hanke. Tenth of second, the last lap. Looked like McLaren gained a little bit. So hard in a big break zone. Always Constantine is up. As we see the Ram car, Loggy getting out, taking a seat insert with him. Callum McLaren closing the door, back behind the line start that pit stop procedure so that's going to be a that's going to be a lovely feeling for mcleod that should be a short fill so normally to fill the car 85 90 kilos of fuel 40 seconds they only need half of that so this fuel should be quite short doesn't mean they'll be out the pits quicker but it does mean they'll only have 40 50 kilos of fuel in that car just trying to have a look at those tires see if they're new pirellis they have a sticker on them and that's why the americans call them stickers <laughs> and it just means that you've got another two or three laps of extra pace to burn on anyone that doesn't have a set of stickers uh, yes and again the teams will plan this from the very start of the weekend when they use their fresh tires to try and keep a pair uh, or a set i should say uh, for the end of the race looks like the tire change at the front have been done they're just starting on the rears i'm not sure they are stickers are they i think they've been used but but minimally yeah probably scrub so yeah they've probably either done a few laps in practice or qualifying so they'll still be fresh but this new Pirelli DHF, the first two laps especially, are ballistic fast. You're looking at like eight, eight tenths to a second faster on those first two laps, which for qualifying is obvious. But if you 
are managed to save a set for the race, suddenly you're given a bit of a leg up of a second and a half to two seconds. It must be tempting though when you feel all of that grip underneath you to start really pushing hard and take too much out of the tyres. Uh, there is a big dive up the inside from Ewan Hankey on James Dawlin. This is for genuine position and could end up being for a podium place once all is said and done. We're waiting still uh, for a few more to pit ahead, but in the next few laps, we'll have a clearer idea of what position exactly these two are in. Well, one thing we know for sure is they're absolutely together on track and Hankey oh, looks quicker. I think uh, McLeod's just got the jump here. Well, like we saw earlier in Malvern and Sandy, though, the cars on track are already up to temperature in a rhythm. So to me, McLeod's got a second and a half or two to Dorlin and Hankey. But this first sector, two sectors for McLeod, he just needs to get straight on it. And that's where if he had those new tyres, yeah. his life would have been a bit easier. I'm with you. I don't think they were new, uh, but it's hard to say. You even go back to if Hanky hadn't put that move on Dorlin, they probably both lost three or four tenths on the previous lap on that. This is going to be a mega battle, and I'm trying to think who I want to be the most here at this situation. McLeod's got track position, Dorlin looks the fastest, but then Hanky has caught Dorlin, so he's obviously got some pace as well. It's pretty tight to say. McLeod is a pretty punchy driver, so he would not be easy to get past, so I think I'm choosing Cal McLeod. Right, OK, I think I'll probably agree with you. I would make an argument for you and Hankey being the raciest here, though, because he set that car's fastest lap of the race, the number 76 car, about six laps ago. Dorlin has not yet gone as quickly in this stint as he did earlier in the race. So at the moment, Dorlin not extracting the maximum potential out of that car, whereas you and Hankey is going as quickly as that car has been all day long. So uh, at the right time of the race, they've got that McLaren working well. Yeah, we had a really nice instance of Darren Turner in that GT4 Aston doing that indicator thing. I said about into the chicane, which let McLeod get through easier. He didn't indicate into the hairpin because he didn't really want Dorlin or Hanky to go. And that's why they all lost a bit of time. That's that flow and that cooperative nature you need between the drivers in the multi-class system. And uh, then we cut back to Clutton there. So it's interesting to just see how they've all gone there. And it really shows you the advantage Clutton's got. He's close to lapping those cars we're talking about, about potential podium. It is great, incredible, isn't it, the pace that they've had, and it's just been relentless. You can see the uh, two Cs and Ram Racing Mercedes coming out of the pits, so that means that now uh, everyone within the GT3 ranks have made their final pit stop of the day. All success penalties have been served, and at the end of the next lap, we'll get a proper look at what the gaps are between them all. Clutton has gone through already. We know that he will lead the race, uh, but what is that gap going to be? Yeah, you can see a bit of mark. I said it was unmarked earlier, the two Cs Mercedes, that front left. That is the perfect height of that tire wall at the chicane. So they've obviously been nibbling it. They're lucky to get away with that. It's a stack of tires with a conveyor belt around it. But even though it's not filled with concrete, it is so heavy. You're looking at 16 tires, so a good mass of 10 kilos or so. So you're clipping that as we see this car leave. And it looks like it's in pretty clear space in terms of competition. The Greystone GT3 car there isn't for position. So we keep looking back. Neither's the Bentley missing half of its front end. That's the next car holding the final podium position. So first and second maybe look a little bit set, but this podium position is definitely up for grabs with the three GT3 cars that are currently in shot mixed up with all those GT4s. <laughs> exactly. This is not going to be a straightforward final 23 minutes uh, of racing here, is it? Marcus Glutton then goes through onto his 102nd lap of the race. As I said, just a shade over 20 minutes left in this fourth round of the championship. Look how dirty it is offline uh, down through the crater curves. Callum McLeod, though, is now starting to eke out an advantage over Dorlin and Hankey. So as they continue to battle for fourth, the third place car starts to build a bit more of a margin. Up the hill they go. There is the black lamp of James Dorlin behind the black, red and blue McLaren of Ewan Hankey getting held up a bit by the team Brit McLaren. But that is going to be the fight, I think, for fourth place. And the more they battle, the further ahead McLeod will get. Yeah, just sort of flick of the windscreen wiper from Dorlin's car. I assume that was by error because I can't believe there's any rain out there. Over the commentary box here, it's only blue skies, so should be absolutely fine. As we see this GT4 battle lighting up, Collard with an amazing pace at the end of the straight there. Sweet pass the GT4 McLaren through the chicane. Track limit starting to get a bit looser again. We're still getting warnings. The Collard car's actually okay at the moment, so hopefully the race director misses that one. Dives down the hill, brings it in. The, the thing I like about this Supra, it's so high, but generates so much roll and grip. It's quite a nice car to watch. You can physically see where it generates a grip as it goes on the brakes, the front dives down, then the loaded corner, that front right, sits down. And as it gets on the throttle, it goes. As you then cut nicely, 
to uh, clutch and coming through. Everyone's flashing their headlights now. No one really cares about being friends this late in the race. Clutton coming through and off he goes. And uh, it's pretty rare in a, a race, especially a British GT one, that you get such a commanding lead. And Marcus is a switched on guy. He's actually uh, not just a driver for the team. He does a huge amount of behind the scenes work. So he, uh, he understands the effort that goes into it. But he will be able just to sit back and relax a little bit. And that just means with all of these traffic cars that he's having to get past, he's not having to turn up the risk. So interesting, we cut back to the, the GT4 uh, Aston, obviously, he was well up there. So um, it's interesting to see where he's gonna be in the mix, just trying to work at it. We go uh, for a replay, see the front left brake. Wow, that is dramatic. And you see it coming out the front, that's just linked to the brake duct so that's where normally the air's going in and it should be absolutely uh operating temperature but that's got to be hard and the nature of donington park the hardest bit of the brakes is sector three which is where you are just before you stop into the uh into the pits and you have to sit there with no airflow so that long pit stop then for newbridge uh costing them a huge amount of time uh, obviously they had uh, the uh, 22nd penalty and off again goes the Janetta. That is, uh, who's in that car now? Should be Freddie again, shouldn't it, I think? Uh, no, Joe Wheeler again, sorry. Joe Wheeler back in the Assetto car. He's gone off the old hairpin and looks to me like he has stalled. Here's how he did it. Just loose on exit, no oh. curb, really late. He almost looked like a slight bit of a failure on yeah. the rear left with how quickly it snapped. Trying to, can't see the tire, but the, the velocity it went round at either uh, it's not moving smoothly is it so it's either suspension or tire it looks tire, tire doesn't it the, yeah. the rim protrudes more than the tire which is never a good sign yeah it was the way it snapped it was a bit sideways and then it just let go which normally tells you something's broken and the tire does appear uh, to be off the rim the good news is though that he has uh, got the car fired up and can at least get it out of a, a really dangerous position and hopefully limp it back to the pit lane but this is now just another obstacle for everyone else to negotiate he's got over half the lap to go yet to get pat to the pit lane and if this is the speed he's going it's going to take him quite some time to get back so uh, uh, a mobile chicane quite literally here for the others to try and avoid and i'm sure that uh, he'll be doing a, a, the best job he can to stay off the racing line and uh, try and make himself uh, as little of a nuisance as he possibly can but that's uh, an unfortunate uh, way to bookend the race for that team they went off in the first part of the race another off here inside the last 20 minutes uh, and a track of which the janetta really seems to be at home all weekend yeah, it was doing really well, wasn't it? It'd be interesting that failure is almost the highest load the rear left would be at. It's so hard. And you do always have this balancing act of performance with a tyre. So they sometimes perform to a lower pressure, but unfortunately the lower pressure doesn't give the tyre much support in its structure. And you can actually end up damaging that and it can be a puncher. Likewise with camber, sometimes the more camber you run, the quicker you go, but the smaller your contact patches of the tyre, so you end up overworking it. So maybe just a few reasons what could have happened there, but yeah, he's got a long way to go. Just hope the teams are on the radio to the drivers, letting them know slow car turn six. And it's gonna take probably two and a half racing laps of normal speed for that car to get back to the pits. Yeah, because it was absolutely crawling up the hill, wasn't it? Right, this is the fight for eighth place within GT3, the Audi of Adam Carroll, the Porsche of Scott Mulvern, and actually only a second further back, the orange McLaren, look there, of Rob Bell. So three of them together, eight, ninth and ten. Uh, they are all of them about five seconds behind Ulysse de Pau, who is in seventh position. And uh, Freddie Tomlinson, uh, I believe, has just confirmed to bring what we hypothesised, which is that the puncture caused the spin rather than the other way round. And we kind of saw it let go, didn't we, uh, on the Janetta at the old head. But yeah, quite a battle pack we've got here. Audi, Porsche and McLaren all together. And it's the Audi of Adam Carroll, who yet again has a defensive job to do heading into the final part of the race. It might not be for a race win this time, uh, but Adam Carroll uh, knows how important it is to score points here. Remember, that car, uh, that team, uh, Carroll and Balf, came in into the weekend joint championship leaders along with the number six uh, of Ian Loggy. while Loggy's car is running third crucial here that Carroll hangs on to this eighth place it really is and it's going to be punch we saw a great one of the best defensive driving I've seen in a long time at Alton Park he did a absolute super job there for so so long against Sean Gunnar so we see moving big fast and putting some good moves out there so it's hard one to call at the moment the Porsche just seems to last so well over the end of this stint 
I mean, we haven't really seen the Audi enough for me to say it's good or bad, but I know the Porsche is strong. Rob Bell as well is not too far away, so if there was a potential conflict and clash between those two, that Rob Bell would only be too happy to sweep up the pieces. Uh, you're right about the Porsche being strong, not just its pace, but the front end of that Porsche is pretty indestructible. It's had three pretty solid whacks on the front of the Porsche, hasn't it? One with the Barwell Lamborghini, uh, one with the Balfaudi, actually, at the final hair, but and then again with the uh, number 72 Lamborghini at uh, Redgate Corner earlier on. Incidentally, you can see that Barwell car is back out there. Number 72 is four laps down, so they were allowed to carry on in the race, uh, but they are well out outside of the points scoring positions, at least within the overall uh, GT3 ranks. They are 10th of the Pro-Am, so they'd score one and a half points towards their Pro-Am campaign, uh, but that is not at all what they hope to take out of the day. But uh, yeah, Porsche, uh, it seems that it's uh, hard to kill. Yeah, very, very strong uh, little tank, that thing. And looks like struggling a little bit of understeer in the mid-corner. You just saw how much lock it had on, and the front end wasn't going in the same sort of geometry that you'd hope it would be. So. Maybe the fronts are starting to hurt a little, little bit. It might have lost a bit of air over all that contact. Just looking at the timing screens, the lead gap from first Marcus Clutton to second Williamson is nearly a minute. Wow. It really iterates how dominating they've been today. It's uh, probably one of the most dominating performances I can remember in a long time in British GT. We'll have to get the uh, record books out and see what exactly is the largest win we, we've ever had, but that's definitely going to be up there. And his pace is still strong, 27-1 the last lap for Clutton. The rest of the pros next best is a 27.5 and the rest are all in the high 27. So really, really impressive. Back in GT4 meanwhile, this is the fight for third position and it is that our racing uh, Aston Martin of Josh Miller just about keeping uh, Jordan Collard at bay down into the old hairpin they go and Collard a bit quicker through the right-hander closes in on the Aston Martin and uh, slightly strange line taken there by Miller. It uh, looks odd through the left-handers but it gives him the inside line into the right-hander at McLean. You sacrifice speed up the to get the inside line for the next corner but look at that collard right round the outside you can tell his dad was a touring car race winner because he is not afraid to go round the uh, high wide handsome line of mclean's and uh, coppice corner but look at the way they're being caught by seb hopkins this is third fourth and now fifth in gt4 under a blanket exactly and as you said he just saw jordan glance right into his rear view mirror and i think he would have gone wow that portion <laughs> came up and that will put the pressure on him to get past his aston even quicker oh. good cutback that should be job done there fully alongside already before he on the brakes. Hopkins looking to make it three wide. He should be looking to the inside of Collard, really. He can make this really punchy collar again. It's stopped. You see the Aston out his side window, and off he goes. He's almost let the Porsche come through with him, and they're going to battle into the last corner. That should give Collard a little bit of a gap, a couple of tenths, potentially, if they're fighting. We're going on board now behind Collard, so you're getting all views of it open up the lock and the Aston does stay in second place but really really good racing that yeah fantastic stuff there so up into third in class then goes Collard uh, Miller fourth and now can Hopkins go around the outside of him at Redgate he's late on the brakes in the Porsche uh, but the Aston Martin gives him the hip and shoulder on the apex almost more contact on the exit of the corner and now they've got the GT3 paddock motorsport McLaren to factor into all of this as well Martin Plowman sensibly decides to sit back and let this play out they're still side by side out through the dirt goes the Aston and and somehow manages to find the grip into the old hairpin to hang on to the place. But now on the exit, the Porsche gets the run again and Martin Blauman still can't get through. And this rolls reverse. Miller's now on the other side, so the other that way defended so well. So it should be job done here for the Porsche of Hopkins. How much room is he going to give him on the outside? That much. Forces him to the ground trap. Good boy. I like fair racing, but I also want to see racers do what they're meant to do the outside is no place to be on a corner like that so he was eased out and he was given the option drive through the gravel hit me or lift off the throttle and he went for the latter one quite sensibly so again you can see Collard how quickly a battling pack of cars loses time Collard looks like he's got a couple of seconds up the road on Hopkins and it'll be interesting now to see Hopkins in clear air what pace has he got Yes, uh, absolutely. It is just such a momentum trap, Donington, isn't it? As soon as you start running side by side, it really, really affects your pace. Uh, this whole group, by the way, has Darren Turner closing in as well. Turner for the podium in GT4 is definitely on the cards. He runs seventh in class at the moment, but he was only two seconds behind Matty Graham at the start of the lap, who was four seconds behind that group we were just watching. So uh, definitely some more positions to be had here for Darren Turner in that new Justin Martin. 
despite the slow pit stop earlier on. Just under 12 minutes to go then in the race, and Marcus Clutton weaves his way through the chicane. His lap times are in the mid 1 minute 27s, which is quite a bit slower than he's capable of going, but still actually quicker than pretty much everybody else out on track. He's got a 59.2 second cushion uh, on a lap that is only 1 minute and 27, so he's put the vast majority of the GT3 field a lap down. And look, as he comes to the end of the lap, Lewis Williamson hasn't long started his 108th lap. Williamson is 90. 19 seconds ahead of McLeod and Dorlin, 3.7 seconds behind him and not catching. So McLeod seems to have that third place uh, in hand for now. Yeah, and I think obviously we don't want to see such a dominating victory. We want to see action, but it does show you when you get the car in a window how it performs. And I can only really sometimes relate negatively when the car is <laughs> out of the window. It feels like you have an infinite amount of setup changes to able to get the car better. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But on the flip side, when the car's in the window, you literally aren't changing anything. And I think that's what Enduro have done well this weekend. They've come with a fast car and they've just been able to refine it, get it that little bit faster and give the time to the drivers and just being able to pound round and get the lap time out of them. And it's really, really shown. Like I said, I think they've absolutely dominated. And uh, I don't think anyone else is driving badly. I haven't seen a, a car in the top 10, especially for GT3 handling poorly they all look quite well poised maybe a little bit of understeer for the porsche like i said earlier but if i can go on with mcleod and that car's not hanging around we've got lots of fast drivers the exit looked good there but when you think of that gap it's absolutely unreal it's interesting as well because enduro uh, they didn't really show their pace in practice they were near the front in FP1, but once you combined the practice times, they were only about sixth or seventh fastest. It was only when we got into qualifying, they were able to pull out two really, really good efforts. And then their race pace, which I guess is what they've really been working on in those practice sessions, has just been phenomenal. And, you know, you might be able to stick it on pole position by a tenth or so, but if you've then got three, four, five tenths a lap in hand over the rest of the field, then the race is going to be very, very uh, much in your hands. And that has been the case for them. They have just been relentlessly quick and the race setup they've got on that car is working perfectly. Yeah, and practices are always difficult because you don't know the tyre life. So the older the tyre gets, the slower it goes. And with the rules of British GT, you carry over used tyres from a previous race. And I'm led to believe they didn't run any new tyres in practice, which has allowed them to save them even more for the race. Oh. As we see the Bentley carrying on through the uh, the grass and the detritus. I'm interested if they made the gravel there. car looks uh, quite good this side. So uh, if they're going to try and sell it off the race, maybe only use pictures from its right-hand side, I think. Crabbing heavily, actually, on the rear left. Ooh. That's a strange place to lose it. To me, when we just cut away from the first shot, the rear left of that Bentley looked to be towing out. Like I said earlier on the uh, the Ballon car after it got hit, that just means the rear of the car can be really loose because the outside tyre wants to go where it's pointing. So when that car came past us, if we do get a chance to see the rear left, even the rear right looked to be moving around. There could be some kind of legacy damage from hitting that tyre stack on the rear of the car uh, there as well, potentially. Yeah, it's a shame that. Uh, high hopes for that team this weekend, but they're going to struggle to make it anywhere near the top dozen or so now. Eight and a quarter minutes to go. And here is Darren Turner. So this is what we need to be watching, really. Darren Turner currently runs seventh in GT4. That is Matty Graham ahead of him uh, in the uh, Porsche, the number 51 Veluga Racing Porsche. And uh, that certainly is a position up for grabs for Turner. Matty Graham is then two and a half seconds behind Josh Miller, who is less than two seconds behind Hopkins, who is less than a second and a half behind Colin. So that's third, fourth, fifth and sixth places, all just tantalisingly close uh, to Darren Turner. He's got limited time to do it. I don't think he'll get all of them, but I think one or two more places before the flag is a possibility. Yeah, it's really a what if there, isn't it? The extra 20 seconds they lost. They had the 20 second penalty from Silverstone, but the extra 20 seconds of that sort of break fire we saw. And it's always hard as a team. They all look back at it and kind of work out what they can do different. Like, yes, the car's on fire, but did we actually have to lose 20 seconds? And yeah. sometimes you are better to bolt the tire on and get the car going, get the airflow back through it. It's always a bit weird sending a car that's on fire away from you, but actually safety gets away from the fuel rig as well. But uh, yeah, that really could have been a what if, I guess. There goes the Team Abba car, the uh, 
wonder the six ram racing machine up the inside as well but yes this uh, is uh, a really close battle and i wonder whether those points that appear to be going begging here for newbridge uh, may they may live to regret that later on in the season nothing they can do about it now they've just got to try and recover the situation as best they can I'm really impressed with uh, our racing today i think this is the best showing we've seen uh, from that aston martin outfit uh, so far this season and at the moment they run um fifth position in gt4 but again they are uh, capable here of uh, maybe gaining one more before the flag down for the old hair but all oh, the aston just kicks out a little bit of turning oversteer there as he pushes on to uh, try uh, and uh, chase down this number 51 Fluga racing car ahead. Through will go James Dorlin in the fourth place Lamborghini. You and Hanky still right on his tail, isn't he? Hanky just hasn't oh, quite been able to find a way through, and that won't have helped. No, definitely not. And it's it stayed pretty close, and uh, it's interesting to see where these cars are getting their strengths and weaknesses. I, I thought earlier the McLaren seemed good on the brakes, but we haven't really seen that. And, again, you just see that sometimes the luck. Hanky there is the last two GT4 cars have hurt him and help Dorlin, obviously, out of camera. It might have been the other way around on, on some others, but suddenly now he's got to dig deep and try and find that half a second. He's probably been compromised. And you really see the cars diving down on the brakes there. And when we sort of spoke about that brake fire, it might seem like that's a problem, but it is literally just physics. There's so much energy created around here on the brakes. Can you really sort of allude to it? Like if you're driving on the road and suddenly you need to do an emergency stop and the modern car now, the hazard lights go on, which aren't particularly helpful because you're like, I don't want everyone to know I'm about to have a crash. But that is how it feels. Every single brake zone on this lap and you're doing that nine times a lap and around here, the brakes just don't have a chance to cool. And that energy has to go somewhere. And in that point, it's got to uh, literally melting point and caught fire. And uh, yeah, again, we just see that. When you see Cotton there, and yet Hanky and Dorlin, who aren't far away from a podium in fourth place, it uh, really is a good illustration. And it might be a bit awkward what Cotton does here. What yeah. I'm trying to think what I would do if I was Cotton with four just under five minutes remaining. I think I'll just sit behind Hanky and just kind of sit there happy as Larry. There's no way he's going to lose a minute as we see Morgan trying to smile as best he can. Jeff, the number one mechanic there in enduro looking like a bank robber but they will be absolutely overwhelmed if they can stroke this home for the last well it's going to be three laps at the end of this yeah there is no need to take the risk in trying to lap that group but uh, marcus is one of those drivers who will keep on pushing right to the end of the race i'm sure and uh, if he feels he can get past them he may well go for it yeah five cars on the lead lap at the end of the race that is quite remarkable and it may even come down to three or four by the end if he does get past these two shout out to the sixth place car by the way wpi motorsport phil Keane, michael I go after their uh, couple of incidents early on in the race. Sixth position, again, a good point scoring day. It's not much to write home about, but sixth place is worth a good handful of points, and uh, they are very much targeting the championship this season, and uh, that is the kind of result they need to be digging out. Seventh place is the uh, number 15 Ram racing car. That's also had a solid day uh, through the middle part of the race. That car was as low down as 12th or 13th, so uh, good effort here from uh, Easter Powell and John Ferguson to get well into top 10 contention, as we do, as Joe said, wind down into the final few laps of this fourth round of the Intelligent Money British GT Championship and still plenty of positions of significance up for grabs. Yeah, definitely. And I think the interesting point, the WPI Keen car that you, you raised there, they're almost like the best of the rest. They're the first one. Oh, from, ooh, a problem. RJN car stopped on the right. That normally isn't a problem as in a crash. That's probably a, a failure of some sort. Oh, that's going to give Hanky a good chance here. He's got it done. So we had a lot going on there to me as we cut to it, it looked like probably Dorlin had tried to lunge the BMW and then had to go in deep maybe to not make contact and Hanky's got him. Now the fight's the other way round. What's Dorling got to respond with? And look who's behind him, <laughs> who doesn't want anything going on, is Clutton. So I think it'd be interesting to see a replay. Like I said, I think that GT4 Century BMW was just wrong place, wrong time for Dorlin. And Hanky being that second further back, because he got compromised by traffic the lap earlier, it was perfect. So down the inside, oh. he actually could see he would force onto the grass. So the BMW had already committed to turning in, forcing Dorlin up on the grass, losing efficiency on the brakes, and Hanky was able just to sweep past. So it'd be uh, interesting for that first non-podium position.
Yeah, that is such a shame, isn't it, then? Because uh, he's driven so well, James Dawlin, up till that point. The BMW that he went past, by the way, the number 90 car, Jack Brown at the wheel, second in GT4. His lap times are not very good. He's been into the mid 1 minute 39 for the last couple of laps, when he should really be in the low 37s, high 36s. Uh, and it means that he's now only five seconds ahead of Collard in third place. But he might just be stroking at home, uh, knowing that we only have a couple of laps to go. Uh, it will, yes, be two laps to go this one and one more then because there Marcus Clutton goes uh, into the old uh, out of the old head I should say up through Starkey's corner and uh, when he comes through at the end of this lap there should be less than a lap time left on the clock which means we're looking at what 117 laps the distance yep and we cut back to the GT4 race leader there of, of the Mustang and that was the car I was told was going to be the winner this weekend by its team owner Matt Nickel Jones. Um, so hopefully they can just stroke it home too. And we've seen a great race of that car with quite a few other GT4s around it, and it's really come up as you see all of these guys bunched up together at this final throw. And uh, it's just now trying to make sure you get home without having a silly accident. Everyone's getting tired. Cars are worn out. They're not going to be quite as sharp as they were three hours ago. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, this is, remember, as well as a GT3 battle, also the GT4 fighters. Darren Turner hasn't actually been able to get himself past uh, Matty Graham as of yet, and he's running out of time to do so. It probably means that the Josh Miller R Racing car is off the hook as well. That's the first of the GT4 Astons. And there you can see Turner's chances of getting past Graham not helped by the fact that Team Parker Porsche uh, of uh, Scott Mulvin is coming through to put a lap on him. Has a bit of a moment out of the uh, hairpin and a yellow flag. There, the RJM McLaren's actually got restarted and ah. now stopped on the exit of that corner. So not quite made it back to the pits with 30 seconds to go. I think we'll just finish this race under a, a local yellow. I think the car was quite well off to the side of the track, so it can just stay there and should be absolutely fine. But uh, yeah, this GT4 battle almost looks like it wants another 10, 15 minutes to really pan out and let them have a, a fight as we cut back to that car of uh, Enduro. Morgan Tilbrook started it. Marcus Clutton's going to finish it. And uh, yeah, like you said earlier, I don't think they've had a single drama in this race. Yeah, and in a race where a lot of other potential race winners did have dramas earlier on, uh, this car has just plodded around there. It's been the fastest car. It's not had any issues. They've not made any mistakes. No mechanical misfortune. And just as they did uh, at the end of last year, it looks like Enduro Motorsport are going to be victorious here at Donington Park. In fact, the GT4 race also looks like it'll be won by the same team which won here at the end of last year. Clever, yes, clever move. smart stuff there from Clutton. You can't overtake on the yellow flags, even if it's a lapped car. The last thing he wanted was a penalty with two corners to go for overtaking on the yellows. He backed out. He's got over a minute in hand. He can push the car home from here. Enduro Motorsport are going to get their second ever victory in the Intelligent Money British GT Championship and once again it comes at Donington Park Marcus Clutton and Morgan Tilbrook the dominant Donington victors what a performance and right behind look at that almost like it was staged the Academy Motorsport Ford Mustang comes through as well Marco Signoretti gets his first ever British GT race victory Matt Cowley back on the top step of the podium again and uh, it's funny if you'd have asked me at the start of the weekend Joe to predict the winners in both classes I'd have probably picked those two cars simply because they're our most recent uh, Donington winners and they've continued their form into this season yeah it's funny how sometimes the obvious ones <laughs> yeah. are the right ones and I think again it just goes down to raw pace and that risk versus reward when you've got that much pace in hand you can just chill out that little bit and you see it other way where maybe say the WPI car of I go lack that little pace so they had to put a move on Ballon which then gets them a 10 second stop and go and that's why they're probably off the podium today so this is the second place cars that gap is so big it's given us a chance to do the full debrief <laughs> of the race and they've done nothing wrong apart yeah. from getting stuck in the pits I think and losing that 20 seconds and then that really put them on the on the back foot but brilliant performance by all of those guys I think yeah great effort from James Cottingham that move to get the lead at the start which unfortunately because of the timing of the safety car and a slow pit stop uh, he wasn't able to hold on to but they do come home second to do uh, two seas motorsport third place is going to go the way of Ram Racing and that will give Ian Loggy now the championship lead through he goes then right behind him we've got the uh, Ewan Hankey car and then James Dawlin in the red line racing Lamborghini which finishes fifth overall and wins the silver am element of the GT3 category so he and Alex Malik in victorious in class once again and another solid top five again a case of what could have been had they not had that success penalty I guess but it's another good point stay uh, for red line racing quite a few teams I think going to be leaving Donington Park pretty happy with the job they've done
in particular, the Enduro Motorsport team, who are going to be petitioning for a third Donington Park race, I think, <laughs> on the calendar next year, aren't they? Yeah, definitely so. And you'll obviously see uh, the hand out the window saying thank you to all the marshal and everything. And he's looking not to go over the carbon debris to pick up as much of the gravel and the detritus. And it's twofold, really. One, it adds a bit of weight to the car, obviously sticking to those hot tyres. But more critically, the ride height. There's a minimum ride height the cars have to be. So if you're getting those tyres a little bit bigger with everything stuck on it, you're more likely not to have an issue in scrutineering after the race. And British GT is really, really well policed. So there's no way that any of these cars will be doing anything that wouldn't conform to the regulations. And that spot checked after the race, we obviously don't know what it's going to be. So it's quite interesting sometimes to see what they check. Well, this is how the race ended up then with a dominant performance, a crushing victory uh, for Enduro Motorsport. Morgan Tilbrook and Marcus Cook getting the race victory by nearly a minute in the end over two C's, James Cottingham and Lewis Williamson, who get their best result of the season so far. Ian Loggy is now the championship leader, having finished third alongside Callum McLeod, whilst Mia Fluitt and Ewan Hankey get a really strong fourth place finish as well in the 76 McLaren, ahead of a pair of Lamborghinis, the red line car of Malik and Adol in fifth, and then the WPI exam of Mike Ligo and Phil Keane rounding out the top half dozen. Uh, then it was Ram Racing's number 15 car, the Balf Audi 8, ninth place for the Fox Motorsport McLaren and the Team Parker Racing Porsche rounding out the top 10 ahead of Paddock, Greystone GT, Team Aber Racing, Century Motorsport and Barwell's number 72 car, all of which had issues during the race. Now, further back in GT4, the race victory goes as it did at the end of last season to the Academy Motorsport Ford Mustang, Marco Signoretti and Matt Cowley in car number 61 claiming the race victory. They were in contention all day long and they were able to come out on top, uh, helped in part due to a slow pit stop by Newbridge Motorsport at the end there. Second in class go to Will Burns and Jack Brown, another podium finish. They're just slowly but surely racking up the points as the season goes on for Century Motorsport. And then Tom Edgar and Jordan Collard third in the Toyota. Uh, we have got one, two, three, four, five different makes of car inside the top five because it's then an Aston Martin, the R racing car of uh, Jamie Day and Josh Miller in fifth place before we get our second Porsche. That is the Matty Graham Ross Wiley Beluga racing car. Newbridge Motorsport seventh in class, but they still win the Pro-Am element of GT4. That will be little consolation though for a team that absolutely were in contention for the race win this afternoon had it not been for that brake fire at the final stop. The Audi of Richard Williams and Seddon Fielding, again, what could have been that spin in the opening stint for Richard they never were able to bounce back from. Then it's the Century BMW ahead of the Team Brit McLaren. Right then, uh, Matt Cowley and Marco Signoretti are your race winners in GT4. And Bryn is down there with at least one of the Academy Motorsport drivers. Yes, but which? Well, I'll tell you which is Matt Cowley. Now, Matt, that was, uh, it seemed to me just an, an easier uh, race for you guys because there was no drama. There was drama everywhere else. Yeah, um, I had a good race with Darren in the first stint that I had, uh, but Marco did a lot of the hard work in that, to be fair. Um, he's not here yet, but hopefully he shows up. Yeah, he did a lot of the hard work at the start of the race and everything like that, speaking of which. So, yeah, he made, he made my life a lot easier. So, that, yeah, that helped a lot. Thanks, Marco. Well, uh, speak of the devil, your first ever win in British GT. Well done. Thank you, I couldn't find the podium. <laughs> <laughs> it's just over there, you'll get to that in a minute. But for you, it was, uh, we were saying fairly straightforward. There was a lot of drama elsewhere, but for you guys, it seemed to be pretty clean. Yeah, it's always tricky with GT3 traffic and uh, just managing the tyre. And then the second stint was pretty good. I had no track limits to use and full tank of fuel, so it was uh, pretty, pretty tight. But no, that was amazing. I'm so pumped. It's a good habit for you two and your team, so well done. Yeah, thank you. Jason. Awesome, thanks. Excellent stuff. Uh, sat down and chatted to those two yesterday for a bit. They were both really looking forward to the race this weekend. And Academy Motorsport are able to come home and grab the race victory in GT4. And uh, a fantastic performance. They, As I said, you could say there was a little bit of luck in Newbridge having a slow stop, but the Ford was in a position to have the race lead anyway at the end of the race. Uh, it is a circuit that suits the Ford Mustang. And uh, they were able to uh, extract the maximum pace from that car all day long. Now, in GT3, it is again a feeling of deja vu. Last year's winners at the Donington Decider were Enduro Motorsport, and the same is true today, Brim. I think it's fair to say you had this one nailed from the start, didn't you? Well, yeah, you know, fair play to James. He got the run on Morgan into turn one, but Morgan held his own, and um, they both uh, drove a great race. And, um, you know, we was really sneaky under the first safety car. We got our pit stop in and, um, you know, rightly so, the organisers put the order back and um, 
I had a clear track and there was only one mindset from that point was to go as fast as I can <laughs> whilst I had the opportunity. From our point of view, it was nice, Morgan, that you gave us that little bit of excitement off the start line. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we had a bit of contact, but you know, James's move was fair. He won it fair and square, and uh, I did a good job putting pressure on him. You know, kept up with him. As Mark just said, if, if they did a Donington Championship, we'd enter it because <laughs> the last two races we won here being Donny. So we've got to go for the hat trick or the triple at the end of this year. Um, but yeah, amazing race. Mark has done a fantastic job. He's proven he can run with the best, and the team have given us a race-winning car. And to be fair, the team have given us a, a podium winning car for the, for the past three rounds but we've messed up two of them so well, it's nice to give it back to the team it really is and you've got the podium coming up right now so disappear you two well done thank you thanks guys yeah huge congratulations for enduro motorsport and uh, we're running out of things to say about them really are we joe because that was just a flawless performance and uh, uh, yes the car works well around the track the drivers know the track as well but when you have days like this it's so important that you don't let it slip away. You don't do something silly that leaves you thinking, what if? We saw a few of the teams uh, fall foul of that today, but Enduro just kept their head down and uh, never put a, a foot wrong. Yeah, it's a huge jigsaw puzzle, a race like this. It's one piece of it falls out, suddenly you can't see what the picture is, and none of them, the drivers, the engineers, the mechanics, all of that team have gelled perfectly this weekend to just make it such a dominant performance. That's all I can keep using is dominant as um, those rather suspicious looking trophies off the Donington circuit are really nice and actually uh, would mind one of them on my uh, mantelpiece for uh, next year maybe. Yeah, snazzy, uh, snazzy uh, trophies there, aren't they? And they're going to be presented onto the uh, podium very shortly. The first group of drivers we'll have, I believe, are our top three overall in GT3. Uh, so uh, obviously that is uh, going to be headed by the Enduro team, but also a shout out to 2Cs and to uh, Ram Racing. They did a, a solid job uh, in that one as well and there indeed is the ram racing duo of ian loggy and callum mcleod who finished third overall in gt4 and as i've said now uh, takes sole ownership of the championship lead at least ian loggy does of course mcleod uh, not having raced with him all season long sadly cannot be the champion this year lewis williamson and james cottingham could still be those second place more good points in the bag 27 points for finishing in second but it is a race victory for enduro motorsport no doubt about that at all it rarely he was in doubt, even though they didn't lead until about half an hour into the race. From that first pit stop onwards, they never looked back. And Morgan Tilbrook and Marcus Clutton are your race winners overall in GT3. It's really cool that all uh, drivers getting on with each other there, actually. I always find at the end of the season, suddenly that hostility ramps up a little bit. So I think we should probably come back to this later on in the year to see if they're all <laughs> quite as friendly and smiley and handshaky with each other towards the end as we see the champagne. You can always see who's been on the podium the most. And unfortunately for Callum McLeod, he was last there to uh, get it away. So, uh, yeah, awesome by all three cars. And... Um, yeah, I think the BOP's been pretty uh, fair as well today, yeah. the spread of cars, and, and GT4 especially, the top five all coming from a different manufacturer. And it's been that way in GT4 an awful lot this season, and, and GT3 likewise, we do have good variety out there. It was only a couple of years ago that McLarens were winning almost every race. I know we had a McLaren uh, winning that race, but we've had uh, Audi, Mercedes and Lamborghini uh, onto the top step of the podium already this season, and now the McLaren makes it four different cars to win the first four races. Right, uh, the next podium group we have is the silver am category within gt3 gets forgotten about a little bit sometimes among the fight for the overall uh, victory in the class but it is the uh, greystone gt pairing the father and son pairing of lewis and Stuart proctor who were third in silver am uh, second place goes to uh, the Ulysse de Pau and John Ferguson Ram Racing Mercedes. Ulysse on his debut in British GT gets himself a class podium but the winners in class and a brilliant race overall I think for Redline. I've really been impressed with them this year. James Dolan and Alex Malik are gelling well together and they get themselves a class victory here today. Yeah, I think they've got a race win in them this Definitely. year. I think uh, if they hadn't had the success penalty and a slightly better qualifying so they weren't quite in that sort of nitty gritty midfield at the start um, and they were quick at Silverstone as well. So I'm trying to think circuit-wise what we've got left. Obviously here again, they should be strong, but I've got a feeling somewhere like Snetterton might suit that pairing quite well. Two one-hour sprint races, so you've got twice the chance of winning a race there. Exactly. I remember uh, Barwell doing the double there, in fact, a few years ago. It's always been a good Lamborghini circuit, the Snetterton 300 layout. Uh, and that is where we head next on the 25th and 26th of June uh, for rounds five and six, the second of our double header events with two one-hour races, as Joe said. So, yeah, keep an eye on them. I reckon that is not a bad shout that they could get themselves onto the top step of the overall podium before the season is 
done. Uh, right, moving on to uh, GT4 now then, which is where we really did see some fantastic battling. And it is going to be a podium for the Toyota. That is, I think, their first overall podium of the season so far. And Jordan Collard gets up there uh, with Tom Edgar celebrating third place in GT4. Second place, Will Burns, who looks ecstatic to be on the podium uh, here at Donington. He's that used to being on the podium now. And if it's not the top step, then he's not going to be all that happy about it. But he and Jack Brown come home second in GT4. Whilst Academy Motorsport get the race victory, it is their second Donington victory in a row. But a first ever in the championship for Marco Signoretti and Matt Cowley up there on the top step again. Yes, it's a good Ford Mustang circuit, but they still had to execute well and beat what is, as we said a few times during the race show, a very, very competitive GT4 grid. Yeah, and it's only getting stronger as well, that GT4 grid. So uh, as the season progresses, I think you're going to start to see who needs to start banking points where. And today everyone was quite punchy, but I think uh, that risk is going to have to start to come down a, a little bit there. But uh, Mustang deserved it as, as much as anyone else today. And again, no mistakes. That's what you need in these longer races. Yeah, absolutely. They did not put a foot wrong. And ultimately, that could be what decided it for them because we did have that issue uh, for Newbridge that took them uh, out of contention for the overall race victory and off the overall podium. Incidentally, Darren Turner did only manage seventh, didn't get past Matty Graham there uh, towards the end uh, of the race. So uh, points going begging there for Darren. However, uh, we will see the Newbridge team, hopefully, appearing on our next podium because we've got the three uh, Pro-Am teams within GT4. They're due up next. It was the... Um Motus one car that was third in class, second was Team Brit, and it was a class victory for Newbridge Motorsport. So those drivers are about to head up towards the podium. And there are Aaron Morgan and Bobby Trundley, first ever all disabled uh, driver combo to race in British GT. And they get themselves onto the pro and podium. In fact, they will be second on the podium because the Motus one car uh, didn't complete enough laps to be classified as a finisher. But the GT4 pro and victory goes to Newbridge Motorsport, Matt Topham and Darren. Turner. It's not an overall victory today, but some good points in the bag for the overall championship and another Pro-Am class victory in a championship that they look set to dominate uh, throughout the rest of the season. And uh, Darren and Matt stand in front of the paddock, uh, in front of the podium, excuse me, and celebrate even more silverware uh, here at Donington Park. Yes, yeah, I really like the touch that they all stand on the floor in front of the podium. It's really nice to see that inclusive nature of, of motorsport going on there. And such a good performance from everyone in GT4. And I think when you look at the highlights now, it was a punchy start, wasn't it? A fantastic fourth round of the Intelligent Money British GT Championship, which saw the number four Mercedes of James Cottingham jump ahead of Enduro Motorsport at the start and take the early lead. Paddock Motorsport and Assetto Motorsport. The second time this season, those two, those two cars have clashed, and they clashed in pretty spectacular fashion at the Craner Curves before Richard Williams spun from the lead of GT4 for the second race in a row. That GT4 battling was very, very close indeed. The number nine Century Motorsport BMW received a penalty for that contact with the Toyota, whilst it was an early pit stop in the GT3 ranks for Team Ava Racing's Mercedes, which straight away saw Sam Neary getting involved in the fight and here having a grandstand view of some Audi Porsche contact at the final corner. It was an all Lamborghini incident down at the Melbourne hairpin that started the derailing process uh, for the 72 car, which would end up in the gravel later on as well. Debris on the track from that triggered a safety car, during which almost everybody pitted. It was a slow stop, though, for two Cs. They lost the lead, and from that point on, the Enduro Motorsport McLaren, which got a good restart, never looked back. Marcus Klug putting in a brilliant stint to build a good margin at the front of the field close moment there for Lewis Williamson in traffic, whilst in GT4, we saw an awful lot of these two cars running side by side. Darren Turner there around the outside of Matt Cowley, whilst again the Team Parker Porsche was trading paint with other cars. There, that was the Team Parker car getting into the back of the 76 McLaren, which then also had a close moment with the WPI Lamborghini down at the Melbourne hairpin. Redline Racing's Lamborghini was, again, getting into the Audi, the Balfe Motorsport Audi, not quite on the ultimate pace here today, and they would struggle along to an eighth-place finish. Second round of pit stops were ongoing. Some close moments down at the chicane. There was some really brilliant close racing across both classes. And I told you these two cars were together for most of the race. This time, Academy moving ahead of the Newbridge Aston Martin. They trade the lead on multiple occasions. Contact between Team Parker and Barwell, and then between Team Parker and the Balfe Motorsport Audi. There weren't many cars that Team Parker didn't tangle with over the race, but somehow the car kept going strong to a top 10 finish. 
Academy were in to serve their final pit stop. Marco Signoretti handing over to Matt Cowley. And as we went into that final round of pit stops, it looked like things were settling down until this happened. Contact for Sandy Mitchell just as he came out of the pit lane, battling for position uh, with the Team Parker car, sent the Lamborghini into the gravel and out of the points. A slow pit stop for Newbridge. That car had a brake fire. That ultimately is what cost them a chance to fight for the GT4 victory, which still saw some good fighting for podium places. And Jordan Collard, it was, who got the Toyota onto the podium late on. Mistake here for James, uh, James Dorling, cost him fourth place in the race to you and Hanky, the 76 crew, getting their best finish of the season. But it was Enduro Motorsport who continued their Donington dominance to win by nearly a minute at the end of the three hours of racing, whilst Academy Motorsport took a slightly less comfortable victory back in GT4.